wonderful to see so many participants in the audience, including many familiar faces. Recording in progress. We also have numerous participants online. I would like to thank him for joining us. This conference series was conceived in Kabul several years ago. The overall objective of the series is analysis of histories, cultures, politics, and systems of governance in Afghanistan. The idea of the conference series was born of dissatisfaction with the polit political status quo in Afghanistan and the failure of the 2004 constitution and the system of governance that it created and the deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. The conference series is named in honor of Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was assassinated by Al-Qaeda on 9 September 2001, a necessary condition for the attacks that were to take place in the United States 48 hours later. Al-Qaeda rightly considered Ahmad Shah Massoud a threat they knew that he would come to the assistance of the United States when they retaliated against Al-Qaeda's host, the Taliban. They feared that his anti-Taliban alliance would succeed and displace the Taliban as the ruling power in Afghanistan. They feared his military prowess. Al-Qaeda and Taliban also feared that his ideas would take root. Masood was a devout Muslim but his Islamist ideals were anathema to Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and their supporters, and financial patrons in Pakistan and the Gulf Arab states. Ahmad Shah Massoud believed in a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, and representative government for Afghanistan. He envisioned a society that represented the diverse ethnic, linguistic, and religious mosaic Afghanistan. He was the first major political leader who called for discussion on alternative political systems for Afghanistan, that is, alternative to the political system that had prevailed in Afghanistan from the late 19th century to the Marxist government supported by Soviet Union. Masood knew that any system of enduring and representative government must wholly embrace Afghanistan's multi-ethnic and multi-confessional society. There must be a system of law and governance that treated every ethno-linguistic and religious community equitably. In this respect, he wanted a just and equitable political representation and government for every ethno-linguistic community and envisioned a society where women and men enjoyed equal rights under the law. He put words to practice when he managed the, the supervisory council of the North. He did this, for example, by insisting on his schooling for boys and girls. The system of justice that prevailed under the supervisory council would borrow the most efficacious laws from the Shafi, Hanafi, Maliki jurisprudential schools to deliver the best outcome, outcomes for petitioners. His vision, his fight against the Soviet invaders and his lonely struggle against the Taliban earned him love and respect across Afghanistan's cultural mosaic. He was bestowed with the title of National Hero of Afghanistan and the date of his death was declared national holiday. The series seek, seeks to, to honor his legacy. We emphasize that his, this conference has no connection with the National Resistance Front established under the leadership of Ahmed Massoud Ahmad Shah Massoud's son. Nothing said here should be considered explicit or implicit support for Ahmad Massoud or the National Resistance Front or an endorsement of the National Resistance Front's policies and activities. The first conference, or the, the first conference in this series was held last year in September to commemorate the 20th anniversary of assassination of Ahmad Shah Massoud. It was held barely a month after the collapse of Republican Afghanistan. This is the second conference in this series. The theme of this conference, particularly as represented by five panels, first five panels, can be summarized in one word, autopsy. What went wrong in Afghanistan over the last 20 years? There are manifold reasons 
for the failures witnessed between 2001 and 2021. One of the objectives of this conference is to analyze this history so that lessons can be ex extracted for the future. However, we cannot cover every aspect. If we try to cover everything that went wrong, there would be scores of panels held over several weeks. Hence, the focus on panel one to five, which address key social, historical, political factors that contributed to the demise of Republican Afghanistan. I should mention that Professor William Maley, one of the panelists, has a book in press, The Decline and Fall of Republican Afghanistan, which will address uh, many of these failures. Panel one is on the 2004 Constitution and the roads not traveled. Professor Maley, Chaibob, and Riley, who are presenting today, and three other experts who cannot participate today, submitted guidance to the UN on possible forms of government and, the, and electoral systems. That is, that would work that is what would work best for Afghanistan, centralized or decentralized government, federalism, devolution, a presidential, a presidential system as in the United States, or a parliamentary system as in the UK. These six documents are available, uh, sorry, these six documents are invaluable primary sources. We, would, we will include them in the published editions of the conference proceeding. There is also summary forms on the discussion held about recommendations that is also important. To illustrate the importance of these documents, Professor Maley recommended that, quote, a pure presidential system should be avoided. The executive government should be based in the parliament and accountable to it, end of quote. Professor Benjamin Riley noted in an analysis, quote, if, Af if in Afghanistan there is a strong cultural bias in favor of presidentialism, then my recommendation would be that this is the model that should be chosen, but it should be chosen with clear understanding of the potential weaknesses of the model for a multi-ethnic society in particular. End of quote. And Professor Yash Gai, who unfortunately cannot join us, wrote long and cogent recommendation for devolution of power in Afghanistan. He said, for example, that the people of Afghanistan, quote, do not need to be locked into a choice between a unitary or federal state. A unitary state could become authoritarian and ultimately divisive, while a federal state is complicated, legalistic, can be rigid, and is hard to manage. Some points on the continuum between the two options may, be, may best serve Afghanistan's need." End of quote. However, it suited the parochial objectives of Zalmay Khalilzad, Ashraf Ghani, Hamid Karzai, and the United Nations Lakhdar Brahimi to promote a pure presidential system with Karzai as the president. A highly centralized pure presidential system created a winner-take-all jackpot where all powers went to the elite of one ethno-linguistic community. This marginalized other ethno-linguistic communities of Afghanistan who collectively formed the majority. Therefore, the roads taken and roads not taken in Afghanistan with respect to, the, to these constitutional and elect electoral system issues are of considerable importance for future studies of Afghanistan, and also for scholars and programs like development studies, international affairs. We hope this panel will get the ball rolling in this direction. Panel five, then alternatives to centralization, picks up on the issue of centralization and its failure to analyze alternatives like decentralization and devolution. As Professor Yash Gai noted in a recommendation there is a middle ground between unitary, centralized, and centralized state and, and federalized state. Where is this middle ground? Would it, look like, would it look something like Germany, for example, where central and regional po powers are cooperative in lawmaking, but leave the implementation of the laws to the regions? There are many options for devolution that could have been introduced to Afghanistan during the debates of the Constitution. 
a false binary, that is, unitary versus federal, was propagated by supporters of centralization in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the voices dominated discussions in 2003 and 2004. Their voices. Going forward, however, we hope that scholars re-examine these multiple alternatives. As Dr. Jennifer Murtazashvili, who chairs Panel 5, has shown in her work that the informal village organizations are robust in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, the top-down political system of the country has never taken these potent organizations into consideration. But, as mentioned above, Supervisory Council of Ahmad Shah Massoud had a bottom-up approach, which exactly started from the village level to the district and then provinces, taking these informal organizations into consideration and empowering them. In other words, this alternative local governance model was empowering local communities. Panel two and four on Khorasan and Afghanistan are first attempts at moving studies in the direction of re-evaluating our historical understanding of the landmass encompassed by modern Afghanistan. Professor Said Askar Musavi, who we are honored to have with us today, wrote the history of Hazara of Afghanistan. His brief, insightful introduction of uh, his brief but insightful introduction on toponyms Khorasan, Khorasan and Afghanistan is worth reading. Professor Musavi shows that even the so-called founder of Afghanistan, Ahmad Shah Durrani, did not refer to his domains as Afghanistan. Instead, he considered him himself Shah of Khorasan. The country that Ahmad, Ahmad Shah Durrani allegedly found remained nameless, except for these men, for the, except for a men, for a terse mention in a 19th century British diplomatic text. The people living in this nameless land referred to themselves as Khorasanis. It was not until 19th century that the name came to be applied to the rest of the country. The name was supplied by British imperialists in India. This was followed by the installation in 1880 of Abdurrahman by same imperialists who wanted him to do their bidding. Amir Abdurrahman was given man a mandate, guns, and money to secure Khorasan's frontiers and turn the region into a buffer state between British India and Zara Central Asia. This is what he did by attacking the Hazara Jat, the central lands of Afghanistan, and committing genocide against Hazaras, who are mostly Shia, and colonizing Khorasan and Pashtun farmers and nomads, uh, colonizing, colonizing Khorasan with Pashtun farmers and nomads. Afghanistan is an artificial country. Its boundaries with Central Asia, Pakistan, and Iran were demarcated in the late 19th and, and, and the early 20th centuries by British imperialist and Joseph Stalin. The majority of Afghanistan's land mass is Khorasan, with bits and pieces extracted from India. The Iranian province of Sistan is shared between Iran and Afghanistan, and Balochistan is shared by Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. Our third panel is on Pashtun ethno-nationalism. This is an important panel because it begins to explore an area that is considered taboo. Again, I turn to Professor Musavi's book, where he has an insightful section called Afghan Nationalism as Taboo. The word Afghan is an ethnoname. Afghan is synonym with Pashtun or Pathan. Pashtun nationalism is the belief that Pashtuns have racial supremacy over all other ethnic groups, and Pashtuns have the right to rule the land demarcated and named by British imperialists. This line of thinking dominated newspapers and TV from 2001 forward. It was propagated by Pashtun ethno-nationalists like Ashraf Ghani and Hamid Karzai and regurgitated in media and academia. The installation of Karzai in 2001 and 2 was dominated by this. By the, uh, by the, you know, Pashtun are the majority and Pashtuns have the right to rule viewpoint. But it was not just the Pashtun that believed this. Representatives of non-Pashtun groups that attended the Bund conference in 2001 agreed to this arrangement, despite Hamid Karzai not controlling one square inch 
of Afghanistan, while the Tajiks, Hazaras, and Turks militarily controlled about 70% of Afghanistan at the time. Ibn Nas is important not because I say, but it is because a Pashtun leader, Anwar al-Haq Ahadi, says it is important. Ahadi, a minister of finance under Hamid Karzai, minister of commerce under Ashraf Ghani, uh, um, he also ran Central Bank of Afghanistan. Ahadi was leader of Afghan Millat Party. Afghan Millat promotes a Pashtun ethno-nationalist agenda. Millat's outlooks are clear from a 1995 article by Ahadi published in the Journal of Asian Survey, where he lamented about the alleged decline of Pashtun political and cultural hegemony in Afghanistan. Quote, the Pashtuns believe that they constitute the majority in Afghanistan that Afghan, that Afghan state was formed by Pashtuns, that Afghanistan is the only Pashtun state in the world, and that the minorities should accept the Afghan character of the state. Most other ethnic groups in the region have their own states. No ethnic minority can seriously question the Persian character of Iran, the Turkish character of Turkey, the Tajik character of Tajikistan, and the Uzbek character of Uzbekistan. Pashtun argued that the same should hold for Afghanistan. End of quote. The Pashtun character of Afghanistan can be questioned. National rhetoric of the sort articulated by Ahadi has influenced Western diplomats and military officers view, uh, viewed, I will read again, sorry. National, nationalist rhetoric of the sort articulated by Ahadi has influenced how Western diplomats and military officers viewed Afghanistan between 2001 and 2021. Nationalist rhetoric and Pashtun ethno-nationalist agenda in Republican Afghanistan weakened the Afghan National Security Forces, the Intelligence Directorate, weakened the bounds between citizens and their government. By expelling non-Pashtuns from the government, especially the Security Forces Intelligence Bureau, Ethno-nationalists weakened the state and weakened the bones, of, the bones between Tajiks, Turks, Hazaras, and the government in Kabul. As General David Petrios said, with respect to the insurgency raging in Iraq, an observation that applies also to Afghanistan, quote, increasing the number of stakeholders is critical to success, end of quote. Pashtun ethno-nationalist agenda reduced the number of stakeholders in the success of Republican Afghanistan. When the bulk of the citizenry are alienated from their government, social and political fragmentation inevitably follows. Insurgents are like infectious disease, diseases. They prosper in weak host and will eventually destroy it. Lastly, our panel six and seven are convened directly by our partners, the University of Sussex's Asia Center, which is led by Professor Magnus Marsden, and Afghanistan Institute of Strategic Studies, which is led by Dr. Dawood Muradian. Dr. Muradian and Professor Marsden have determined the direction of the panels and selected panelists. Panel six focuses on regional interconnections, and panel seven on regional security. To conclude, we reiterate that the conference aims to discuss difficult and taboo issues in the spirit of academic investigation. These topics are key for the future of the people of Afghanistan and for the security and economic development of the region. This conference is fully funded by the University of Cambridge through the good office of Professor Stephen Tube, Vice Chancellor, at the behest of Regis Professor of History, Sir Chris Clark, and therefore the funding is being managed by the Faculty of History. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank the Office of the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Clark, the Faculty of History, our host, Emmanuel College, and Master Doug Chalmers, and the staff of Emmanuel College for making this conference possible. I hope this series will stimulate frank and honest academic discussion about the roads not taken in post-9-11 Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, we have uh, the next person to talk is John Casey uh, to welcome everybody to the conference.
morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to say a few words to welcome us, you, to this second Afghanistan conference. I've been reflecting on what has happened since I delivered a welcoming address at our first conference last year. Then, the catastrophe that had recently befallen Afghanistan was fresh in all our minds. The Massoud Foundation, which was to finance the conference, uh, had been ransacked and a whole set of buildings turned into Taliban barracks. It was a miracle, therefore, that the conference happened at all. And Zalmai Nishat thanked the secular producers of that miracle last year. Because of that catastrophe, the pivot of our discussions became less purely historical and academic than it might otherwise have been. And in thinking about the legacy of Ahmad Shah Massoud, we focused very much on what had allowed the disaster to happen. Nevertheless, there was plenty of discussion about developments in the 19th and 20th centuries that had produced the conditions of the present crisis, including the creation of a highly centralized state, alluded to by Zalmay, under the monarchy, the Daoud and communist regimes, and the equally centralized and extremely corrupt post-communist administrations right up to the turn of the Taliban. Looking back, some might possibly see the catastrophe as having been inevitable and perhaps even predictable with some accuracy. Pretty much everyone I spoke to in Afghanistan, by the way, well, not by the way, looked with horror on the President of the United States, Trump's so-called negotiations with the Taliban, the Emirate, as the Americans rather feebly agreed to call it, entirely behind the back of the Afghan government. So there was a danger last year that the conference might become too much involved in recent, event <coughs> in recent events just when some intellectual and academic detachment was needed, although I don't think the conference did in fact yield to that temptation. Given that it is at present extremely difficult, well, I would say impossible, to see on the horizon any near prospect of a change of regime, it seems that the only thing for meetings like this to do is to keep alive for us, for the Afghan diaspora, and for the people of Afghanistan, traditions of free and objective academic, historical, and intellectual inquiry, so that when eventually a change does come, as surely it will, these traditions, of which they have now been deprived, can be reappropriated by the people of Afghanistan. I am diffidently aware, as the splendidly wide-ranging program suggests, that this year's meeting will not have as much room for the amateur to contribute as did last year's. As one such amateur, though, might I mention that my own interest developed essentially from a visit of a mere two weeks that I paid to Afghanistan in August and September of 2019 under the aegis of Zalmai Nishat and Ahmad Massoud. I spent nearly all that time in the company of Ahmad Massoud and his companions in Kabul and the Panjshir Valley. I even swam in the Panjshir River. It was just at the time when Mr. Massoud was entering into politics for the first time, and we present at meetings when he consulted the elders, but also young would-be warriors, about whether he should do that, should enter politics, was something of, of absorbing, in fact, uh, not just absorbing interest, absolute fascination, as was his first great speech in the Panjshir Valley, where, by the way, the Taliban have been exceptionally brutal, murdering and torturing suspected opponents. His first great speech in the Panjshir Valley to an audience of some 16,000 or so people, many of whom had walked up the valley to see and hear for the first time the son of their adored lost leader. Then there were the gatherings at his house up in the Panjshir. Delegations from all over the country, including female parliamentarians, people from the minorities, but also very many Pashtuns, and the remarkable atmosphere of hope, even elation. I remember especially an evening 
which included Pashtun clerics, where the political discussion was mixed with music and readings from Rumi. And this visiting foreigner was even allowed to recite some Wordsworth. You could say without too much exaggeration that all this was civil society, or at any rate, a very good image of it. Now, I apologize for these somewhat egotistical reminiscences, but what I took away from these meetings and that first great public speech was not just the obvious enthusiasm and veneration of the people for Mr. Massoud, people who, of course, often had a tribal relationship with him anyway, but the candid way in which he described and to which they responded what I suppose we in the West would describe as an enlightenment vision of Afghanistan's future political, social, even religious, which Ahmad Massoud had inherited from his father and about which he spoke not in rhetorical but in notably conversational fashion. And if it was an enlightenment vision, it was not just some unthinking westernization, but involved full respect for tradition, especially, of course, religious tradition. That very conversational tone that he adopted seemed to me in itself to mark a form and style of politics which it seemed to me that the country needed. And it also fitted the very strong civil society that probably did then exist in Kabul and I believe other cities, but which now seems remote indeed. And that last point leads me, if you'll again allow this, to another anecdote in which I hope you'll indulge me in relating, which also involved an invitation to Afghanistan but from a very different quarter. In April 2000, on a visit to Pakistan, I met, purely by chance, leaders of the Taliban, all Pashtuns, of course, then the rulers of Afghanistan, at a madrasa in the northwest frontier agency, as it is no longer called, quite near the Khyber Pass. We had a discussion which ranged from the rights of women to pictures of naked ladies in the Vatican, as one of their number put it, and to a prospective Taliban cricket team. I got on quite well with them because they did seem to enjoy debate and even to have a certain sense of humor. Eventually, one venerable old gentleman actually invited me to come to Afghanistan. You will be our guest. We will look after you. There was even the prospect that I might meet the man who was to become, in the next few months, the most notorious outlaw in the world. I later learned that the cleric who issued the invitation was himself the direct mentor of that man and of Mullah Omar. Of course, I was not to know that these were people who had become accomplices in the murder of Ahmed Shah Massoud, also just a few months later. I did not take up the invitation, but I tell this anecdote simply to emphasize, if that were necessary, the gulf between them and the people I met in Kabul and the Panjshir Valley three years ago. As one of the not numerous band of people to have met both sides, I can safely and gloomily say that the leaders of the Taliban whom I met and talked to, although I got on quite well with them at the time, not only were clearly and absolutely not equipped to understand and govern a modern state, but hardly even understood cities. Indeed, I seem to remember that they spoke of cities entirely as places where they had to keep a sharp watch on their wives. They were country boys. As Tim Winter said last year, simply village mullahs. By comparison, to have a discussion with an Iranian ayatollah is like going, well, I exaggerate for rhetorical purposes, but it is like going from Ian Paisley to John Henry Newman. In the long run, it's very hard, despite all its brutality, to see how such a regime could survive. But the long run may be a very long run indeed. And in the interim, those who care about the future of that country, and may even have taken it to their hearts, will have to possess their souls in patience, but also, as I said at the beginning, to preserve, as is the purpose of this conference, those traditions of genuine historical and intellectual inquiry that will be of immense value when, 
to use Churchill's phrase in 1940, in God's good time, liberation eventually comes. Uh, we are honored to have as uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Michael Berry, who is going to address us through Zoom. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to Cambridge. Um, is Professor Michael Berry on, on Zoom now? Yes, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, then I, I will begin. We are honored to have as uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor I don't hear you. I don't hear you. Professor Berry, we are hearing you. You can yes. start, please. Yes, please. Well, Benome Khudawande Jahan Afarin to begin in an Afghan way. It's an honor and also a source of tremendous pain to address this assembly and to address this tragedy that is Afghanistan. While history, academic detachment, impartiality in analysis are all absolutely necessary, and I would join all the participants gladly in discussing the best future system of government for a country as traditionally rich in complexity as is Afghanistan, I think we first have to call out where the most urgent priority lies. There is a saying that nothing fails like success. That is, when a given society has been able, in Toynbee terms, to respond successfully to a tremendous challenge, it falls into the temptation to repeat this response even when the nature of the challenge has changed. Now, we find that arguments made in 2001 in the circle of the late Commander Massoud's people that the combat of liberation in Afghanistan coincided with extinguishing a terrorist threat to the security of the entire international community resonated greatly with Western audiences, with American audiences in particular, traumatized by the attacks of 11 September 2001. And yet I know that all the Afghan participants and all their international friends today realize with a, an almost sickened feeling in the gut that these same arguments do not seem to resonate with the world community today between an American public largely apathetic to Afghan developments, to Europeans justifiably concerned by the Russian assault on Ukraine. There is, however, one argument which evokes a tremendous resonance throughout the entire world today. And that is the issue of women's rights. I think we have to come to grips with the taboos of Afghan society, which just like every other society on earth has its favorite subjects and often favorite obsessions. I hope I will not be hurting feelings if I say that even though we happen to be very interested in the ethnic makeup of Afghanistan, its traditions, the problem of federalism, 
versus centralization. All these issues are of tremendous importance. I would add that the regional players in their various strategic games also play an extremely important role in current Afghan developments. But it remains that in the world context of the Russian war in Ukraine, the seeming collapse of the climate, famine in many parts of the world, including Afghanistan, all these issues pale in international concerns with the issue of women's rights. I believe strongly and urgently I appeal to Afghans to brace themselves, face the prejudices in their own society. And as an American, I am well aware that we have heavy historical prejudices weighing upon my society. I'm aware of these things. But the time has come to put women's rights, political equality, full access to education, the professions and political representation first and foremost. Only an Afghan political position strongly endorsing as a priority women's rights will attract again the attention and the sympathy of the world. I would add that this is an existential question. There are moments when a society is so challenged, when it seems to be on the verge of collapse, that only a radical change in thinking can overcome the threat to national existence itself. Of course, the cultural example closest to the Afghan issue today is that of Turkey at the end of World War I, which was faced with national extinction. We know that Ataturk revitalized a Turkish nation, was able to impose upon the victorious allies recognition of an independent Turkey, but in doing so, he radically shifted the entire cultural outlook of his own country in order to enable it to survive. Again, I am not speaking from any sort of position of Western-centered superiority, moral arrogance, or what have you. I will mention that I am an American, and I will stress this. American, which means that I am aware of how tragic our own history and society have proven themselves to be how our country had to wrench itself from the prejudice that affected our black minority, from the days of slavery to the days of Jim Crow to current political movements openly nostalgic for the erstwhile Confederacy, confronting our own demons, coming to terms with the fact that never could our southern states have perpetuated racial discrimination for so long if so many white people in our northern states had not been implicitly complicit. It is extremely dangerous and highly challenging to face squarely the prejudices that weigh upon our societies. Do any of the panelists really believe that the Taliban government could oppress women to an extent unparalleled anywhere in the world 
today if so many villagers, if so many urban shopkeepers did not fundamentally agree with this oppression? It is not only the oppression of Tajiks and Hazaras and Uzbeks by Pashtuns that is at issue here, even though such issues are very real, but you have noted, you have felt, you have registered that this carries no resonance. However, internationally, I mean, however, the oppression of women is enabled by widespread internal Afghan prejudices and that it will require tremendous courage to overcome these deep set prejudices. I add, the oppression of women in Afghanistan today is what continues to make the Afghan issue one of international pertinence. Because when the Taliban oppress women, they are not solely oppressing women in the name of Pashtun Wali or Afghan tradition. They are oppressing women in the name of an international religion, which is the second most widespread religion in, on the planet. They are oppressing women in Afghanistan with the implication that women should be so oppressed everywhere, whether they are Canadian or New Zealander or Nigerian or from wherever. This is an assault on human rights generally. And this assault on human rights is so primordial, so urgent as to relegate to a secondary position every other consideration. I'll make a further comparison. I've made terrible comparisons to the United States. I will even compare the withdrawal of NATO troops from Afghanistan in 2021 to the terrible decision made by U.S. President Rutherford Hayes in 1877 to withdraw all federal troops from the former Confederate States allowing them to restore full racial discrimination for another century on American soil. So these are harsh comparisons indeed. However, the comparison that I think would be most cogent to be made for those of us of my generation is with pre-1992 South Africa. The denial of full human rights to an entire section of the population on the basis of its skin color was registered by the entire planet as an assault upon the fundamental dignity of the human race itself everywhere. Now, until 1992, South Africa's apartheid regime was able to barter its internal repression with the various Western powers, notably the United States, in exchange for South Africa's very anti-Soviet stand, which had strategic implications for the Cold War on the African continent. Once the Soviet Union was removed, however, from the international picture, South Africa's apartheid became simply unsustainable and South African white leaders themselves came to recognize that they could no longer be held to account like this by the entire international community for their denial of a fundamental human dignity and apartheid was dismantled. In the many debates that centered on South African issues before 1992, there was a tremendous amount of talk on what kind of government 
should take over in South Africa, apportioning representation, the various mechanisms of governance. Of course, all these issues are key, are crucial, are vital. But nevertheless, the central issue was recognition of the equal rights of all human beings as human beings. This places upon Afghan thinkers, upon the members of the Afghan diaspora and all our friends still inside Afghanistan, a tremendous moral responsibility. Once again, our Afghan friends are asking us in the international community to share their struggle, to endorse their political striving for a just political order in their country. We are ready to do so. We have never shied away from the responsibility of such support. But back in the 1980s, that support was in light of a universal principle, the freedom of countries to choose their own path and not be subjected to imperial subjugation. This was a universal principle. It coincided with the strategic interests of certain powers. It coincided with what so many Afghans wanted. And so there was a general consensus which saw the Afghan nation emerge from the nightmare of a Soviet Russian occupation. Today, however, that combat, that renewed freedom struggle must emphasize, I cannot highlight this strongly enough, women's rights. If I am told that an attempt to bring together a coalition of forces inside Afghanistan strong enough to overcome the present regime implies nevertheless recognition for certain local prejudices, meaning the subjugation of women. If I am told that to emphasize women's rights would be to offend social conservatives in Afghanistan, the only response must be the social conservatives of Afghanistan, notably those in power today, have offended the entire human family. Their interpretation of Islam besmirches a world religion and a world culture. Their subjugation of women assaults the fundamental notion of human decency of the entire planet. That message has to sink in because it is quite simply the truth, the central truth, the cornerstone. Mo agar bitarsim ke bi hormat bosha baraye mardom mortaje dar Afghanistan ke defa'e huquq zan kunim, bayad jawab bikim ke dunya ro be hormat kardim. Agar kabul kunim hami setam sare nime in sonho. I've said this as best as I could in both languages, and I hope that this message as strongly urged as I possibly can will dominate all our discussions. Of course, yes, I do incline towards a federal system. Again, I agree that nothing fails like success. The nation building associated with a, a king who was, who was left a very checkered legacy, Abdul Rahman, was very strongly centralized, but it seemed to work to a great extent. If extreme centralization was 
imposed on Afghanistan after 2001. This was partly harking back to a pre-Soviet past where there had been such extreme centralization. So people tended to want to resurrect a kind of pre-Soviet golden age. Again, these past conditions look woefully inadequate to deal with the emerging Afghanistan of today and tomorrow. But most important of all, every Afghan mother, sister, wife, daughter must be recognized as a full human being endowed by our creator with equal rights. On that cornerstone can a new Afghanistan be built. And without that cornerstone, we will just have strife, bickering, and largely tragedy occurring in worldwide obscurity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Michael, for those very wise words. Um, I'm very glad to let you know that some of my colleagues and myself were working on a book by the Chief Justice of the Taliban, Abdul uh, Hakim, um, what was the name? Abdul Hakim Haqqani, who has written in Arabic recently. And if you read his book, uh, the problem is that uh, in the past 30 years, 28 years to be exact, from the emergence of the Taliban until today, we haven't worked systematically about this ideology of the Taliban. In that book, you will unfortunately see that Haqqani thinks that women have no right to education, they have right to education, only religious, religious education that their parents should give them, their mahrams, and they don't need to go uh, further than year six or something, and they don't have a right to work anyway. So that's the sad situation. Thank you so much for driving the message so strongly. Uh, at this point, uh, um, before we start our panel, uh, we have a break for now 15 minutes for a tea or coffee. And I would kindly urge everyone to be on time to start our panel. Thank you very much.
guys, if you guys want to have a
two, two, one, two. I'm going against the tide. So, two, one, two. Catch. Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Yeah. Uh, welcome back from the coffee break. Now we have a panel. Um, the panel is chaired by Dr. Bashir Mubashir, but unfortunately he couldn't fly uh, due to a technical problem. But uh, I hope he's online and he will chair it to online um, Zoom system. Uh, we have uh, the panelist, uh, Professor William Malley, and uh, Professor Benjamin Rayleigh, but uh, uh, because of the time zone problem, um, Professor Chaibob has sent yeah, in a video for us. So uh, I would kindly ask uh, uh, Bashir Mubashir to talk it over. Thank you. Hello. Do you hear me? We do hear you. All right, awesome. Okay, so I'm trying to uh, share the slides. Okay, so, uh, well, until I get the chance to share the slides. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very important panel on the Constitution of 2004. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference. Thanks to Zalmay Nashat. Uh, Timothy and Shivan, who we couldn't meet, but uh, we have exchanged a lot of emails. So thank you for your assistance and your patience. And uh, there are some prominent figures here. I do not want to name names because I don't want to leave out anyone's name, but thank you for attending this conference, this very important panel. Um, we are talking about the constitution and 
different scholars have uh, basically different metrics they used in order to uh, measure the success and the failure of the constitutions. But one measure, one metric that on which all of the scholars tend to agree is the longevity of a constitution. In other words, the most successful constitutions are basically the living constitutions. Now the question is why, what went wrong with the Afghan constitution and why it failed? There is a very small camp, uh, but also a very loud camp of individuals that uh, tend to suggest that the constitution failed because the, uh, the country, Afghanistan, was not uh, prepared for it. Uh, the country and the people were not uh, ready for a, a democratic transition and for state building. And we basically heard this, a similar remark by President Joe Biden during his presidential election uh, campaigns, as well as after the collapse of the uh, Republic in Afghanistan. But the problem with this line of argument is that they haven't looked at the numerous surveys that has been done, that have been done on this particular topic in Afghanistan. Can I get the, can I get my, can I get the chance to share my slides? I'm still trying to share the slides. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot share it. If I can be the host, I can I can share the slides. I'm sorry about this, still trying to. Anyway, so I'm gonna just uh, talk about it instead of sharing, cause it's basically about the statistics and the survey results. Asia Foundation basically surveyed um, Afghan people between 2006, actually 2004 to 2021. And they've basically surveyed Afghan people on a range of issues. One of those issues is the democracy, what people think about democracy, right? So if you look at it from year to year, you'll find out that Afghans, a majority or a super majority of Afghans basically support and are satisfied with democracy in Afghanistan. And it's, this is despite these fraudulent, chaotic uh, elections that led to a political crisis in this country. Uh, but public support has remained, uh, but the democracy has remained basically popular in Afghanistan. And even those who did not uh, support democracy or had uh, or in some ways, according to surveys, dislike democracy, there was an interesting another study about it by Anna Larson that suggested that even those individuals um, had a misunderstanding of democracy. For example, they tend to define democracy more of as a moral norm, a moral regime, a cultural regime, or a religious regime rather than as a political regime. So even if you ask the same people if they liked to have elections and representatives in the parliament, and, and a represented president, uh, they still uh, pretty much were in favor of that. So people were not necessarily against an inclusive democratic um, governance in Afghanistan. At the very same time, if you look at the same survey year by year of public sympathy towards the Taliban, the public sympathy towards the Taliban was declining from 20% or 22% to 4%. And the, now the rate was declining, particularly in those in the last years of the Republic, when the violence of the Taliban was actually increasing across Afghanistan and were taking a lot of lives. 
of the civilians in Afghanistan. So public support for the Taliban never existed. If we remember, one of the ta former Taliban, Salam Rakiti, was a presidential candidate in the election of 2009, and he did not even win a handful of votes in, in his own home province. So overall, nationwide, his votes did not cross 2% of the nationwide votes in Afghanistan. So we know that the Taliban do not have the public support if we hold elections anytime. They will not win the elections. And among many reasons that they do not like elections and a democratic governance in Afghanistan is the fact that they, uh, they, they cannot win. They cannot win in those elections. So it's not really the public that have failed the constitution or state building in Afghanistan. It's actually the other way around the constitution that failed the public. And that brings us to our panel. And one of the things that I just want to mention before I introduce our panelists is the, that the constitution was not consulted with the public. The drafting commission did not share the constitution, the draft constitution with the public. And instead, for two months that they consulted with the public, they shared a vague and ambiguous survey and questions with the people and we do not have any evidence that they, when they gathered the opinions of the people based on those questionnaires, they have incorporated that into the constitution. And when President Kaze received the draft constitution, again, he did not release it to the public until five weeks before the, well, see, the sorry, the lawyer guy that had to ratify the constitution. And again, President Kaze had to appoint 50 individuals uh, and the Louis uh, Jaga, who basically had a very determinant, the dominant, uh, who were the dominant forces in the Louis Jaga and basically determined a lot of things with regard to the provisions of the constitution. And one interesting thing, or two interesting things about the ratification of the constitution is that when it was ratified, it was not ratified by the votes of the representatives of the people and the Louis Jaga. It was just that people had to stand up and clap, and that was it, and the constitution was ratified. So no vote took place in the Louis Jaga for the constitution. The second interesting fact, which was also a determinant fact in terms of the fate of the republic, was the fact that around 41 to 51 changes were brought to the constitution after its ratification by President Kaiser and his team. And those changes included, for example, national terminologies, national anthem, and things like that, that basically uh, led to political crisis in Afghanistan for the rest of the Republic years in the country. So again, we see that the constitution was not consulted with the public. It was a constitution that failed the public, uh, but that brings us to the designs of the political institutions that were basically, uh, set up by the dominant uh, actors in the drafting constitutions and in the ratification of the constitutions. Uh, and that's where our, our, our panel and our panelists come in. Uh, to introduce our panelists, I just have to say our panelists do not need any introductions. They are prominent figures. Uh, they, are, they are the stars of their fields. Um, our works have been influenced by their, by their publications. Certainly my dissertation, my publications are hugely inspired by the works of Benjamin Riley, uh, William Mali, and, and, and Jose uh, Chiba. Uh, if you look at my works, you'll find a lot of Riley's, a lot of Mali's, and a lot of uh, Chiba's in uh, uh, the text. So, so I'm, I'm honored to chair this panel. Uh, but because it's Cambridge and it's uh, United Kingdom and formality is very important, so I'll take it very seriously and I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, so, William Mali, I'm going to just start introducing you. William Mali is an emeritus professor at the University of Australia. He's also a member of the Order of Australia. He's also a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a fellow of the Australian an Institute of International Affairs. He was a barrister in High Court of Australia, and he worked an Oscar uh, Award uh, for his contributions and services to refugees. So thank you, Mali, for your contributions there. And uh, Benjamin Riley, 
He is an adjunct faculty at East West Center in Hawaii. He's a professor of political science and international relations. He was, uh, or he is, so uh, please correct me on this, University of Western Australia. He was the Dean of Nordock School, uh, the director of the Center for Democratic Institute at ANU. Uh, Jose Antonio Chiba uh, is professor of political science at a and uh, Texas a and University. He was also professor of, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, Yale University and University of Illinois. And he, were, he won a number of awards uh, for his publications as well. So um, I have actually had uh, a number of their publications on the slides. I'm not sure if I can share them here. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot share the publications. They have published numerous articles and, 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 and books uh, uh, of, of, on different issues. William Mali has published a lot of articles and books on Afghanistan. Um, Benjamin Riley has published numerous articles and books uh, about uh, institutional design and electoral design in divided societies, particularly in South Asia and Southeast Asia and Afghanistan is located in South Asia. And Jose Chiba has published numerous books, award-winning books and articles on uh, presidential system versus parliamentary system and other uh, uh, topics of comparative politics. So I would just uh, uh, let our panelists to maybe, uh, I, I don't, I, 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 I I don't see the panelists here, so I'm just gonna allow the panelists to decide who wanna go first. Sorry about that. Uh, can I begin by uh, thanking the Masood Foundation and Emmanuel College and the diverse sponsors of this conference for giving me the opportunity to share some reflections on institutional design issues that have come up in Afghanistan over the last two decades. Um, the overall burden of my presentation is that this is actually a very complex area which touches on political theory, on sociology and on uh, more specific challenges of institutional design and one needs to take all of these into account when one is contemplating the design of institutions and um, um, putting together particular models that might then be embodied in a constitutional framework. What I want to do in these remarks is begin with some contextual comments about political theory and institutional design and then move on to discuss some specific recommendations for which I was responsible almost 20 years ago in the context of uh, the work of the Constitutional Drafting Commission in Afghanistan. And if there's a lesson which emerges from my experience, it's that academics should never overestimate the likelihood that what they have to say is going to influence immediate policy, although there is some prospect that uh, good ideas may ultimately trickle through um, over a considerable period of time. And I've warned my students in the past never to expect to have a good effect on policy and that they'll be much happier if they avoid going in with high expectations. But I want to begin by talking about theory. And uh, when one's designing um, institutional structures uh, in the political sphere, there are quite different approaches which one can take. One which in a way dates back to Plato and the allegory of the cave in, in Plato's Republic, sees the role of institutions as being to amplify the virtue that can be displayed by, well, in, in Plato's work, it's called the philosopher king, that one depended upon uh, a particular level of knowledge and understanding uh, and that the, the role of the political system was to amplify that understanding uh, uh, on the part of the well-qualified. And in a way, this is the kind of thinking which underpins the role that uh, the uh, Amir al-Mumanin is granted in the Taliban political order. It, it's hard to call it. It's not a constitutional framework, of course, because there's no constitution. There's a quite different approach to the design of institutions, which is often traced back to Montesquieu and other writers such as Mandeville and Adam Smith, 
which is skeptical of power, which is wary of the notion that the way in which to take a society forward is to find a great leader and empower that person to dominate society. No, good. This kind of approach, you find it classically in Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws, uh, sees power as something dangerous, something which is prone to being abused. And that the role of institutions, therefore, is to impose limitations on the exercise of power so that when it is exercised, it is used in a constructive fashion rather than in an autocratic or an abusive fashion. And that has actually underpinned a great deal of the doctrine of constitutionalism uh, and the notion that um, powers should be separated, whether this be geographically through a federal system or um, instrumentally through a division between the legislature, the executive and the judiciary within uh, a wider political order. And I think it's fair to say that many successful political systems are those which have prevented undue concentrations of power so that if power is to be exercised in a strong fashion, it needs to be in a coordinated manner with different people buying into the exercise of power in uh, a particular way. Uh, so that is one fundamental kind of choice that confronts people who are setting out to design institutions. Another which is very important relates to the scope and strength of the state. Uh, what is it that the state will be charged with doing and what powers will be given to the state to uh, discharge those functions? Now, a cru crucial point about Afghanistan that is often overlooked is that the critical decisions on the scope and strength of the state were not taken as part of the constitutional design process. They were actually built into the Bonn Agreement of December 2001, which provided for up to 29 departments in the interim administration. Uh, and the moment that a provision was made for 29 departments rather than maybe six to eight that could do a certain number of things reasonably well, um, the rather swollen state structure which that implied was built into the political order because uh, departments were then distributed between the participant groups at the Bonn Conference, rather like door prizes at a children's birthday party. Everyone had to get a prize. Uh, and the downside of this was that once people had got their hands on departments, they were going to be exceedingly reluctant to relinquish control over those structures, which really built in uh, a, a swollen state long before the constitutional drafting process even began. And the, cons the consequences of that, I think, were pretty grave in the long run, but I'll come back to that. Uh, another critical point which has been made in detail by the political scientist Harry Eckstein is that there can be benefits in what one might call constitutional fit, which is a congruence between the broad patterns of authority that might be written into a constitutional structure and societal authority patterns. All societies have uh, patterns of authority which exist within them. And if one has a, a, a tremendous gulf between uh, social patterns of authority and what might be written into a constitutional structure, it's likely to give rise to tensions in, in various respects. Uh, the nature of those tensions will vary from society to society. It's hard to generalise about this. But one really does need to think about what kind of patterns of social authority have enjoyed legitimacy in a society, perhaps over a considerable period of time without the entanglements of the state, if one isn't going to give rise to a situation in which there is an endemic tension between what a state is attempting to do and how it's attempting to legitimate itself, and what ordinary people see as legitimate and appropriate forms of authority within the society in which they dwell. Uh, and the final contextual point to make here is that institutions are not just formal structures. They, they tend to be uh, a complex amalgam of uh, formal rules that might have been produced through uh, a process of institutional development, although some institutions have simply evolved, 
uh, and informal norms which can have the effect of ameliorating the way in which particular formal structures operate. Uh, and this can be positive or it can be negative. Um, there's a, a very fine book by uh, a, a range of philosophers, Jeff Brennan and Bob Gooden and several others, called um, Explaining Norms that came out about 10 years ago. And, and one of the points that they make is that not all norms are good things. They have a chapter called Bad Norms. And sometimes what are seen by outsiders, particularly um, um, diplomats and political leaders in foreign countries, as tradition or culture or something that's immutable in a society, are in fact norms of partiality which are entrenching particular asymmetries of power to the advantage of one group over another. So uh, we, we heard Michael Barry uh, touch on this earlier, um, talking about gender, uh, it came up in, in Zalmay's initial uh, comments, highlighting the way in which some uh, Western governments automatically assumed that the leader in Afghanistan would have to be a Pashtun. Now this is a very good example of a norm of partiality rather than something which is necessary in uh, a societal tradition. So when one's looking at the informal dimensions of institutions, one needs to be uh, applying a critical framework that distinguishes between what may be elements of legitimate governance which really do reflect uh, broadly accepted societal authority patterns and, on the other hand, norms of partiality which are simply reinforced by people who happen to be on top to make sure that they stay on top. Uh, and there's a, a very fine book from 1977 by the late Edna Aldman Margalit which goes into norms of partiality in a great deal of detail and it really deserves uh, a wider readership than it's historically enjoyed. Um, when one comes to the actual mechanics of designing institutions, um, there are various criteria that one might seek at an abstract level to employ which was set out usefully in a book called The Theory of Institutional Design, edited by Robert Gooden in the late 1990s. And he pointed to four factors worth taking into account when one's trying to design institutions. The first was what he called revisability. That if you put in place a framework that is utterly rigid, the danger is that you will um, simply create a mounting tension between what you've designed and what societal authority patterns dictate or require in such a way as will produce an explosion at some point. Now, that's not to say that you want a constitution that can be massively altered at the drop of a hat. That can be undesirable too, but you need to strike a balance between um, a, a system that um, really is just putty in the hands of whoever happens to have power on a day-to-day -day basis and on the other hand something that is so inflexible and rigid that if elements prove to be dysfunctional they can't be easily reformed. A second point that Gordon pointed to was the importance of robustness. Even a really well-designed constitution begins in infancy and then moves into adolescence before reaching maturity and in its infancy it can easily be strangled in its cradle and we actually saw this famously in Fiji in 2000 when there had been a major uh, and very careful process of institutional design with a lot of expert input that uh, produced uh, a very thoughtful constitution but one wacko uh, who managed to stage a coup succeeded in, uh, in causing enormous damage to the framework and it was simply because it takes time for people to assimilate to an institutional framework and accept that that is the only way in which uh, um, a, a particular political system should work. And people sometimes call this institutionalization to distinguish it from institutional design. Um, a third criterion that Gooden highlighted was what he called sensitivity to motion, motivational complexity. One needs to understand who are the people for whom the constitution is designed. What kind of values do they have? What kind of institutions do they want? What kind of things will they be seeking to do? Will they be um, driven by profound levels of distrust as a result of recent history? If that's the case, one might want to gravitate in favour of one particular type of framework. 
if you have high levels of trust, if you have different kinds of motivations, then a different kind of framework may prove to be more important. But this implies that you need to think very carefully about the societal context within which one might be seeking to put particular arrangements into place. Um, and then finally, uh, Gooden talked about the value of variability and experimentation. That sometimes it's good to have enough flexibility in the system that you can try different models. One of the great arguments in favour of federalism, uh, and it's largely articulated by German uh, writers on, on, on institutional economics, is that one can try out different things in different units within a state. You can have different tax regimes you can have different local laws and people in a, in a single state can move from one place to another if they prefer what's going on in, uh, in, in one state or one province rather than uh, a different one. Uh, now obviously you want to avoid a race to the bottom in institutional design because that can happen too, but uh, some capacity to experiment can be useful in this sort of context. And I'd add to those that it's, it's really rather good to have an institutional framework that is resistant to corruption or capture by in interested parties. Uh, because the stronger the state that you are seeking to build, the greater the incentive for ambitious political actors to secure monopoly control over that state. I had a fairly vigorous debate in the late 1990s with Said Kossam Rushdie on this very particular point. He was a strong supporter of a of a strongly centralised Hobbesian kind of model where the state would hold everyone else in awe. And my argument uh, counter to that was the stronger you tried to make the state, the more ferocious was going to be the competition for exclusive control over the instrumentalities of the state. And this again is an argument for a more diversified power structure because you can create many more places in the sun for different political actors whether you're talking about parliamentary systems or federal systems, there are many points of access to a certain amount of political power that can be exploited. That's all by way of context. Um, what sort of brings me more specifically here today is a very specific process in which uh, Ben Riley and I and some others were involved in 2003, which actually led to the presentation of this particular volume, Afghanistan Towards a New Constitution. Um, there's a bit of context to this too. In 1993, the United Nations through UNTAC in Cambodia was involved in conducting a very expensive election for a constituent assembly to draft a new constitution for that country. But no one in the UN had paid the faintest attention to the question of how people elected in that election might be prepared for the task of drafting a constitution. And in fact, it became very clear very quickly that most of the people who had won seats in the Constituent Assembly didn't have a clue what a constitution was or what it might attempt to do. And in fact, Professor Reginald Austin, who I saw in London just on Saturday, who was the Chief Electoral Officer in Cambodia but had been Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Zimbabwe, wrote out of the goodness of his heart a briefing paper for the members of the Constituent Assembly on what you might try to put in a well-crafted constitution. The UN learned a lesson from that and one of the lessons was that it could be useful to try to have some more expert advice available for those who were involved in drafting a constitution in Afghanistan. And this then led to various people such as us being invited to prepare some papers that could be translated into Persian and Pashto and delivered to members of the drafting commission for their consideration when they were looking at uh, an outline for a constitution. And I wrote uh, a paper here it's in, in, in front of me now which was called um, Executive, Legislative and Electoral Options for um, Afghanistan. Now, uh, I'm really quite satisfied that no one paid the faintest attention to what I had to say. Uh, but since that was somewhat what I expected, I didn't get distressed. But I think it is now an, ex an exercise of some interest to go back and look at those recommendations nearly 19 years uh, on and think of how they differed from what actually figured in the Constitution and how what happened as a result of the drafting of the Constitution and the development of a wider political system led in rather different directions from those which we'd hoped. 
In the executive area, I had three main recommendations. The first was to base the executive in a parliament to which it was accountable. And essentially this was to get away from uh, a presidential system where there would be uh, the danger that in a country with more than 50 different documented or identified ethnic groups, one group would see itself as the winner with most groups seeing themselves as losers. Um, together with the danger that if funds were flowing through the presidential palace, you would get a neo-patrimonial system developing fairly quickly. Uh, I also suggested that if one needed a ceremonial head of state, it would be useful for that person to be elected through a parliament using a supermajority. That is not just 50%, but a much larger majority. It could be, can be 75%, it can be 80%, to ensure that you get a consensus figure being put into a ceremonially significant position. And that one have ministers for real ministries only. And something that had become very clear very quickly was that uh, with the Bonn Agreement having provided for an economics ministry, a commerce ministry, a finance ministry, and a reconstruction ministry, all with rather poorly designed uh, responsibilities, but all with ministers watching for money about to come riding over the horizon. Um, the scene was set for ferocious competition between agencies as well, and this, this was partly a problem of the quite reckless way in which the ministerial structure of the future Afghan state was configured at at Bonn. Um, now, this was probably the least likely recommendation to be taken up because once people have got a ministry, they will hang on to it like a dog with a bone in its mouth rather than uh, relinquish it. Um, what, uh, the reason I proposed a ceremonial president was that it seemed to me that there was an acute danger by the stage that the office of presidency would be severely overloaded with, uh, if there happened to be an elected president, the president would be the symbolic head of state and the elected head of the executive and a one-person interagency process to resolve the tensions between the different departments and ministers. Each of these could be a full-time job. Um, and um, I'm the same age as Ahmed Karzai, but I actually think he aged a lot more between 2001 and 2014 than I did. I've had a bad few years since then, but that's another story. Um, when we look at what actually happened, the presidency indeed was severely overloaded. The neo-patrimonial character of the system, which crystallised quite quickly uh, in the form of networks being central to the practice of politics, in a way that's documented in Timur Sharan's new book, Inside Afghanistan, that's coming out next week, gave rise to a situation in which increasingly people who were voting in elections could have only minimal confidence that what they were doing was going to have a significant effect on policy because so much of what was being done was by virtue of the need to sustain networks or the need to operationalise networks as a way of achieving political objectives. And this was really outside the realm of um, the kind of political scrutiny that voters were in a position to um, exercise. So whilst uh, Asia Foundation data indeed showed very strongly that ordinary people in Afghanistan had a clear understanding of the benefits of a system where one could change the rules without bloodshed. Increasingly, the ability to have uh, a, a, an effect on policy through that kind of mechanism was, was being adulterated. And, of course, both under Ahmed Karzai, but even more dramatically so during Ashrafani's presidency, vast numbers of people felt that they were entirely excluded from the political order. Even if they had um, um, voted for the candidate who really got the majority in the presidential election. And I'll come to that in just a moment. In the legislative sphere, um, what happened was a bit closer to what I recommended. I, suggested that the powers of the parliament needed to be defined with great care. And on the whole, the constitution did that about as well as many constitutions in different parts of the world have done, because you can only go so far in delineating the powers of different elements of government. Um, I suggested a bicameral parliament, rather than just having a unicameral parliament, one chamber that could be dominated by just one force as a result of uh, an election outcome. 
Um, something I recommended but was not taken up was the idea of term limits, limiting the number of terms that a member could actually serve in a legislature. As time has gone by, I've become more and more attracted by the idea of term limits uh, in all political systems, really, because although people say, well, you know, you might miss out on a second term of Churchill, um, we have uh, had a Prime Minister in Australia who, Australia who said the main Sydney cemetery is full of people who were indispensable. Uh, and that is also worth bearing in mind, that the moment you start thinking that one particular individual is indispensable in a political system, you're setting yourself up for trouble. Um, in terms of how the parliament played out, for reasons related very specifically to the electoral system, which I'll visit in just a moment, uh, it proved to be a system with extraordinarily weak parties and effectively uh, a chamber in the Wallisi Jirga of quasi-independence. The danger with that was since to get legislation through a parliament you need to weld people into blocks, uh, this was an incentive for ethnicization because the obvious thing for somebody who wanted a parliamentary majority or close to it to do was to try to accentuate Pashtun identity uh, given the number of Pashtuns who were elected to the parliament with the likelihood that that would then have rebound effects, like a tennis ball going back and forth across the net. Uh, the moment you begin to incentivise ethnicisation in one group, it can have corresponding effects elsewhere and the, the long-term consequences may not be very nice. Um, and more seriously, the creation of a parliament of independence really went back to the effect of the 1960s when increasingly in the Wallesi Jirga people were rent seekers and brokers rather than people paying attention to what might be good for the country as a whole. That if one wanted to be re-elected under this very quixotic electoral system that had been chosen for the Wallasi Jirga, probably the best way to do it was try to get name recognition by extracting resources from the state and bringing them to one's province. How well that worked, I think, is debatable, but, but it was obviously an attractive idea for people in, in the Wallasi Jirga, and, and the outcome was not a happy one. And then finally, I put forward some recond recommendations in the electoral sphere, and uh, I'd suggested voting at the provincial level with seats for provinces then to be allocated on the um, uh, basis of the actual turnout in the province. Um, the idea that underpinned this was that it would provide an incentive for women to be voting as well as men. The weakness, which I think became apparent, was that it also provided incentive for ballot box stuffing, so it was really dependent upon a really, really high level of integrity in the electoral process, which was potentially there until 2009 when the international actors acquiesced in Karzai's demand to replace the international majority on the Electoral Complaints Commission with um, an indigenised majority. This was a critical, disastrous failure on the part of the international actors because it pulled away the one protection for election integrity that was beyond the control of the palace. And the moment that happened, it was an invitation for uh, industrial scale electoral fraud to be repeated in subsequent elections. There'd been industrial scale fraud in 2009, but 1.2 million votes, 75% of them for Karzai, were then eliminated by virtue of the determination of the Election Complaints Commission. So it's not surprising he had it in, its gun, in his gun sights at that point. But that was when the internationals really should have drawn a red line in the sand in terms of, of protecting the institutional framework, but in, instead they, they proved to have spines of jello and blancmange and went straight to water uh, when, when the pressures hit them with, with catastrophic consequences. Um, I, I then suggested that, that two thirds of the members of the Wallesi Jirga should be elected using a list proportional representation system which would have brought parties into the political system with one third being elected by a system called approval voting, which, which Ben and I were talking about this earlier. It's never actually been used anywhere, but it's, it's where people can actually mark against the name of any candidate they approve, and the person who gets the most uh, marks gets a seat. It's very different from the, the system that was actually used, single non-transferable vote. Um, and this was a system 
uh, SNTV that was decried by specialists on electoral systems the world over. It should never have been put to use in Afghanistan. And the perversity can be captured very easily by one story. If, if people voted at the provincial level, if you had a province with 10 seats and one beloved local of the province got 90% of the vote, he or she would still only get one seat out of 10 and the other 90% of seats would go to people who in total only got 10% of the vote. So there was a complete breakdown in any seats votes relationship that could potentially flow from the use of this system and it really had bizarre effects on the ground. Um, added to this was the problem that when Karzai's popularity dropped dramatically uh, after, between the 2004 and 2009 uh, elections, this created massive incentives for fraud in the context of the emergence of a neo-patrimonial order with networks attached to the presidency. Because if you have a presidential system um, and the president loses, it's not just that person as an individual who loses, it's everybody who has built their economic and political future around the continuation of that individual in office. So the incentive for electoral fraud in 2009 was not just for Karzai, but for everybody who had attached themselves to Karzai as part of a process of network building and political advancement. So it was hardly surprising under the circumstances that the fraud was on an industrial scale. Um, and that combined with the way in which the United Nations and other agencies then, in effect, went along with a brokering of an elite deal rather than um, um, some kind of protection of the integrity of the system, something that became even more acute with the so-called national unity government after 2014, had the effect of degrading the electoral process as any kind of basis of the legitimation of power. And the final point I'd make is that Ashraf Ani learned a very difficult lesson there, which is that when you win an election through fraud, it's a bit like winning a time bomb in a lottery, uh, that it may give you power, but it does not give you authority. And if something then happens that degrades your power, you have no authority on which you can then fall back. And that became excruciatingly clear when the Americans decided uh, under the Trump administration that they were going to cut and run from Afghanistan, or perhaps more precisely, try to cut without appearing to run. Uh, and um, whilst I think the proximate and most dramatic cause of the collapse in Afghanistan last year was the way in which the United States sold Afghanistan out diplomatically. Um, the failure of institutions to function as people had hoped over the previous two decades, and notably during the Karzai period, Karzai got rather, off rather lightly in terms of uh, assessments of the last couple of decades, did have the effect of producing a slow deterioration in the quality of governance which then allied with problems of aid, problems of insurgency and problems of individual leadership, set the scene for a vulnerability that was then critically exposed in um, 2020 and 2021. Let me conclude at that point and uh, Ben, uh, I know, has some, uh, some highly uh, uh, expert reflections from his own experience in this process to share with you. Thank you very much. I might just stay here um, uh, because I'm... Bill has actually... In your, excellent, in your excellent presentation, Bill, has, has actually covered quite a bit of the ground that I wanted to cover, and given we're running a little bit behind time, uh, I might drop some of the things I was going to say that repeats yours, and, and we can uh, maybe return to some of those in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so I was asked to just say a few words about uh, the position of Afghanistan's 2004 constitution in the context of the comparative and international context of the time and the prevailing sentiments of the time. And I think that might help us understand some of the decisions that were taken 
uh, for better or worse, that, that Bill, you've, um, you've gone into in, in detail. Um, so if we think back to those early years of, of this century, um, what were the international preoccupations? Um, I would argue that a lot of them were driven still by the end of the Cold War and the 1990s period of state building that had occurred. You know, many new states had come into being um, as a result of the collapse of communism and then the, um, uh, the end of the uh, um, uh, you know, various, various smaller states that had not been able to gain independence actually did become independent in this period. So there was a concern to build strong, capable states that could deliver basic governance and services to the people. And I would say this is, there was a concern then, it's probably even more of a concern today, um, that um, not so much the type of governance, which is what we're talking about here, but the degree of governance. Were states being governed at all? Were there ungoverned areas? The problem of anarchy, the problem of um, essentially states that did not deliver even the most basic services to their people that couldn't couldn't deliver public goods, that couldn't deliver school, schools, housing, hospitals, and so on. Now, that's a problem we've still got today. Um, and in some ways, I think we have a different perspective on that, that question today than maybe we had back uh, uh, 20 years ago. Why do we have a different perspective today? Well, because of the second preoccupation of that period, and that was democratization. If you think back to that period, there really was no alternative if you were building a new state than to build a democratic state. There was no legitimate alternative. But there was very few practical alternatives either. If you looked around the world, it was hard to see many examples of good governance um, in non-democratic states. Now, I'm a scholar of democracy. I would like to believe that's still the case today. but. Uh, we live in a period now where China, for example, has developed enormously over the last 20 years under a very non-democratic uh, state structure. Many scholars, many political scientists like ourselves were predicting that this couldn't continue, that this would be impossible. Well, I think we'd have to say we were wrong. It, it turns out that in some cases it is possible to build strong states that deliver public goods to the people, to their people, in a non-democratic setting. Whether it can continue, who knows? But this is a different reality than we were thinking um, back in the early years of uh, of, uh, of this century, when it was assumed that uh, the uh, that any state structures built would be democratic ones, and that the only way to ensure uh, good governance, accountable governance, was through regular, free and fair elections. And Bill has covered some of the thinking behind that, but you know, let's, let's be very clear. The assumption is that free and fair elections will result in good governance and good outcomes, not just because people are represented and there's legitimacy, but also because voters would demand good policies and that if they did not get good policies from their governments, they would throw those governments out. They would throw their members out and bring someone else in. Now, that's a, that's a lovely theory. And in some ways, it describes a kind of idealised version of democracy in, in some countries, in this country, for example. But in developing countries, in countries where ethnicity uh, uh, is very basic, even in countries like the United States, as we've seen over the, the last five or six years, it doesn't always follow that voters will demand good policies and good governance with their vote and will be unhappy if they don't get it. Sometimes voters will, will vote for other reasons, maybe because they see their identity as being threatened or represented. Um, sometimes they will vote against their economic self-interest. Again, this is, this is partly the story of the United States in recent years. So a lot of the theories about democracy and governance and state building that we had then have again been kind of undermined by, by the experience since uh, 2004, since 2002, um, um, uh, till today. Um, it's also worth pointing out that if we think about democracy, democracy 
probably reached its high watermark globally right around the time that the Afghan constitution was being written. I think the, the highest numbers of democracies in the world were achieved in the early 2000s. Since then, there's been a constant slide. Very, you know, and many of the countries that actually were, were briefly democratic uh, then are no longer democratic today. And indeed, some countries that, uh, even in Europe, that had been, had been democratic and now non-democratic. And some countries, I mentioned the United States, have clearly regressed in terms of their own democracy, even if they haven't turned into some uh, other kind of re regime type. So, <clears throat> two big preoccupations, state building and democratization. I guess the third big preoccupation of that era was um, the, 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 the threat of ethnic conflict. Um, the 1990s were a decade in which uh, ethnic conflict was really preoccupied many uh, policymakers, uh, preoccupied the international community. Um, the war in the Balkans had highlighted how even relatively prosperous European states could be torn apart by the politi politicization of ethnicity. We saw similar events happening in parts of Africa, in other parts of the Middle East, in Central Asia and so on. So there was, there was a big focus on uh, managing uh, ethnicity, managing identity. The problem was there was no real consensus about the best way to build a state uh, in a very multi-ethnic, complex um, uh, um, uh, uh, social situation. Um, and I say that because if we look elsewhere in the world, um, uh, take the example of Indonesia, for example, the world's largest Muslim state, which is similarly exceptionally complex, exceptionally diverse. Some of the very same debates that we've seen in Afghanistan about federalism, for example, we were talking about at breakfast, were really played out in the same way in Indonesia. People were worried that if you had a federal state, which you know, gave uh, a, a high degree of power to all these different ethnic groups, religious groups and so on, you might fragment the state, you might lead to secession, the state might split apart. So in Indonesia, federalism was, was a dirty word. It was all, you know, the F word. You couldn't say it and um, it wasn't a part of the discussion. And, you know, in some ways, I think the Afghanistan situation was similar around that time. I know we're going to talk more about federalism later, but, um, um, you know, in some ways, you look at Afghanistan, you think this is a natural country for a more decentralised federal system, but the preoccupations of the times in terms of state building uh, and uh, how to manage that degree of diversity sometimes pushed in the opposite direction. Um, okay, and I, I just a, a final aside was on, on the federalism question was at the same time as, as the uh, 2004 constitution was being drafted, of course, there was a US invasion of, Afghanistan, uh, of Iraq and there was a big debate back then, if you remember, about how to govern a country like Iraq, whether confessional groups should be included, whether there should, there should be power sharing between the different religious schisms. Um, then Senator Joe Biden, uh, if you remember, even suggested partition between the uh, Sunni, Shia and Kurdish regions, effectively breaking I Iraq up. So all of these, all of these issues were influential uh, for Afghanistan. Um, and to some extent, I think, conditioned the sorts of debates we were having in Afghanistan. Now, let me turn briefly to the, uh, the Afghanistan constitution. Um, uh, Professor Maley has, has already covered, I think, the key um, uh, questions and the challenges that we were asked to, to consider in our uh, scholarly uh, writings. Um, and in a way, what we were doing was what I think any uh, scholar would do, which is that when you're asked to point blank, uh, de novo, talk about a new constitution, the choices to be made, there's a couple of really obvious ones. What form of government? Do you have a presidential system? Do you have a parliamentary system? Do you have something in between? I think the, the, the initial draft of the 2004 constitution, if I'm not wrong, had suggested a, a, an elected president and a prime minister with, with, you know, so what we would call a semi-presidential model. That didn't last, became presidential only for all the reasons that we've heard, but there was some possibility of some sort of uh, creativity there. Um, 
The choice of electoral system, again, Bill has talked about this, so I won't, I won't repeat it, but most scholars would say that uh, for a presidential election, you would ideally have uh, some majority-inducing system, so that, that, that one way or another, the president could claim to represent the entire country. Very difficult, given the ethnic composition of Afghanistan, but that would suggest, you know, uh, runoff systems or, or alternative vote or something like that. And for the legislature, uh, a proportional system to fairly represent different groups and different parties. Again, that didn't happen in Afghanistan. And then finally, the, uh, the third big constitutional question is the one that we've been talking about and we will come back to. Do you have a unitary state? Do you have instead devolved powers and have a federal state? Do you do what I mentioned in Indonesia? Uh, what Indonesia eventually did, which you decentralise power without having a federal state. These are, these are some of the big choices. In all of those choices, if we, if we want to step back from the institutions themselves, one way of looking at this is, do you want to concentrate power or do you want to disperse and share power? Um, so, um, a winner-takes-all electoral system tends to concentrate power, a proportional system tends to disperse power and then thus requiring some degree of power sharing. Unitary states tend to concentrate power, federal states disperse power. Um, uh, I mentioned the, the semi-presidential idea which actually did come back in Afghanistan um, uh, 15 years, uh, 10, 15 years later. Um, where you have both a president and a prime minister, another form of power sharing. Okay, I promised I'd be brief. Those are the scholarly sort of the the the, um, uh, the poles of the scholarly debate. What influence did this debate have in Afghanistan? I agree with Bill. I'm not sure we had much influence. I mean, we covered all these topics. Uh, we talked about the comparative experience, what other countries did. We talked about the theory, but at least, and I'm not an Afghan specialist at all, I'm a, I'm a comparativist, but when I look at both the early draft of the, um, the first uh, uh, post-bond draft of the constitution and then the final constitution, I don't see much evidence that there was much... Uh, that these experiences from other countries or from the scholarly literature or from academics had much, had much influence. Um, the, the, you know, the initial draft of the uh, uh, constitution appeared to just replace the king with an elected president, um, um, although there were proposals for separate courts for governments and constitutional matters and, and you know, bicameralism and so on. So there, was, there, were, there were some uh, innovations, but, uh, not a hell of a lot of influence. And the final constitution <laughs> that came out of President Karzai's 35-member panel dropped nearly all of these ideas anyway. And then it went, went back to a, a, a unitary state and a, and a highly empowered presidential government. So I would say that um, overall, um, the, the influence of, of foreign experts and comparative scholarly knowledge um, was, was quite limited, really. Um, and just to finish, if, if, we, if scholarly knowledge had been influential, what kind of constitutional structure would Afghanistan have, have had? Well, I think that's pretty clear in terms of the scholarly consensus. Not every scholar agrees with, with this, but the scholarly consensus, if you polled most scholars, most scholars would say, look, in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society like Afghanistan, you're probably better off having a parliamentary system that allows those groups to form governments and share power. Well, that didn't occur. You have a presidential system. Most scholars would say, for similar reasons, you're probably better having a proportional representation electoral system to elect the legislature. That didn't happen. You've got a completely different system that as Bill says, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't achieve anything really, uh, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't have proportional representation and, and doesn't foster the political parties. Um, and finally, most scholars would say for such a complex and large society, some sort of federalism or at least devolution, serious devolution of power to the regions um, 
w would be sensible that didn't happen either. So I, I think in one way of looking at Af the Afghanistan constitution is that it was a product of its time, but it was also uh, a rejection or at least a, uh, a lack of engagement with uh, the thinking of, of scholars. Now, we're going to hear from P Professor Chibabe in a minute. I think the, the question is, would it have made a difference? Would it have made a difference if scholars like us and, and uh, others had been listened to? For example, if those various institutional changes that I just spoke about had indeed been introduced, given all the other challenges that Afghanistan has faced, um, would we be talking about a different outcome? I'll leave that as a question. I'm not going to try and answer it, but I think um, Professor Chabub might be talking on that exact subject. So, thank you very much. Hi, I'm José Antonio Chabub from the Political Science Department at Texas A&M University in the United States. I'd like to thank Shivan and Timothy for the kind invitation to join you for uh, in this conference. I wish I could be there in person. I'm sure that the conference will be very interesting. There'll be lots of presentations and discussions of great interest to me. And I'm sure that being Cambridge at this point in the year, as a matter of fact, as at any point in the year, is rather more pleasant than to be in College Station, Texas. But unfortunately, uh, previous um, commitments didn't allow me to travel at this point. So what I'm going to do here today is to talk a little bit about the constitution of Afghanistan that was uh, promulgated in 2004. I'm going to base my comments on the paper that I'm preparing for this conference, or prepared, or well, I'm in the process of preparing for this conference. And I'm going to concentrate more on the part, on the second part, uh, during which I actually discuss the Constitution. The first part is more generic and consists pretty much of reiterating my position or the position that I adopted in the document that I wrote in 2003, and that is the reason why I am being uh, invited to be here today. In that document, I argued that there was no reason for Afghanistan to choose a parliamentary constitution over a presidential one. My understanding was that the folks on the ground, the people who would have been participating in the constitution making process, had a preference for uh, a presidential constitution but that there were people pushing back because the record of parliamentary constitutions was uh, stronger. The association or the correlation between parliamentarism and democratic survival was positive and much stronger than the correlation between presidential constitutions and democratic survival. I argued then and I'm prepared to argue again today, but hopefully I will not need to do that that the evidence uh, that parliamentarism has a causal effect on the survival of democracy is rather uh, limited. And when it comes to, uh, um, you know, that, you know, an examination of the historical record shows that democracy survived and died under both parliamentary and presidential constitutions and the different electoral systems and then the basically any kind of, uh, uh, you know, all types of institutions that we can think about. Moreover, as we know, unfortunately, Afghanistan is on the wrong side of uh, the equation or in all variables that are meant to, or that are supposed to be contributing to the success of democracies. This, of course, does not mean that institutions are irrelevant. I mean, that would be crazy to be arguing that, and I'll putting myself, be putting myself out of a job. But what matters for the survival of democracy are the conflicts that these institutions are supposed to be processing. And some of these conflicts, and I believe that in Afghanistan this is the case, some of these conflicts um, may be such that they cannot be resolved under, under any type of institutions. So the question is not really which constitution to, to choose, but how to process conflicts under any type of institutions. 
given this, what matters is not so much um, what we know or what the correlations between constitutions and survival of democracy can tell us, but rather uh, the knowledge of and the respect for whatever actors who are on the ground, who will live under those institutions, what they themselves prefer, and the understanding of what some of the minute choices that come with the adoption of a broad constitutional framework, such as parliamentarism or presidentialism, will um, entail. So basically, my line is that it matters much more that we pay attention to the details of constitutions and to how they are written than to whether the constitution is of this type or another. Any constitution is viable, except that, or at least any of the constitutions that are available uh, for uh, on offer um, is viable, but what matters is how is the details of what they pres uh, what they prescribe. Now, the second part of my paper and the remaining of the remainder of my presentation consists of a technical analysis of the 2004 uh, Constitution. Let me explain what I mean by a technical analysis. As we know, a constitution defines the set of acceptable strategies that political actors can adopt in the process uh, of resolving their conflicts and making laws that are acceptable for all. A technical analysis, in my view, consists of examining the constitution for clarity and coherence. It consists of asking to what extent the procedures set out in the constitution are sufficiently clear to guide different actors when they interact in the process of producing legislation. Unfortunately, we'll see that the 2000 and there are some important omissions in the 2004 constitution, omissions that may or may not have played a role in the development of the political process in Afghanistan, but you know, who knows, they should not be there. I am fully aware that part of what I see as a problem can be the result of pure translation problems. In other words, I do not have access to the uh, constitution in its original language, and all I have to work with is a, an English translation. So bear with me and just discount what I say. If you have, happen to know for a fact that my interpretation is mistaken or misguided because the constitution has been not translated uh, appropriately. I am assuming from now on that the text I had to work with is the text that reflects the, the way the constitution uh, works. Before I jumped into the, um, into the analysis, let me just say that there are a couple of factors that I think that are not great in the constitution. By this, I mean in provisions that I personally find that are not uh, uh, the best provisions to be added to any constitution or to some constitutions given other provisions that, that exist there. In the case of the 2004 constitution, what comes to my mind is the existence of a vote of no confidence on individual ministers, a feature that, um, uh, from what I understand, became uh, important in the legislative process during the time in which the constitution was in place. And that has, we know for a fact, created problems in the countries that have adopted it. This feature was very prominent in the Chilean constitution that stayed in place until 1925 and was identified as one of the source, sources of government instability at the time. It is a feature that exists, of, you know, has existed in Peruvian constitutions and that has again, taken a prominent uh, role in the instability that has characterized the country in the past several years. And I do not see and I do not understand what is defensible about this, uh, this particular feature. The second feature is the fact that the second or the upper house of the legislature was partially um, appointed. This I find that is not compat compatible with a fully democratic constitution. However, what I care, what I like or what I don't like, or what I do not like is absolutely irrelevant. Here, 
as it should be. And therefore, I'm going to proceed to um, the technical analysis. I'm going to focus on two aspects of the Constitution. The provisions about the executive decree powers, or the powers that allow executives to issue decrees, and the provisions about the process for producing um, legislation. Excuse me. So let me start with the executive decree powers. As we know, constitutional powers for presidents to issue decrees with the force of law has been anathema. Um, um, about 30 years ago, uh, um, but you know it's less so today. Today, there is a better understanding of what the constitution uh, uh, grants presidents in terms of decree powers. And there is a better understanding of what is unique about these powers. I'm going to be talking here about the what I call contemporary contemporary decree powers, namely the power that presidents can invoke to issue directives with the the, the force of law in a situation in which the constitution remains entirely in place. This is very different from the traditional use of decree powers that used to be granted to the executive either under delegated legislation, a feature that can happen and it exists in almost every constitution, or when somebody invoked a state of emergency, a state under which the constitution was suspended and the executive would be allowed to temporarily um, um, issue decree powers. What makes the decree power that I'm talking about contemporary is the fact that it can be invoked without invoking simultaneously a state of emergency. Even though the constitutions that allow for this kind of power say that the executive can issue decrees in situations that it considers to be urgent or necessary, it is important to emphasize that this is a matter of interpretation that may or may not be litigated at a later point um, in, the, in the process, but it is a matter that does not entail the suspension of the Constitution um, uh, in any shape or form. The Constitution remains in place and the president is authorized under some conditions to issue these um, directives with the force of law. I want to emphasize that the contemporary decree power is not an exclusive feature of presidential constitutions. As a matter of fact, the first contemporary constitution that adopted such a provision was the Italian constitution ratified in 1948. And it has been picked up by a number of constitutions, both presidential and parliamentary, such as the constitutions of Brazil and Chile, uh, or the constitutions of Spain and Romania. So these powers are not uh, defining of a presidential constitution. The 2004 constitution in Afghanistan allowed for contemporary executive decrees under some conditions. To begin with, and this is not part of it, it's, it allowed, as any other constitution does, uh, the executive to issue administrative decrees, decrees that exactly. were limited by the existing uh, legislation. But this, as I said, is a universal feature of constitutions, one that has been included in constitutions since the beginning of the 19th century. Contemporary executive decrees were allowed, were allowed uh, when the, in, in the 2004 Constitution when the National Assembly was in recess. The details here, though, are very important. According to the provisions in the 2004 Constitution, the Assembly, uh, the President could issue this decree when the Assembly was in recess. But these decrees must be presented to the assembly as soon as it reconvenes. Once the assembly is reconvened and has been presented with the decrees, the assembly can do a number of things. 
it can accept the decrees, in which case the decree becomes law. Although, just, you know, and this is one point of criticism of the Constitution, the process whereby those decrees are converted into a legislative proposal is not left clear in the Constitution. It's actually, as a matter of fact, not even mentioned. Alternatively, the Assembly can reject the decrees, in which case the status quo ante, in other words, the situation that existed prior to the issuing of the decree during the legislative recess, um, is uh, restored, or it's restored to the extent that it can be restored. Finally, the legislature can fail to act. However, this is a possibility that's not contemplated in the Constitution. And so we do not know what happens if once the executive presents the legislature with a decree, if the legislature just, just, you know, fails to act in any way, what happens to the decree? As we know, in many countries that have decree powers, this is precisely where some conflicts um, emerged and some very different situations or some, you know, the situation was resolved in many different ways. One possibility is that the decree remains in place like it is the case in Argentina, in which case there is a presumption that the silence of the legislature uh, represents an implicit consent. Alternatively, uh, the executive may be allowed to reissue decrees of similar content, content in the next recess. In the case of Brazil, for example, this became a norm as soon as the Constitution of 1988 was uh, started to work. And it's a norm that had incredible uh, relevance for the process of um, uh, stabilization of the economy because the presidents, particularly Cardozo, was able to reissue the decrees permanently for the entire duration of, its, uh, of his eight years in office. Alternatively, we can have a situation in the legislature um, uh, in which the legislature is not given the chance of not acting. In other words, in which the legislature is forced to act. This is what happened in Brazil again, when in 2000, they decide to reform the structure of decrees and they force that and they stipulate by day and the, 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 the part of the Congress, the legislature is stipulated that the agenda of the legislature would remain closed until all the decrees had been examined, the decrees that had to be examined um, were examined. The point here is that these alternatives can represent different interpretations of the role of the legislature in the decree process. What matters, in my opinion, is whether the legislature uh, has or who has the last wor word in the process. It could be the, the, the executive, could be the legislature, or could be a situation of limbo. And having clarity as to the kind of uh, provision is, is stipulated is very important. So this is the one aspect about uh, the decree provisions in the 2004 uh, constitution that I would like to point out to you. The second aspect has to do with the legislative process, with the relationship of the executive and the legislature um, in the lawmaking process. Any set of provisions on this ideally should regulate three things. Who can introduce legislative proposals and where? How are legislative proposals voted on? And what happens in a bicameral system when the chambers disagree in their deliberations. Unfortunately, the answers to these questions were not always clear or consistent one, with one another in the 2004 Constitution. Regarding who and where proposals can, who can and where can proposals be introduced? The Constitution was apparently clear. Introduction was allowed by members of the two chambers by the government, by the Supreme Court, via the government in areas related to the judiciary. So three main actors, the members, individual members, 
a multiplicity of people, the government, a collective action, a collective actor who could introduce legislation in its own name or in the name of the Supreme Court in matters related to the judiciary. The question then becomes, who is the government? Most presidential constitutions refer to the executive as the president because the president is the head of government and the constitution stipulate that the ministers are subsumed under the authority of the president. The 2004 constitution refers to the government but does not really define the government uh, in a way that allows us to identify when a decision by the government was made. So constitutions that define a government and define mechanisms for decisions by the government tend to be parliamentary constitutions in which either, you know, in which they specify that the head of the government is going to be the prime minister, that decisions by the government are are to be, you know, if they are to be made by the prime minister, must be co-signed by some minister, or the decisions of the government will be taken collectively through a procedure, a voting procedure, or through consensus or through unanimity. The 2004 constitution does not do that, and so it simply refers to the government, a collective uh, actor, making decisions of making acting as a one but does not really specify how that government will, will act as one if it's not through the actions of the president in terms of where legislation can be introduced there are no problems because it says that all legislation must enter first the house of people except for the budget and government uh, development programs that should be entered first um, in the House of Elders. Re regarding the how, the biggest issue that I could uh, identify in the, in the uh, Constitution was the lack of clarity regarding the legislator's ability to amend legislation or amend proposals, legislative proposals. This, of course, seems to, you know, seems to be a the basic you know a basic feature of 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 legislative work and it's almost unthinkable for our, to us that uh legislators will not be um, um allowed to um, amend proposals that they have to appreciate and yet this seems to be the case um in the 2004 constitution uh, which according to article 97 the house of people votes government proposals up or down that is, they either simply accept or reject what has been proposed by the government. Given that the, at other points, the Constitution says that it is part of the worker or the responsibility of legislators to amend legislative proposals, my understanding here is that these proposals, uh, this refers to the proposals made by the individual members of, of one of the houses. Proposals coming from the government go under, go to the legislature under closed rule. Namely, they can only be voted up or down. I, I don't want to say that this is a bad or a good procedure. You know, there are some people who recently, for example, have defended uh, uh, that the U.S. Congress should adopt uh, exactly this mechanism to resolve what they see as the problem of paralysis in the Congress. My concern is that at the same, and whether this is good or bad, one thing that this uh, 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 preventing the process of amendment by government of government proposals by the members of the legislature um, um, uh, prevents the occurrence of a process that I, I believe is important for uh, uh, the generation of information about the preferences of the different actors. So because it is in the process of amending legislative proposals that these preferences become clarified and crystallized and legislative majorities are built and consolidated. Assuming a situation that I believe is the case in, in or was the case in Afghanistan uh, of weak parties 
not able to necessarily express and hold a coherent collective preference, one wonders then, where is it that this process of revealing preferences uh, by the different political actors will occur? So from the technical point of view, the difficulty is that first, it's not really clear whether it is what they, that this provision uh, means what was meant to be, that the, the legislators cannot amend legislation or um, and it doesn't leave clear where is it that this process will, um, the process of trading information and building majorities uh, will take place. Now, finally, the interchamber interchamber disagreement, um, um, uh, namely when the, 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 the two chambers, the House of People and the House of Elders have conflicting opinions about any, some legislative proposal, you know, any proposal needs to be consented by uh, both houses and the president in order to become um, legislation. The mechanism that the 2004 constitution predicts is the so-called reconciliation committee in which an equal number, in this case, an equal number of members of representatives from each of the houses come together and try to hammer a project that's acceptable to both of them, taking into consideration the the differences that emerged from each of these um, um, in each of these houses. This is a process that's widely used in many different legislatures and is intrinsically not problematic. <clears throat> the process is laid out for the case in which the committee is capable of, of producing a reconciled legislation or a reconciled proposal. In this case, in a very interesting move, the, you know, once the community, you know, the one house voted, the other house voted, and they disagreed on what they voted, the committee join, comes together, reconciles the proposal. In this case, the constitution says the proposal does not go back to the, to the chambers, but they are considered to be the joint decision of both chambers. Whatever the committee produces is seen as the joint uh, the, the joint decision of both chambers, and therefore is sent for presidential assent. What's unclear here is whether we should assume that the president can veto the proposal, and if the president can veto the proposal, whether the proposal, the, whether the veto can be overridden, and if the veto can be overridden, whether it is overridden by each chamber separately and by which majority. In other words, it, failed, it, it predicts the possibility that, uh, you know, it predicts, as we'll see next, the possibility that uh, the chambers um, will fail, but when it thinks about the chamber, the, the committee coming together and, um, um, and, and producing this reconciled proposal, it fails to envision whatever may happen in case the president does not necessarily like. Actually, the problem is that it does not make clear if the president is required to accept the proposal that came from the joint committee, just like the two chambers are, or if the president is allowed to veto that proposal, and if in that case, what happens when the president vetoes the proposal. Finally, um, the, 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 as I said, the constitution predicts the possibility that the reconciliation committee will fail to reach an agreement over the diver divergent decisions. They say that if this happens, the House of People will have a chance to approve the proposal at the beginning of the next legislative session by a two thirds majority. Now, one thing to note is that this majority the denominator of this majority is not specified. And this is true in other parts of the Constitution. Are we talking about two-thirds majority of those who are present for the vote or two-thirds majority of those who uh, are members of the, um, of the chambers? Of course, this is, makes a huge difference and it is something that should be made absolutely clear in a constitutional document. Now, if in the second chance, opportunity to vote, if the chamber 
uh, if the House of uh, People approves, the bill is then sent for presidential assent, even though the, the same lack of clarity about what the president is or is not required to do is uh, also exists. But further, we do not know on which proposal the House of People actually vote in that second um, opportunity. Note that the House of, of People had one proposal. That proposal was voted and was sent to the House of, um, uh, of Elders, who reached a different agreement. The, the committee, um, 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 the Reconciliation Committee, failed to reconcile the, 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 the two proposals. And, and, and then the House of People has the chance to vote on a proposal. But what proposal is this? We're not told about that. And again, there is the issue of presidential um, assent. Now, just to conclude, because I know I'm, I'm you know, going beyond the time that was allocated here. My point was not to criticize the Constitution and say that it, it is a low quality document. I mean, amazingly enough, and I have read constitutions from countries all over the world, it is more common than not that some very obvious things are failed, you know, we fail to make them clear in constitutional documents. Some of them are fine in the sense that they became unclear as things evolved, but others really are things that should be made clear from the very beginning. Now, to conclude, I just want to emphasize the following fact. Democracy is a type of political regime that is very hard to survive, and particularly under very adverse conditions, such as the ones that exist in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, and this is some reason for dismay, democracy is most needed when conflicts are very intense. But it is precisely when conflicts are very intense that democracy is most likely to survive, is least likely to survive. We must decide on institutions, and as foreigners, there is no a priori reason to deviate from the institutions that actors on the ground would prefer to have. Democracy will survive or die, regardless of the specific institutions that are adopted in a given country. I firmly believe that, believe it or not. So, but one relatively easy thing that we people interested in helping with democratization can do is to make sure that constitutions do not have omissions and ambiguities since the clear the paths available to all actors are made in the text, the easier it becomes to anticipate what other actors will do and then to reach compromises with this action. In my view, this is what sustains democracy. And if that's so, this is one area that we can help considerably. And I hope that in the future, when Afghanistan hopefully is freed from the current regime and has the opportunity to write another democratic constitution, the, the so-called international community uh, will try to help in create, you know, in making sure that the text that is produced by people who are under extreme pressure will not contain omissions and incoherences that we found here and find, find everywhere else. And in this way, help the process go smoothly. I thank you very much. I apologize for uh, the inarticul inarticulate way I've been speaking. It is still very strange for me to speak uh, in Zoom, looking at my face and I, as I'm talking to you. And, um, um, but I hope that something half intelligible may have come from that. Um, until the next, bye bye. Hi. Thank you, Jose. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> Hello, so uh, okay. all our panelists, it was a very insightful, very informative and provocative discussion about institutional designs based on the Constitution of 2004. I certainly learned a lot and there's 
a lot of important issues have been discussed and brought up in this uh, by the panelists. I have a number of questions, but I would like the participants to ask their questions. Uh, if you're on Zoom and you have questions, you can unmute yourself and, and, and ask your questions, or you can write uh, your questions down on the chat box. And the participants in the hall. Uh, Bashir, I was trying, trying to suggest that in the hall, if there was anyone, I will help you to get the question. Is that okay? Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Thank you very much. I just, I'm just just worried about it. So, yeah. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, Reza, shall I bring the... Um, yes. If you... That's the microphone. That's the microphone. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Reza, and I'm a student of history, basically, here at King's College in Cambridge. And I would like to ask this question um, from basically the panels here. When we talk about you know, political theory and also comparative studies to understand you know, the constitutions in different places, and often we you know, um, compare them to understand you know, what's happening basically in that specific society. So the question is how much, when we talk about Afghanistan in particular, how much social studies, historical studies, anthropological studies, or basically understanding these people in culture, you can say, contribute to um, writing the constitution, or to basically study this. So to make it simpler is that when we talk about constitution, about, you know, in this region, Afghanistan, how much we learn from the past of this country, these people, this society, and then we write it. Thank you. Is there any, shall we get some questions and then you want to answer or shall you want to do it? Whatever you prefer. Um, is there any other question? Maybe we can get in group. Yes, Dr. Shahrani. Uh, Nazif Shahrani. I just wanted to continue, I think, the question that was raised by Riza, and that is, to what extent was the political culture of Afghanistan taken into consideration in writing this particular constitution? I mean, constitution for whom? And what specific problems within the political culture of Afghanistan needed to be addressed constitutionally, and how was it, or whether it was addressed? Good catch, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is, uh, if uh, during the uh, Louis Jurgaine 2004, uh, 2004, if I know, we all know, to the federal system has uh, very limited supporters during the Louis Jirga, but if we had a federal system approve then the collapse in uh, August 2021 is, was prevented by or not? Thank you. These are, um, these are three excellent questions. They, they are all uh, uh, questions for Afghan specialists. So I, I'm going to defer to Professor Maley and but also uh, Dr. Bashir, if he is uh, with us. Uh, they are all indeed very interesting questions. Uh, and one, uh, the, the question about society and culture was bubbling on in my mind when uh, Professor Chebab was talking about what the people on the ground want. And it reminded me of a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine many years ago of a legislator standing up and saying, when my learned friend refers to the will of the people, does he mean his people or my people? And I think that is actually a critical point because the people as a whole uh, don't have a voice which, which speaks mellifluously. Uh, in any particular society, there are going to be multiple forms of 
differentiation and stratification. And very often what is seen as the voice from the ground is actually the voice from uh, people who are already power holders in some respect. Now, that there may be an argument for accommodating that to some degree if you have players who otherwise are going to be spoilers. Uh, and there's a very famous paper from 1997 from the Journal of International Security by Stephen Stedman called Spoiler Problems in Peace Processes, which makes the point that all too often it is cheaper and easier to be a wrecker than a builder. So sometimes it may be unavoidable that one takes into account the, the desires or the wishes of potential uh, spoilers because otherwise they will move into total wrecking mode uh, and one will be left simply with, a, with the shambles on the ground. Uh, that then leads me to Nazif's question about political culture and here I think one needs to be willing to differentiate a number of different factors. Some factors that may be potentially pertinent go to the issue of societal authority patterns and these uh, tended to be deeply ingrained and, uh, and detectable through careful um, anthropological uh, study. There can be other factors that are just as significant which you might not call cultural but which can be products of learned experience and here I'm thinking of levels of trust within society and particularly uh, anonymous trust because scholars on trust often distinguish between face-to-face -face trust within families, lineages, uh, within the calm in a sense and anonymous trust which is one's willingness to put one's trust in someone else simply on the basis of their being a, s a fellow member of the society. Now when you have prolonged conflict in any society, anonymous trust tends to be a, a major victim of that because the costs of trusting someone unwisely can be very high, uh, whereas the cost of being skeptical and distrustful may seem much lower. That's not really a matter of culture. It's more a matter of the lessons of recent life in a particular country. So if one looks, for example, at the collapse last year and how a lot of people who plainly were not lovers of the Taliban decided to switch sides to the Taliban, it's more because the lesson of the last 30 to 40 years has been that it does not pay to be on the losing side in Afghanistan, which makes it a rational decision rather than a response to a cultural norm or, a sec or culture as a secondary reason for action that dictates one's positioning. So I think here one needs to bring into account both the, the sense of normative commitment that they may be embodied in uh, cultural norms and mores in a strong sense of the term and lessons about what is prudentially uh, wise in the light of the way in which politics might have evolved in a particular environment that, that, that needs to be taken into account. On the question of whether the collapse in 2021 was preventable, um, I think it was preventable, but in the sense that the trigger for the collapse was American diplomacy, not the 2004 Constitution. The 2004 Constitution had lots of problems, but the problems in the 2004 Constitution were ultimately no greater than those that many constitutions in the world have confronted, which have led to a debilitation and a diminution of state legitimacy, but not necessarily an ultimate collapse of the sort that we saw last year. And here I think the, the more important factors were uh, Pakistan's providing sanctuaries for a very long period of time um, which, uh, for the Taliban, which it was beyond the capacity of any Afghan government, no matter how it was constitutionally uh, assembled, to confront directly. No Afghan government was going to be able to invade Pakistan. Combined with um, Western policies towards Pakistan, which uh, essentially amounted to dithering and hoping for the best, rather than, um, than biting the bullet. And um, Lisa Curtis and Hussein Haqqani actually published a few years ago a, a very good 
uh, paper on all the different steps that could be taken sequentially and progressively to mount uh, increased pressure on Pakistan with respect to sanctuaries. And it, it reminds me a bit of, of Chesterton's comment about, about the, the Christian ideal. It wasn't tried and found wanting. It was found difficult and not tried. Uh, and uh, the same really governed America's approach to dealing with the problem of Pakistan. Uh, so when you put that together with uh, a, a diplomatic approach which was either delusional or totally cynical, that I think became the trigger for, for collapse. There were problems, but what contributed to decline was different from what produced the ultimate collapse. That, that's, my, that's my judgment anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, do we have uh, Professor Chiba with us? Um, I think we, he said bye, so I guess he's now with us. Uh, I didn't see it on the Amazon, uh, on the Zoom, sorry. <clears throat> just, just to uh, comment briefly on this particular issue, whether uh, the history and, uh, and the politics of Afghanistan was taken into consideration in the constitution of 2004. <clears throat> I would say they claimed, the drafters claimed that they have taken the, uh, the past constitutions of Afghanistan into consideration. They have looked at 36 other constitutions, but the fact is the only constitution that they mostly relied on was the constitution of 1964. And, and, and uh, the, the difference between the president and the king in terms of having large amount of power is between the constitution of 2004 and 1964 is not, not that different. For example, in 1964, the king appointed one third of the members of, members of the Senate and in the, based on the constitution of 2004, again, the president had the same level of power uh, um, and so on. So, and obviously, as I talked earlier, the public, the society was not consulted. And I have to mention the United States and the United Nations was very much involved in not allowing the, consul, the, the constitution, the draft constitution to be released to be public and consulted with the public uh, because they thought that it may, it might cause some, uh, some chaos or uh, uh, some challenge to the uh, draft provisions of the constitution. And obviously when you look at the papers of these, uh, uh, the, our panelists, these scholars who uh, you know that the opinions of the scholars have not been taken into consideration as well in the draft because if they have taken some of the advices of our panelists into account, we would have a different constitution and probably would have a different kind of fate for the Republic. And as far as the federalism goes on, we have different types of federalism. So not all types of federalism are good and not all types of federalism are bad. And we do not necessarily need to have a federal system you can have a unitary decentralized system, like in Indonesia, it's a unitary system, but it's very much decentralized. For example, Spain is a unitary decentralized system. And in fact, it's more decentralized than many, uh, than some uh, federal systems. So, uh, but the fact is that historically, Afghanistan has been uh, so socially a decentralized society and people wanted to do their things in their own villages on their own. And uh, so, so the, uh, basically we tried to establish a very centralized unitary system in a very decentralized society. Based on some surveys around 70 to 80% of all criminal, commercial, civil cases are still decided at the locals and formally. So I think, uh, 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 a centralized unitary system was a really bad idea for the constitution, uh, but unfortunately we adopted that. So uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, actually, um, something yes, just as, as a footnote, something that may be worth bearing in mind is the human factor here. One of the key advisors to the uh, constitutional drafting committee was a French constitutional lawyer called Guy Carcassonne. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that the gulf between fr French constitutional law studies and Western uh, political science is a pretty broad one, 
really, and one would not normally have expected that to have been an effective channel for the amplification to the members of the drafting committee of the kind of analyses that were contained in the papers that were then brought together in this particular document. So I don't think one can push this too far, but sometimes face-to-face -face engagement with people involved in that kind of task does prove to be more influential than something that's simply put forward in writing. And it sounds like a trivial point, but I actually don't think it is a trivial point. I think sometimes somebody who's there will carry more weight than somebody whose views are simply on a piece of paper buried amongst many other pieces of paper that may need to be read. Um, for the sake of timekeeping, maybe we can get two more questions from the floor, or three maybe. Um, we have to keep a gender balance if there is a, a lady who wants to, because if, if there is any. Now on, I think. Thank you. I'm Ahmad Shujah Shaham. I have worked on policy areas back in Afghanistan. I think uh, the Afghan constitution was a closed and fixed constitution rather being a living document for to be in alliance with the realities on the ground of Afghanistan, um, given the fact that everything was changing so quick back in Afghanistan. On the other hand, it was somehow giving very difficulties in terms of amending the constitution. It was a, such a process, a lengthy process, to amend the constitution, while it was giving all the power to the president and turning it into a monarch rather than a president. But at the same time, it was also the, the, the investigation of, um, in terms of implication of implementing of the constitution by the president was not a simple process because we all witnessed that the constitution had been somehow disrespected a number of times by both presidents, but the mechanism of uh, somehow prosecuting or impeachment of the president by not implementing the constitution was very uh, hard and difficult. What are the, the exact lessons of such process and what would your uh, advice be on that? Thank you very much. So who, is, who else had the question? Can you please pass the microphone to Basir, yeah. Basir, please introduce yourself. Can you please keep the question short? Yes, sure. Uh, this is Hasib Basir, uh, graduate from uh, Sussex University. Uh, so uh, I have uh, worked uh, about constitutional court and judicial review on Afghanistan in the 2004 constitution. So there were uh, problems as mentioned by uh, Professor uh, and as you mentioned, uh, you had worked uh, on the drafts and gave a recommendation. Uh, one of the main antidotes to the coming dilemmas are keeping uh, the Constitution alive was installing constitutional court. And as you mentioned, it was one of the main ideas that was in addition to the 1964 Constitution. Uh, so uh, I want to take uh, your point of view on that and how that would have helped Afghanistan in uh, 2000, between 2004 uh, till 2021 regarding uh, saving human rights or maybe uh, sharing power or other, uh, like as uh, uh, Professor mentioned about uh, the problem of defining government uh, since uh, when the president uh, sent a um, file for judicial review to the Supreme Court, it was accepted. But when a minister uh, was uh, uh, removed by the parliament, uh, he couldn't have uh, applied for judicial review for, to Supreme Court since he was not uh, government. Uh, Going uh, for future constitution uh, draft process, do you think uh, constitutional court to be one of the 
uh, ensuring uh, procedural process for uh, defending constitutional constitution and human rights and for sure federalism or any other idea. So, since we have only five minutes, can we just allow the panelists to answer these questions? My name is Layla. I am um, currently year 12, studying politics, um, sociology, and psychology. I've got a question about, like, um, is there any anything will happen uh, regarding the constitution in the future in Afghanistan, like regarding a female or regarding education of girls or anything like um, what re relevant than uh, like um, the situation currently in Afghanistan is, as you know, is terrible and miserable for human rights, girls mostly, females and everything. So uh, my question is that uh, will there be any constitution in the future or will, ha will it have any impact in the future in Afghanistan? So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, uh, just, just some quick responses. Um, constitutions are meant to be difficult to amend. Um, the whole idea of a constitution is that it sits above normal legislation and ideally sets out the sort of broad parameters and rules by which then the political and uh, governmental processes take place. So the fact that the constitution was difficult to amend, I don't think in itself is a problem. It's a problem if there were lots of areas that needed amendment um, from the start. And I, I think another principle for constitutions that's a good idea is um, simpler and shorter is often better than complex and detailed um, because uh, there are a lot of issues that need to be worked out. We don't know in advance what they're going to be when you're writing a constitution and therefore there's a lot to be said for actually leaving as much to elected politicians as possible, um, not trying to prescribe too much. Having said that, to the young lady's question, I mean, it, of course, is open to future, a future constitution to enshrine the rights of women, for example, uh, constitutionally in a way that hasn't occurred, uh, and to have that then be justiciable by a constitutional court. Um, and given the circumstances in Afghanistan, maybe that is a route that is, is worth considering, um, uh, even if it does involve a, <laughs> a breach of my first condition of, of keeping things simple. Um, final point is that uh, my own preference would be to, again, not have the courts play a, 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 a hugely dominant role. So it's not, not to have the sort of situation we have in, say, the United States today where so many big political questions ended up being decided by the Supreme Court rather than by the politicians. I think, ideally, it's better to have elected representatives uh, um, make those decisions than unelected judges, but again, that's a, a subject we could debate. Bill. Thanks, Ben. Um, on the, the initial question of, of giving effect to constitutions, Back in 1885, uh, uh, A.V. Dicey, uh, who was Venerian Professor of Law at Oxford, published a book called Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution. And one of the most important contributions that he made in that was to draw attention to the informal dimensions of the Constitution, what he called conventions of the Constitution, which were understandings within the political elites of particular countries that things had to be done in a particular way. These were further constraints on political behaviour above and beyond those that might be formally prescribed. And very often this is what is necessary to make a constitution work effectively, that politicians don't simply um, say, well, the letter of the law lets me get away with that, so I'll get away with it, but instead uh, respect the um, mores and the norms 
that have evolved about appropriate behaviour in the political sphere um, in such a way as to contribute to stability rather than instability. The problem is that that can take a long period of time. Um, and Richard Rose, the political scientist, once said the recipe is a dispiriting one because the last line is let it simmer for a couple of hundred years. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of truth in that. And frankly, people who deride the performance of Afghanistan after, over the last 20 years very often have come from political systems that um, took much longer than that to be uh, institutionalised. If you look at the period of time between the Declaration of Independence of the United States and the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, America had a lot, much more time to get things right than Afghanistan was granted, and yet it still didn't avoid a catastrophic conflict, the shadow of which still lies across parts of the United States to this day. So time is actually a critical factor here, and you can't speed it up, unfortunately. Um, on constitutional courts, I'm actually wary of constitutional courts if you have a Supreme Court as well within a framework because the danger is that you will have two separate courts, each of which will see itself as being at the apex of critical decision making. This became a big issue in Russia in the 1990s and, and I think it, it is a problem. Clearly you do need a court which has the jurisdiction in the context of a codified constitution uh, to resolve issues about constitutional interpretation that will come up. But I personally prefer a Supreme Court with constitutional competence uh, as the best way in which to do that, which is what we have in places like Australia, for example. Um, on the, the issue of women's rights, yes. Uh, and this highlights a further point, which is, um, I myself do not think the Taliban will last forever. Having seen seven regime changes in Afghanistan in my lifetime, I don't think I've seen the last. Which means that thinking forward, in addition to having an autopsy, is also very important. The issues that you raise are hugely important and they could be back on the agenda of discussion much sooner than anyone thinks. And under those circumstances, there's hardly a more opportune time than now to be thinking about how one might try to do things differently or better in a post-Taliban era than might have been uh, successfully accomplished from uh, 2004 to 2021. Uh, and I think this is obviously uh, going to be an issue of fundamental importance for the very reasons that Michael Barry was canvassing in his, uh, in his keynote presentation as well. I, I think there are actually some provisions in the 2004 Constitution which were a, a significant advance on both the past in Afghanistan but also other countries in terms of women's rights. But there are also a lot of rocky passages along the way between 2004 and 2021 which have in a sense seem to shrink away a bit in comparison with the horrors of what we're witnessing now, but which also showed some of the complexities that need to be taken into account, like, like personal status laws and, and, uh, and laws relating to domestic violence and things of that sort that, that really need to be contemplated very carefully at this stage for the next stage of Afghan political development. All right, so... Um uh, our panel comes to an end. Thank you very much, our panelists, Ben, William, Jose, and thank you all participants, and you all have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we are coming to our lunch break for an hour. Uh, but there's a couple of um, housekeeping announcements that uh, my colleague from Mosaic, Mariam, will do. But before that, um, the uh, publishers of the book of the uh, biography of Ahmad Shah Massoud have sent some books if you are interested to buy. It will be around uh, for the next two days. Uh, and if you're interested, please do come forward. And my colleagues from Mosaic uh, will be uh, very happy to sell copies to you. Thank you. Uh, Mariam, back over to you.
trainers. Okay. Um, hi everyone, so I'm just making an announcement in regards to lunch. All the speakers, please head over to those double doors over there and everyone else, um, we're just going to walk over to the park, which is two minutes away because we've ordered everyone wraps and drinks. It's outside, of course. Unfortunately, the rules and regulations of Cambridge University is that we cannot bring external food inside. So it's a two minute walk. You have some fresh air as well. And um, the weather's great as well. We, we did double check, so don't worry, you'll, you'll be fine. So if I can kindly ask everyone who are not speakers to head, um, sorry, Karim, over here will lead the way and the gentleman upstairs in the red tie will show you where to go. Yeah. Oh, it, it, the speakers have the choice to go out. <laughs> Siobhan's just looking at me as in, why are you saying that?
Tu, tu, tu. One, two.
Uh, Mr. Charlie Gamow as well. Thank you. Um, so, up to you. So, Shivan. Okay. Is the microphone on? Yeah, it is, right? Okay. Okay. So thank you everyone who is here and to those who are joining us online. Uh, welcome to this panel, which seeks to explore the histories of Khorasan and Afghanistan, and seeks also to encourage further explorations into the geographies, histories, and cultures of Khorasan. More on the panel in a minute. Uh, I am Shivan Mahendraja. I'm a historian of the medieval Islamic East. And Zalmi has already mentioned the panelists. I should mention that Dougie, Dougie F. is at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. And he has authored several books on Central Asian history and the Ismailis. Arif Akunzada is in Pakistan. And he has been researching on Khorasan. He has a wonderful article, a forthcoming article on SWAT that I actually enjoyed reading, and I think you all will too when it is published. I believe it will be in Dougie's uh, edit edited uh, volume. And of course, there's Charles Gamow, an old friend who was with the Red Cross in Afghanistan, and he authored a superb history of Herat called The Pearl of Khorasan. Uh, further biographical details on our panelists are at the conference website. Now, thank you, Zamejan. Khorasan, the land of the rising sun, is an ancient Iranian region. Khorasan, however, has nebulous geographical boundaries. Generally speaking, Khorasan extended from the southeastern littoral of the Caspian Sea eastward deep into the Hindu Kush, south towards Sistan and Balochistan, southeast to Kandahar, and north beyond the Murgab and the Oxus rivers. Today, Khorasan is fragmented. Large parts of Khorasan are in Iran and in Afghanistan with smaller pieces in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. And our panelists might say there are pieces somewhere else as well. Uh, new research suggests, as I mentioned, that these includes Khorasan. Khorasan may have been included in parts of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan as well. Now, in pre-modern times, Khorasan was divided into four political and administrative districts. Quarters, I should say, sorry, the Nishapur Quarter, Herat, Marv, and Balkh. The capital of each quarter was the eponymous city, and each quarter had several districts within its authority. The extents of each quarter and the districts under its authority shifted with changes in the political landscape, dynasty to dynasty. Now, Khorasan witnessed the marches of armies east and west. Alexander the Great is the most famous European invader. However, Khorasan was invaded most often from the east. Central and Inner Asian Turks, later Mongols, then more Turks, uh, from Tamerlane onwards. Lord Curzon, in his history, Persia and the Persian Question, observed that, quote, more persons have probably died a violent death in Khorasan than in any other territory of equal size in Asia. Now, apart from invasions, there, there were migrations of inner Asian peoples into Khorasan. This has gone on for many centuries. Some of the migrants remained in the region. Others continued their migrations east into India or west, deeper into Iran, Iraq, and beyond. These migrations continued in the 20th century until Joseph Stalin had the Soviet uh, had the Soviet Union's southern borders sealed. These uh, influxes of Turkmongol peoples infused Khorasan with new cultural and scientific ideas and new ethnic, linguistic, and tribal communities and traditions. Now, Khorasan was obviously a dangerous place. Khorasan's topo topography was also quite daunting, particularly in the eastern limits of the Iranian plateau which has large salt deserts, poor soils, and limited rainfall. Life was frequently Hobbesian, nasty, brutish, and short. Yet, Khorasan thrived. 
cultural, scientific, and economic production in Khorasan was prolific. Persian was the common language, a lingua franca spoken across Khorasan. Persian was also an administrative language, with Arabic being the language of Islamic scholarship. The cultural and intellectual output of Khorasan were enormous. Khorasan's cultural output matters to this day. The literary histories of cultural production in the Persian language, for example, E.G. Brown's multi-volume, A Literary History of Persia, reveals the production of books and poetry in Khorasan. And Carl Brockelman's multi-volume History of the Arabic Tradition, written tradition, identified the contributions to Islamic studies by Khorasanian scholars. Commentaries on the Quran and Hadith, treatises and works on Islamic jurisprudence by scholars from Khorasan continue to be utilized today by Islamic scholars. Nishapur, Bukhara, Bukhara Bakh, Harat, and Marv were centers of Islamic learning before the Mongols visited. Nishapur was the epicenter for Hadith studies, with scholars from around the Islamic world coming to Nishapur to study Hadith. Four of the six canonic, canonical collections sorry, of Hadith books were compiled in Khorasan by Khorasanians. The madrasa originated in Nishapur. It was exported to Baghdad by the Seljuk dynasty's Iranian vizier Nizamimok, hence the name Nizamiya. The Nizamiya migrated from Bakh to other parts of the Islamic world. The Kanaka, or the Sufi hospice or Darvish Lodge, as it is called, appears to have originated in Persian-speaking Samarkand. Kanaka prolifer proliferated in Khorasan before spreading to the Arab world and India. The rank of Sheikh al-Islam originated in Nalbahar, Balkh, and migrated to China, India, and the Arab and the Turkish world. Herat and Balkh had Sheikh al-Islam that provided invaluable services to their communities. The office of Sheikh al-Islam became one of the most powerful offices in the Ottoman Empire. Scientific production and the scientific knowledge in Khorasan were phenomenal. Treatises on hydrology and, hi and agronomy were penned in the 15th and 16th centuries in Harat. These books reveal the extent of Khorasanian knowledge on irrigation and farming. The Persian windmill, for example, is a unique design found only in Khorasan and Sistan. Herat and his surroundings were renowned for the agricultural production, cereals, vegetables, fruits, nuts, cotton, and sericulture. Herat had many varieties of grapes and had superb super wine, we are told. Uh, Balkh province witnessed a renaissance under the Timurids. The city of Mazari Sharif blossomed around the rediscovered tomb of Hazrat Imam Ali bin Abi Talib. Imam Ali's shrine was patronized by the Timurids and the Shaibanids. Irrigation channels were excavated and an extensive hydrological network was developed to supply water to thousands of hectares. Khorasanians were not just intellectuals, engineers, farmers, herders, and craftsmen. They were warriors too. Chinggis Khan's armies had rolled through Transoxiana with little effort, but they encountered stiff resistance in Khorasan. Herat, uh, Herat held out for almost eight months. And the uh, Mongols struggled in the mountain redoubts of eastern Khorasan. The Mongols faced their very first military defeat in Parvan. They also paid a price in Bamiyan, and Bamiyan paid a price for it. Khorasan was finally subjugated and punished far more harshly than Central Asia. The Ghaznavid sultans all employed fighters in Gur as siege specialists. And according to an Arabic chronicle on the Crusades, Khorasanian sappers specialized in mining Crusader castles. Khorasanians in general were well-rounded peoples. That is, they were able to intellectualize, but also to convert theory into practice and to fight when they had to. Yet we get a negative, indeed a very dark view of Khorasan from an influential modern scholar, Barnett R. Rubin. His book, The Fragmentation of Afghanistan, was released as a second edition in 2002. It is one of the most widely cited works on Afghanistan and shaped policies and views of diplomats, military officers, and aid workers. Rubin was also an advisor to the United Nations and the Obama administration. Here is what he says about Khorasan slash Afghanistan. 
Through most of history, the region now included within the boundaries of Afghanistan was a borderland between the empires that ruled from India, Iran, or Tartary. I don't know where he came up with that word. Its people lived off duties levied on the long distance traders who crossed their lands by such roads as the famous Silk Route. They also grazed animals and cultivated crops on areas that enjoyed an adequate water supply. Conquest by Genghis Khan in the 13th century and the opening of the sea route between Europe and Asia in the 15th century sent the region into decline. End quote. Almost everything is wrong about his assertion. Yes, Khorasan was devastated by Genghis Khan, but rebuilding began under his son and successor, Ogadai. A grandson of Genghis Khan accelerated the rebuilding process. The Mongols did so because they wanted to tax and to extract economic resources from Khorasan, and one cannot tax a flatlined economy. To do this, the Mongols rebuilt and repopulated, and one of the instruments was a Tajik dynasty called the Khartid, who ruled from about 1251 to 1381 until Tamerlane came to town. Khartid's, uh, okay, now there's a decree by the Mongol Grand Khan, which is of interest here, and it is re reproduced in the history of Herat, which is written by Saif al Haravi, a native of Herat, that is. Uh, and the book ends around 1322 when Saif al Haravi died. The decree empowered the first Khartid king, Shamsuddin Muhammad Khart, with rebuilding Herat, because Herat was, and I quote, the paramount city of Khorasan. End quote. Shamsuddin had dominion over Herat, and again, I quote, its dependencies. End quote. These dependencies are itemized in the Grand Khan's decree. Shams Adin's dominion extended to, Oxford, uh, to, to the Oxus, to India, the Indus, Balochistan, and to Afghanistan. Now, this is probably the earliest known reference to Afghanistan that I have found anyway. But it refers to territory from around the Tarnak River, east-southeast to the Suleiman Mountains of India. At the time, it literally meant the land of the Afghans, just as Balochistan is the land of the Baluchis. The Suleiman Mountains in India, now Pakistan, was the original home of the Pashtuns, that is Afghans, who are an Indic race of people that speak an Indo-Iranian language, Pashtu. Now, by the time the Khartids handed Herat over to Tamerlane in, in 1381, the city and its agricultural surroundings were thriving. Tamerlane's son, Shah Rukh, fell in love with Khartid Herat. When he succeeded his father, he made Herat his capital, placing his son Uluq Beg at Samarkand to govern Timurid Central Asia. The Timurids of Herat extended their rule deep into central Iran. Herat's architectural and cultural splendors under the Timurids have been discussed exclusively by, extensively by scholars such as Maria Subtelny, Terry Allen, Bernardo Kane, and Beatrice Forbes Mann. But we are told different by scholars like Rubin and those who tend to follow him. So historical knowledge of Afghanistan and Khorasan is confused or diffused. This is why the history, uh, views of historians of pre-modern Khorasan, such as myself, and the views of certain scholars like Rubin do not correspond. Now there are several reasons for this disconnect. First, Khorasan, as I said, was dismembered. Fragments survive in Iran, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, and scholars focus on, focusing on Uzbekistani history, uh, for example, tend to study Khorasan, the Khorasanian fragment in their region as part of, say, Uzbek studies. Iranian studies, people tend to do the same with the Iranian Khorasan. Khorasan must instead be studied as an undivided territory. In other words, there should be Khorasanian studies programs just as we have Japanese studies or French studies programs. Second, philological approaches are lacking. A lot of scholars writing about Afghanistan frequent, frequently do not read the primary languages. And the key languages are Arabic, Persian, Chagatai, Turkish, and Chinese. Third, a scholar's horizon or time frame is, in, in, is important. I say this a bit facetiously, but there are journalists and scholars who write up about Iran, who act as Iran's history began when Ayatollah Khomeini's plane landed in Mehrabad, or when the, about Afghanistan as when Soviet tanks crossed the Oxus. They need to look 
much farther back. Fourth, the creation of new states like Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and the rest of the stands, apologies to those who don't like the term stands, uh, led to the, a very 20th century problem, which is namely nationalism, particularly in the stands following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Poets, scholars, scientists, and warriors born in Khorasan or who flourished in Khorasan are today claimed as Afghan or Uzbek or Kazakh national heroes and proof of the greatness of that particular new national identity. A good read on this topic, by the way, is Charles Kuzman, Uzbekistan, the invention of nationalism in an invented nation. And this gentleman here also is an expert on the nationalisms of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Fifth and last is self-censorship by scholars. Pashtun nationalism, as Professor Musavi has written in a wonderful introduction to his book, The Hazaras of Afghanistan, that Pashtun nationalism has been taboo. This has negatively shaped our knowledge of Afghanistan and Khorasan. Scholars self-censor and adopt a Pashtun national origin and Pashtun majority and Pashtun right to rule narratives propounded by Pashtun ethno-nationalists. Now, when panels for this conference were conceptualized, Criticism was leveled at the organizers, not from Pashtuns, but from Tajiks. We were told that juxtapositions of Afghanistan and Khorasan, as we did for panels two and four, is, quote, divisive and is identity politics. Afghan is an ethnonym. Afghanistan is a land of Afghans that is a land of the Pashtun. To apply Afghan and Afghanistan to Khorasanians and Khorasans is just as wrong as applying English and England to Scottish and Scotland. You're liable to start a riot in Scotland if you try that. Scotland is a very precise term. It means literally the land of the Scots. Afghanistan and Khorasan is not a matter of identity politics. It's just a matter of precision. And this precision is determined not by opinion, but by geography, history, language, and ethnicity. Now, this panel aims to move Khorasanian studies in a new direction. We must move past colonial literatures, tale histories, and preconceived ideas about who the people of Afghanistan are. And these are the views that have, sh have shaped a failed past. So an objective here is to understand through geographical, archeological, philological, and historical approaches the pr and primary sources, the country carved out of Khorasan by British imperialists and Soviets, we mustn't forget, and named Afghanistan by outsiders. And before we move on, the panelists, we have agreed on a certain disclaimer that we are about to read. Um, this conference was originally named in honor of Ahmed Shah Massoud because he is considered a national hero of Afghanistan. Since then, however, circumstances in Afghanistan have shifted. Uh, panelist participation in this panel should not be considered explicit or implicit support for Ahmed Nasud or the National Resistance Front or an endorsement of NRF's policies and activi activities. A panelist's views are entirely his own and do not represent the views of his institution, end quote. And now to our first panelist, Dougie, who will present a paper title on the geographical map of Khorasan. I think that's... I think I lost your... La uh, Mushkil. Yes. Thank you. Is it? I don't have to like here. If I double click it, it should work. No? Right. Yes, uh, thank you very much for organizers of the conference and friends and colleagues. 
for such a wonderful opportunity to come here and uh, have this uh, opportunity to talk and uh, learn from each other. And uh, what has happening in the last, obviously, year is devastating all of us. But unfortunately, this is what it is. So we have to just move on. And uh, about the presentation also, I would like to thank my friend and colleague, Shivan, for wonderful background on Khorasan, which I don't have to go into details. I think I may need uh, some light as well to read my notes. So is it on? Yeah. You can hear me, right? So uh, this is geographical map of, of, of what is now Central Asia. And uh, we can see Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, some bits of China and India here as well. So this is very important actually to look at this map and uh, what happened to Khorasan historically. So this study is mainly based on the primary sources and some secondary source, but also uh, we were able to go through some Western literature and Greek and Roman uh, sources uh, indicating this historical landscape, what is uh, regarded Khorasan. It's a very complicated and it's very long history of thousands of years. But what is important, this land somehow managed to maintain its identity despite of all this invasion by foreigners beginning with Alexander uh, the Great and then R Arab invasions and the uh, Turkic domination of the region uh, in post-Islamization of the area and then Mongols, devastating Mongol and Tamerlan, but also Russian and British colonial rule over the land. However, still we have a lot of remnants of the, of the, of the earlier period which, which this research has been based on. So uh, what I have done here, uh, it's basically based on their first Islamic uh, sources in the period of Islam, we have uh, enormous uh, literature available written about history, culture, tradition, uh, religious identity, and ge geography of the land, uh, what has been regarded Khorasan. But also, we were able to uh, go through some of the sources of the Sassanid period and uh, pre-Sassanid, uh, which I will elaborate further. So, to begin with, uh, basically the name of Khorasan is derived from Middle Persian. Uh, yeah, Khorasan is derived from Middle Persian, word of Khar, that means sun, and Asan or Ayan, which literally means to come or coming, hence meaning the land where the sun rises. The Persian word Khawarzamin, or Khawarzamin, also a applies to the eastern land that has uh, likewise been used as an equivalent term. In the early 14th century, the Taqwim al-Buldan of Abba al-Fida used as a, uh, has been as a remarkable example of most detailed geographical study about the region, who also writes that Khar or Khur means the sun and Asan means their home. But this is not, it's just example of the Islamic period, but we have similar references in pre-Islamic time as well, which I will uh, come in a few minutes. Therefore, mainly Arab historians translated the Persian word of Khorasan, Khorasan sorry, as Mashriq. And this, uh, this way referred to Khorasan or country named as Mashriq. Nevertheless, almost the entire historians and geographer have agreed with the definition of the name and the origin of the word. Accordingly, the term Khorasan came to existence 1400 years ago. One of the main sources which has mentioned the name Khorasan were Arab invaders who following, con uh, following the conquer of the Sassanid Empire and moving forward, the East heard the record of the name of Khorasan. The history of Khorasan between the 7th and 13th centuries is the history of the marginal region becoming a center and then again a margin. During the Arab conquest, some scholars argued that the region was unified as a Mar and Nishapur, previously Sasanian territory, but also Badghis and Takharistan, Haftali territory. Uh, and beyond the Amudaria, Transsaxonia, Sogdian territory, the Islamic province of Khorasan incorporated Badghis and uh, Takharistan 
and even what is named uh, tra Transaxonia. Uh, the, term, the term emerged during the uh, Greek uh, occupation of the region, and it was uh, literally uh, reference to the region which has been known locally Fararud in Persian and in Arabic Mawar al Nahar. The proper Khorasan, I have to go to proper Khorasan now. Uh, what do we mean by proper Khorasan? According to the history of Sistan and the ancient time before the Arab invasion, the land was divided into three quarters, both Bactria and the big part of South Nim Nimrus. Uh, sorry, I have to just play with this map. Uh, this is Bactria. Most of the time, uh, talking to some of the friends and colleagues, they think that Bactria is just what is present Balkh uh, city, but it was a it was a state. It was a big uh, country, and uh, Bactria was obviously uh, Balkh is capital. But in the ancient time, actually, they say that the capital was a bit further from what is now uh, the city of Balkh, and uh, this is Nimruz, and. <coughs> The third quarter of Khorasan, in the third century of uh, Hijri, another Persian historian and geographer, Ibn al-Faqih al-Hamdani, -Ham has divided the proper Khorasan into four quarters, as it appears, the regions such as Nishapur, Hirat, uh, Nishapur, Hirat, Mar, Khorazm, Takharistan, Balkh, and Mawarau Nahar again, and Fargana. Greater, Greater Khorasan, or ancient Khorasan, also, also has been written as uh, Khorasan in historical, uh, his, uh, historical sources, uh, and sometimes a reference has been given to Greater Khorasan, uh, mentioning, uh, mentioning, and the idea is going beyond what, uh, what these uh, major cities have been in, in what is uh, regarded as a Khorasan. Uh, this includes uh, the territory of modern Central Asia, most of it what we have just mentioned, uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, uh, north and western part of modern Pakistan, Khorasan region of present Iran. It's slightly bigger from what is now in, uh, in uh, Iran, and also we have most of present territory of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and southern territory of uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, but also a bit on, on, on Karshi and Khutan in modern China. That has been regarded as part of historical Khorasan, according to the historical sources. Uh, another source from the same period, written by a Persian geographer and bureaucrat of the ninth century, Ibn Khordabe, Kitab al-Masalik, while Mamalik defines the quarter of proper Khorasan as Mar, Balkh, Takharistan, Herat, Badghis, and Sijistan, and Mawarau Nahar, with a reference to the, to the cities such as Ranj, Kandahar, Kabul, Zabulistan, Herat, Balkh, Takharistan, Katagan, and Badakhshan, Mar, Nishapur, Khwarazm, uh, Bukhara, Sukht, Samarkand, Khujan, Fargana, and uh, many other smaller cities which were not probably necessary to mention here, uh, not confusing people, but regarded part of the quota of Khorasan. For example, Ibn Khodabde <coughs> Khodab 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 has left out, out of the geographical map of Khorasan regions such as Kerman in the west part of the, and the west part of the Sindh in the east of south part. While the last region were named as Markan, this is Markan, as you can see, it's Balochistan now uh, between modern Pakistan and, and, and Iran. That's Markan region or province at the time. Historical, historically coastal territory in southeastern part of the present Iran and the southwest part of what is now Pakistan. Another geographer of the third and fourth Hijri century, a Persian medieval geographer, uh, Ibrahim bin Muhammad al-Istakhri, in his book uh, titled uh, Ashkal al-Alam, 
includes the regions such as Zil, Badakhshan, Balkh, Mar, Herat, Nishapur, Bamiyan, Panjshir, Ghazna, Kabul, uh, also part of Khorasan. Ashkal al Alam has also included Markan, Turan, Baluchistan, and Sindh as part of Khorasan. And on the Sindh River has drawn the territory of Hindustan. That has been the divi uh, uh, dividing line between uh, greater Iran or Persia and India. Even though Ashkal al Alam views the Jaihun Amudarya beyond the Khorasan territory, while at the same period, third century, the other historian writes that Abu al Hussein <coughs> Naisaburi, also known as Muslim Nishapuri, a Persian scholar in, in his book, Kitab al Khazain al Ulum, argues that the city of Bukhara has one of the cities of Khorasan, uh, although, although the Jaihun River is in between. And another argue, another, uh, another further argument about it has been by, uh, about the uh, Sogdian region, which is mainly, uh, main, main cities have been Samarkand and Bukhara. Uh, but this is also another debate because since, uh, since the, uh, since the uh, Greek uh, occupation of the region and, uh, and, uh, and uh, introducing their own terms to define this territory, some historians left it out of Khorasan, but that was not the case. And uh, we can see even uh, during Samanid period how these uh, boundaries have shifted. And uh, Rudaki, the founder of Persian or father of the Persian poetry, uh, says that uh, Basically, he lived between Bukhara and Samarkand, but he declared himself as a, as a poet of Khorasan. Ibn Khordabeh, in his, in his book, has divided Eastern Khorasan into Islamic quarter and non-Islamic quarter, which is referred to India. There are, there are, uh, there are some other regions like Nishapur, Mar, Herat, Balkh, Bamiyan, uh, Gharjistan, Takharistan, and Ghur which have been included in, 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 in Khorasan, in the map of Khorasan by historians. There are like a lot of ongoing between these scholars, but I'm just picking some of the important arguments which one way or another have been mentioned in other historical sources. So uh, Yaqub ibn uh, Abdullah al-Rumi al-Hamawi was another Arab biographer and geographer of Greek origin. In his book, Kitab al-Mujam al Buldan. Define the geographical uh, landscape of proper Khorasan within the. When I say proper Khorasan, this is what comes in, in, in mind by most of these uh, uh, scholars. Uh, Khorasan, a famous quarter, Nishapur again, Herat, Balkh, Maru, and has not included other quarters. Abu al fida has recognized the famous quota as the proper Khorasan, but also includes Takharistan, Zabulistan, and Ghur. And Ghazna, Kabul, Bamiyan, Panjshir were considered as, uh, as part of Zabulistan. Uh, Hamdallah Mustawi Qazwini was a Persian historian and geographer and epic poet in his book, uh, Nashat al qulu the reg uh, divided regions such as Nishapur, Herat, Ghur, Bamiyan, Mar, Balkh, and other occasion, Pakistan and Nimruz, Sistan, has been regarded as part of the Khorasan, while, while the regions of Zabul and Ghazni were regarded as part of Sistan at that time. So we are coming to another definition, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, that are like a uh, most of these uh, histor uh, historians and geographers of the time and uh, mainly based on the uh, Muslim sources because this is after the invasion of Arab uh, have been recorded, they divided into parts. And uh, now uh, we will look at some other historical sources when they are referring to <laughs> improper Khorasan. The unknown author of the 10th century geographer, uh, geography book written in Persian Hudud al Alam, Min al Mashriq el al Maghrib. In defining some of the histories, uh, territories, has mistakenly attributed to them certain districts. While discussing the Hindustan and its cities, argues that it's, it's the eastern part was 
the Chinese district of Tibet, and it's south the greater river, and its western part is the river Mehran, Jilam, and in the north of the district, Sh Shuknan and Wakhan, meaning Shuknan and, and, and Wakhan. In the same approach, the author of Hudud al-Alam has defined other regions such as Mawarau Nahar. Mawarau Nahar is the region which in, uh, in the eastern part reaches into Tibet, and the southern part to Khorasan, and in the western part reaches the Ghur and, uh, and Khal, Khalkh, the name of, uh, of another, another tribe living at that particular region. At this point, uh, it's better to illustrate the outline of the geographical landscape of the Greater Khorasan, which has been mainly mentioned in secondary uh, literature. However, the name has been used in the past to cover the larger region that encompasses most of the Transaxonia and Sogdian, and in the north, extended eastwards towards Caspian Sea, uh, south to include the Sistan uh, Desert and, desert and uh, eastward to the Hindu Kush mountain in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the first in, uh, indigenous local rulers of this period in post-Arab invasion were Tahirids, based on um, their capital was based in Nishapur, became de facto autonomous, uh, autonomous in 820 after they ceased uh, to send to Baghdad the revenues of the province. Uh, in 873, the Safavid, Safarids, uh, local ruler of Sistan, began to conquer Khorasan. But after long struggle, they were pushed back by Samanids, another local ruler. Another local ruler of Khorasan. The Abbasid had backed the Samanids, and eventually, the later uh, created an independent state spanning large territory of Khorasan. This is the, the, the geographical territory and the Samanids. And uh, many regarded unifying the whole territory of, 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 of Khorasan under their control. And this was also one of the uh, moments in the history when the first local uh, dynasties established their rule over this territory in post-Arab uh, invasion. And uh, it brought a lot of success in terms of trading, and as we know, Silk Road passes through this region, but also the birth of modern Persian language. So uh, later in the 10th century, the Samani dynasty carried out the official unification of Khorasan and Transaxonia. It created the new capital, Bukhara, an area of interaction between the East China and Turkic people of the Islamic lands and the boundaries of the West, Western Khorasan, which at, the, at that period corresponded to the Buid territory in uh, what is the western part of modern Iran. In the Islamic period, Persian, Iraq, and uh, Khorasan were the two important territories. The boundary between these two was the, re uh, was the region surrounding the city of Gurgan and Damran. In particular, the Ghaznavids, Salchuk, and Turkic, uh, Ghaznavid and, and Salchuks who were Turkish Sunni Muslim dynasties that gradually adopted Persian culture and contributed to the per, uh, Turco-Persian tradition in the medieval West and Central Asia. And Temurids, a Persianate Sunni Muslim dynasty of Turco-Mongol lineage, which ruled over modern day Iran, Afghanistan, much of Central Asia, as well as part of contemporary Pakistan, India, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and the Caucasus divided their empire into Iraq and Khorasan regions. The adjective greater is added these days to distinguish the historical region from the Khorasan province of Iran, which roughly encompasses the western half of the historical Khorasan. It is also used to indicate the ancient Khorasan encompassed a loose collection of territories individually known by other, by other popular names such as Bactria, Khwarazm, Sogdiana, Transaxonia, and Sistan or Aracosia. This is the historical map of, of ancient Khorasan, or, or what is regarded uh, like modern Central Asia and Afghanistan and uh, Iran. 
this is the map how it has been uh, identified based on their ethnic or, or ethnic group they represented by the names of uh, Parthia, Sogdia, uh, we have Arya and uh, Carmania. So these are the major ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, group and uh, according to historical sources, this is uh, the map which represented their geographical uh, location. Sources of the Sassanid period. Shahristan Hoy Eran Shahar, the provin <coughs> provincial capitals of Iran, is a book of geography written in uh, Middle Persian. The book, is list <coughs> the book lists the important cities of ancient Iran, the history of their construction and their significance in Iran, Iranian political and religious history. The author divides Iran Shahar into four district regions, the northeast or uh, Khwarasan, uh, the way it was written, and southern, the Khwarwaran, uh, Khwaran, the southern, or Nimruz, which is uh, in modern uh, Afghanistan. And uh, also on the northwest of Adur Badagan, New Azerbaijan, uh, Shahristan Hoy Eron Shah rely on a mixture of historical, religious, and legendary sources, including traditional uh, story and myth from the ancient Iran and various accounts of the Zoroastrian scripture, the Avesta. We do not know the date for the first composition of the text of Shahristan, Shahristan <coughs> Hay Eron Shahar, but from the references to cities, countries, and individuals in the book, it becomes clear that the material was revised on several occasions during the reign of the Sassanid dynasty as well as during the Islamic era. The final version of the text was most probably prepared during the reign of the Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur. While the concept of Khorasan in, this, in the early and middle uh, Sassanid period could have been popularly intended to start from Rai, uh, or from Hamadan eastwards to the place where the sun rises, it would seem more probable that the limits of Western Khorasan would have corresponded to the, to the whole of Arshar. Uh, it is therefore probable that in the Sassanid epoch, Khorasan included Rai and some other provinces mentioned in later historical sources. Pums often associated with Gurgan, uh, Gurgan region, was likely the western frontiers of Abar Shahar. The Sasanian occupation of the eastern Iran would be difficult today to have a precise and conclusive idea of the eastern boundaries. Nevertheless, if an, ad if an administrative Khorasan entity had existed before the sixth century, its eastern boundaries probably would have corresponded to the Morgab River. Concerning the south, the large Iranian, <coughs> Iranian uh, part of Sistan could have been the limits of Khorasan. At the time, the administrative framework pointed out by Middle Persian sources, Shahristan, Shahristan Hoy, on dated to the Abbasid, to the Abbasid uh, time, so Khorasan divided into 12 capitals. Samarkand, Nawarak, and unnamed city of Khwarazm, uh, literally Khwarazm, Marud, Mar, Herat, Bushanj, Tuz, Nishapur, Qain, Gurgan, and, and Qums. Uh, there are also some mentioning in other historical sources, as I said, during, uh, during the ancient uh, period, we have this uh, reference in the uh, inscription of Basiton. Darius the Great states that he rules over 23 countries, among which were the eastern one of Parthawa, Zrankar, Haraiwa, Uwarazmi, Bakhtirsh, Suguda, Gandhara, Saka, Thatagush, Harawatish, 
Parthia, Darangiana, Ariana, Chorazm, Bactria, Sagdiana, Gandara, Scythia, Satagidia, Arachosia. Each of these which uh, came at that point in the historical considered to be part of Khorasan. Like the Achaemenid and the early Samanid kings also claimed authority over eastern Iran. In his renowned <coughs> trilingual inscription on the Kaaba'i Zardusht, Shapur mentions the eastern lands of Parthia and uh, Parthia, the entire Alburs chain, Media, Gurgan, Mar, Herau, the entire Abarshar, Kerman, Sistan, Turan, Makran, Paradan, Hindustan, Kushan Shahar, up to Peshawar and to Kaishar, Sogdiana and Tashkent, and on the other hand side of the sea of the land of Mazum, as part of his uh, domain. And uh, for the couple of other sources mentioning about this territory, we can just look at also what uh, Zoroastrian sources are telling us. Uh, Eastern Iran was Zoroaster's motherland and the Avesta preserved a wealth of precious information on early so uh, society in an area stretch <coughs> stretching from the Aral Sea to Helmand, province in southern Afghanistan. Yeah, I'm coming to that. The toponym also uh, the toponyms also have been mentioned in Avestan literature, which literally indicates to these important cities. But what is also uh, interesting to learn that these toponyms and these particular cities, which I have been repeating myself, most of them have been written in Avestan language. So it means that Aryan, Aryan people or uh, people who uh, associated with this, uh, with this uh, religion or identity and kingdoms, they have been uh, the one who named these top toponyms. And we also can see in some other historical sources like Pejdadian and K Kayanian kingdoms who existed uh, in very uh, long distant history, uh, they have also mentioned these cities and in their historical record. Obviously these records are made later on. And uh, we can also see another thing in Avesta Western literature, when it comes to, similar to the most cities of Khorasan, have been mentioned in Western lit literature, like, uh, again, as I said, Maorum, literally Margush, or Margiana in English, eventually Mar, located in today Turkmenistan, or ha Haroyum, Aryan in modern Afghanistan, Sogdham, Sur Sogdian in modern Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and Khairizem, Khwarazm, and uh, beside the Amudarya, which in a Western literature has been referred as a Riva Dayati. And similarly, the name of Khiva also mentions in the Western literature. And uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, what I did, I came to conclusion, according to all these historical sources, that this is how it looked like in, in, in the ancient time historical uh, geography of, uh, of Khorasan. This is Greater Khorasan or a proper Khorasan, which has been also termed in some of the literature. But there are like literary references that uh, this, the, the division of this territory which belonged or which dominated by this uh, group of people in this part of the world. And uh, I will just uh, quickly say a few things about the conclusion. Khorasan should be studied from urban culture, uh, cultural material, ancient civilization, toponyms, from archaeological and ethnographic uh, ethnographic approach and how much these have changed since ancient time, Aryans, their culture, tradition, and languages. H however, if we, if, we, if we do study from cultural perspective, still the definition of the geography is another important aspect of it. From the scholars as well as uh, people of the region, this uh, and this is the aim of this presentation. So at this point, in according with the historical sources, we were able to demonstrate what looks like pr proper Khorasan, as we mentioned. Uh, this is mainly associated with the major cities of Khorasan, and this is 
the geographical landscape of the Khorasan. Thank you very much and uh, for your attention. Thank you. Okay. 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 Let's no, keep on the screen. Okay. Because Charlie is going to speak. So. Uh, is it there? No. Tim, is Arif online? No? Okay. Uh, Look, Arif, I think, has sent his yeah. presentation. Okay, then you have to work with Tim to get it on the screen. Can you get it up? Sure. Tim, get it up? Okay. Where, where is it? It's not coming up on the screen. Is it? Is it? Can you, can you put, no, can you put it up on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank you very yeah. much. You go ahead. Because I don't know how to. Okay, just so you know, our next speaker is supposed to be Arif Akhundzadeh from Pakistan, uh, but they're having a power cut right now. So apparently he has sent his presentation as a video file, and so while we get that all sorted out, we're going to have our next speaker come up. Uh, it's not coming. It's okay. Uh, it's all right then. Uh, so cool. you can go help him, sure. help him with the thanks. So uh, we're going to have a little minor change in the schedule. We're going to just bring Charlie up here to to speak. Thanks, Charlie. Come on over here. Can we put this map up? Can we put this? Can we put this map on the screen? Hello. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, thank you to Shivan and to the organizers of this conference. <coughs> it's really great to be here and to be having some such interesting conversations with people about Afghanistan um, <coughs> at this difficult time. Um, and it's, and it's going to be great to talk to you all uh, in more detail as the conference goes on. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the history of Herat. Uh, and I think in the abstract it says an initial reassessment. But just to warn you, I won't be arriving at any um, groundbreaking conclusions. In fact, I think what I'll be arriving at is a little bit more uncertainty as to what actually is the identity of Herat, if there is any, and what can we learn from the city's history that will help us understand uh, Khorasan and Herat better today. And I think speaking to people about federalism, Speaking to people about federalism, um, I was, it was interesting because through my study of Herat, this idea of Herat being this sort of semi-autonomous um, bit of Afghanistan, which is at the same time part of Afghanistan, was something which has been a theme of the research that I did for the book. And when I started writing the book, I had no idea of sort of what exactly, I'd, I'd lived in Herat for, for, for a long time and, I, and it was a city I loved and, and I had lots of friends there. Um, but in terms of how I was going to tell the history of the city, I didn't really have a specific theme in mind. But I think as the research went on, a theme began to emerge, which was of this city that is um, strangely situated on the eastern edge of a sort of Persian Khorasan and on the western edge of a sort of uh, Indo-Pakistan Khorasan. And I'm, I appreciate I'm probably using all the wrong terminology here, but I'm a historian, so there you go. Um, but throughout Herat's history, I think as Shivan said, this idea of Herat as being uncomfortable as a part of an empire was something that came through and through. So, for example, when um, the Mongols took it and it became the Kart Maliks, the, the, the kingdom of the Karts, it was very difficult for the Mongols to control it with any deal of um, sort of certainty. That's why they had to have a client government in there. And I think sometimes um, reading some of uh, Heravi and other sources of the time, you get this sense that Herat is something that people don't quite know what to do with Herat. You know, it's so far from an imperial capital, um, and yet, which means it's difficult to control, and yet at the same time, people want it because it has such fertility. And I think as we go through the, as we go through the history of uh, Herat, um, that theme begins to emerge, and as it becomes on the eastern edge of one empire and on the western edge of another, different identities start to be layered over it. And I think um, when we look at the sort of the great glory of the city of Herat, this was the Timurid time. 
And I always think that's very ironic because uh, the Timurid time was when the power emanated outwards from Herat. And actually, what's the most common feature of Herat's history is that power emanates on it. And it's, a, it's sort of simultaneously a victim and an onlooker. Um, and, and the event that I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about, which is the Qiyam of Istishara Hut, which is the uprising in 1979, all of these themes kind of come together. Um, and obviously, with the arrival of the Safavids in 1510, you have another layer of complexity on the identity of Herat, which is the introduction of a Shiite identity. Um, and the Shiite identity further confuses things because Herat has traditionally been a city of Sunni excellence. Having said that, it has traditionally been a city of Sunni excellence, but it has also been a very heterodox religious um, uh, kind of makeup. And I think in the 1980s and, uh, well, and, and much beyond, it's been a center of Sufism. Um, and the, the role that, that Sufis have played in Herat's history is really, really important. And I think one of the most damaging legacies of the last 30 years of conflict has been the, uh, the damage that that's done to uh, the, the role of Sufism in Herat. Um, and looking at um, eyewitness accounts from the uh, Soviet war, the role that Sufi brotherhoods played is almost unthinkable now, given the damage that's been done to those Sufi brotherhoods through a more kind of Ikhwan al muslimin approach to Islam, which has happened since, uh, the, uh, since the Afghan-Soviet war. Um, so, and then obviously after the Safavids, there is, and I'm skating through this very quickly because we so we're all going to be familiar with this, but we have the... Um, the Pashtuns uh, and the Duranis, and again, this is where Herat's identity undertakes a sort of further evolution of complexity, whereby it's, it has a Shia identity, but it doesn't see itself part of the Safavids because it, it's got this strong Sunni identity. But now it has a Pashtun identity, and the Pashtuns seem to be speaking, uh, they seem to be Sunnis, which is okay, but they are Pashtuns, which is kind of not okay, whereas the Persians from Tehran and Isfahan are speaking Persian, but they are Shia. So, so you can imagine all these complexities that, that start, to, start to become part of Herat's history. And I think that's one of the reasons why we always get Herat wrong um, and, and people fail to understand, you know, what exactly does Herat want and, and what exactly are they doing? Uh, and I, the number of times, you know, before I went to Herat for the first time, people said, oh, oh you'll love it. Uh, it's just like Iran. And then you get to Herat and you think, well, actually, it's nothing like Iran. Um, and... And particularly when I was in Afghanistan, you would speak to people in Kabul who were, who were involved in policy making um, and, and, and sort of that side of things. And they would always say, well, you want to watch out for the Heratis because they're, you know, they're far too close to Iran. And actually, when you understand, when you speak to Heratis, and you know, actually, well, we're not that. There's not this sort of great sense of proximity to Iran by virtue of the position of where Herat is. Through its, through its sort of history, it's had to make these messy compromises with Tehran and with Kabul. But the idea that it has a sort of a fixed identity that looks that way, I think is, is, is wrong and, and, and not true. Um, and then obviously, I think um, a, a big part of Herat's history uh, in the sort of modern period has been when the British saw it as the, as the sort of gateway to India. And the entire imperial sort of um, security architecture was based around Herat. And this idea was that if Herat fell, uh, the Russians would just sort of march through, um, on through Kandahar and into India and ev everything would be lost. And, it, and, it, and I think as sort of the, that century went on, it, it was realized that this was actually a bit of a misunderstanding. And the fascination there is that it was the British who'd had a terrible time in Afghanistan in, in the 19th century still thought that the Russians would be able to succeed where they fell. They, they themselves had found it very difficult to control Afghanistan for, for lots of reasons. And yet there was this sort of automatic assumption that if the Russians took Herat, you know, it, within five minutes they'd be, they'd be in Delhi. Um, and which is, a, which, is a, which is a huge misunderstanding of Herat. And I think as history sort of, you know, as, we've, as I've watched, sort of studied the history of Herat, you, you see these misunderstandings continuing to happen over the course of the years. And, and my sense is that it's Herat's place at the edge of these empires that makes it attractive. Everyone wants to have it, everyone wants to own it because it's, it's this sort of great, it's, you know, Herodotus calls it the breadbasket of Asia and it's very fertile and it's a seat of learning and beautiful uh, mosques. And yet at the same time, actually, actually sort of controlling it or working out what to do with it is extremely difficult. I mean, the Safavids found this, the Duranis found this and the disinterest of the Duranis towards Herat after uh, the Afda Afghan Boundary Commission sort of demarcated the boundaries in the late 19th century. It was as if everyone went, okay, now we've solved that problem, we can all go home and, and we can stop worrying about Herat. 
Um, and I think Herat's sort of entry into the, Afghan, into the Afghan identity, you can say it was to a degree marked by those, the Afghan Boundary Commission sort of stopping the northwest of Afghanistan from being a, a flashpoint for Britain and Russia. Um, but as it came into, the, into Afghanistan as a nation, it sort of got forgotten at the same time. And I think it fades from view throughout the 20th century. And if you look at Siraj al-Akhbar, the, 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 the 1930s paper, you know, Herat is hardly ever mentioned um, throughout that, uh, throughout that, that um, paper. And I, and I went through, and I know this because I sat in a library in Kabul and Herat and just went through all of these old uh, editions of Siraj al-Akhbar and I couldn't find anything. And I, in fact, except I found one article where it said, now is not the time for poetry. And I just thought, well, actually, that sums up the way people look at Herat because Herat is famous for its poets. I mean, and I haven't even you know, gone anywhere near talking about that. But, um, and this sort of sense of misunderstanding does continue through to 1979. And I was, I was going to talk about the uprising of the Qiyam, but um, obviously I'm going to run out of time quite quickly. But what's more interesting, I think, for what I'm talking about when we look at the Qiyam is, well, what did uh, Hafizullah Amin and what did Taraki and what did the Politburo, what did these guys think was going on in Herat on the 17th of March 1979? Well, uh, Hafizullah, the Politburo said that Hafizullah Amin had Olympian tranquility um, when they asked him, you know, what's, go what's going on in Herat? Should we be worried? And he said, no, no, nothing's going on in Herat, don't worry. Meanwhile, the city was sort of burning and, and the uh, 17th, they were, uh, Ismail Khan and his friends were about to take over the city and this, this huge uprising that in many ways, kind of started um, the, the, the descent to war. And reading the Politburo accounts, they say, well, it's the Iranians, it's the Chinese, it's the Pakistanis, and it's the Americans. And actually, if you read eyewitness accounts of what happened in Herat, and you speak to people who were there, well, it wasn't the Iranians, and it wasn't the Chinese, and it wasn't the Pakistanis, and it definitely wasn't the Americans. Um, and that's another fascinating misreading. This was a Herati uprising in the name of uh, defense of Afghan values against the invading kind of Soviet and the Kharki um, party um, sort of imposition of this, this way of life onto Herati values. So again, you've got, you've got Kabul getting it wrong and you've got the Politburo getting it wrong. Um, and then I think throughout um, the, well actually, well, the, uh, so the Politburo got it wrong and, and, and Kabul got it wrong. And, they said, well, they're shouting um, Allah Akbar on the roofs uh, in, the nights leading up, in the nights leading up to and during um, the Qiyam. And they sort of used that as this, as this great point that, well, they're, they're copying um, the, the Iranian revolution. But if you read these accounts, the, the language that's used is, uh, the Persian language that's used is very different to the language that was used in uh, accounts of the time before the um, Iranian revolution from, whether it's from Khomeini or whether it's from uh, uh, um, different people who are writing in Iran at the time. These are completely different um, sets of grievances. These are completely different frameworks for understanding what the next steps are going to be. Um, so I think it's fascinating to see that you've got this city that is saying, we're standing up for what we think is Af our Afghan values against uh, a foreign invader, and we're doing it in the name of uh, Afghanistan, we're doing it in the name of Herat, we're doing it in the name of um, Islam. And yet other people from outside are putting all, this, all these labels around what's going on in Herat, none of which are, um, none of which are really true. Um, and I think as a feature of the conflict, because Herat was distant from Peshawar, it, you know, Ismail Khan couldn't sort of hop across to Peshawar and, and, and go and hang out with, with, with the people who were giving out the money and the guns there. Um, there was a sense that they were in this kind of isolated fight against, um, against um, the Russians. And this, I think this helped reinforce a sort of Herati Afghan identity that said we're fighting for Afghanistan, but we're also doing it in Herat, and we're doing it not with the help of the people who have all this support um, that Hekmachar and Masood and the other guys had. Um, we're doing it on our own. Um, and it's fascinating that in the years after uh, the, 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 the end of the Afghan-Soviet war, Herat became this kind of peaceful oasis enclave um, that was distant from the civil war of Kabul and that didn't have to deal with some of the issues that Kabul had to deal with. Um, so I think at times it can be a blessing and I think at times, I mean obviously, clearly it was, it was a curse. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, so, so, so I think what, what, what's, what, what's the conclusion on this? I think the conclusion on this is that, is that Herat has a place in Afghanistan that 
a lot of people in Afghanistan, from my experience, so I lived and worked in Khost and Paktia for a long time, and I would speak to people there, and, and I would say, oh, I'm going to write a book about Herat. And they would say, well, you know, why, why are you going to Herat? Well, Herat's not even part of Afghanistan. And you would sort of say, well, uh, well I mean, it kind of is, because uh, loads of really important things have happened in Herat. And um, uh, during the Soviet conflict, for example, I read there, was a, there was a statistical analysis of the number of inc military incidents that happened in uh, uh, Herat and all the other provinces. And Herat was consistently the, the province in which it had the highest number of sort of kinetic activity or conflicts with the Soviet forces. And yet, if you looked at the history of the Soviet war and actually the sort of Afghan history, uh, modern, modern history, you wouldn't think that Herat plays such an important role. Um, um, but actually, it has. Um, and, and again, that's not me uh, saying that anything should happen or we, you know, we Herat, you should move the capital to Herat or anything like that. I think it's just... It's just to say that there is a part of Afghan history that, that gets lost, and I think this is a pertinent point today, uh, given the conversations around sort of ethnicity and, and, and Pashtun nationalism, um, that, that I think is, is an important thing for, for, for our understanding of that, that Western Afghanistan. And, and I was always struck when I was there, um, the number of people who would go around Herat with their, with their bicycles, they would always have an Afghan flag on their bicycle. They wouldn't have a picture of Khamenei, they wouldn't have... Uh, the, uh, sort of a Pahlavi flag or anything like that. There was a, a very self-conscious Afghan identity to Herat. And, and yet at the same time, they would say, you know, when I go to Kabul and I say, Ishtemi Lola is Jilevi Tani, you know, all, all the Kabulis would sort of look at them a bit strangely uh, as if they're not necessarily part of the country. So, um, so yes, so I, I hope that is some food for thought and, um, and, and I look forward to having some questions later. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, unfortunately, our other speaker, Arif Akhundzadeh, guys, thank you. Uh, Arif Akhundzadeh couldn't make it, uh, couldn't come online in order to email us his, uh, his talk or to come on live, so we're just going to go into the Q&A. So we'll take it about 10 minutes or so so that we can break for coffee and then get on with the other panel. If not, we're going to delay everybody else. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much uh, for the brilliant presentation we have for this uh, panel. So um, I have a comment and two questions for Doug, basically Doug's paper. So the comment is that when we say about Khorasan or Khavarasan, which is a Middle Persian, um, as you said, and comes you know, in the Persian sources, so we do have a Bactrian uh, word for this, and it's called Mirasan. And Mirasan is a Bactrian, it's from the basically early sixth century, is coming on coins and also on the Bactrian documents, probably is the root of Sasanian, you can say, Middle Persian Khorasan and the whole Islamic Arabic things come with Khorasan. So this is a common basically. Now we recently got them. Earlier it were not available, these documents you can say. So the question is that um, when you talk about these external sources and also an internal view, which is Hudud al Alam, it shows a great confusion. So um, for me, uh, the question would be that why do we have so big confusion about the boundaries of Khorasan? And then if you would like to answer, also, what kept this big entity together? Thank you. Is it working? I can, I can just talk to yeah, you. can hear me, right? Yeah. It's on me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Listen to the map. <laughs> How do you know? No, the map is actually necessary here. We can just go. 
Can, can we get the map? I, I, I will speak, but... Uh, yeah, just going... Basically, uh, no, it's not there, right? Yeah, please. So the thing is, it's not an easy topic. And uh, you're right, and also what was a bit sort of like boring, probably part of my uh, first uh, part of my presentation is going through all this literature. It's, it's a huge, there were like a very, uh, during Islamic period, at least I count 34 uh, literature which are referring to Khorasan one way or another, sometimes about geographical uh, territory of Khorasan, but sometimes also about the city, and they call them Khorasan, and some, some of these scholars also have been confused, and that's why we also have several maps, and try to, you know, but this map is very important, uh, because it shows about, uh, you know, like the earliest inhabitant of the region, and uh, how it has been, obviously, defined. So, According to a Western uh, also literature, we can see a lot of references to this geography and in particular this part of the world. And uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of controversy with Peshtadian and, uh, and, and, uh, and Kayanian. But what is important about them as well, they do actually refer to similar geographical territories. And for Kayanian, actually, their capital was regarded Balkh. And this is also, according to Shahnama, when we see uh, Zorasta came to Balkh and uh, uh, he somehow was able to convert Gushtasp and Gushtasp spread Zoroastrianism in the rest of Iran Zamin. So uh, reading through these uh, historical sources and notes and also some of the maps which have been created by uh, previous scholars, I just came up to this uh, very weird con conclusion of drawing this map. But of course it's not very accurate because historical source, uh, sources are not accurate about this geography. But more or less this is how it sort of shows through all this, uh, let's say, uh, narrative about geography of Khorasan. The name actually mentions about uh, where we are taking the Khorasan is from Sassanid period, but we know that before Sasanian, the, this sort of territory existed and these cities which came to Sassanid Pahlavi language and later modern Persian, they were already there. This is on the toponym of Avestan literature. So I, I don't know whether <laughs> I was able to answer. Yeah, but we use Khorasan because of the Sassanid period, and this is how it is. Well, uh, one of the... Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what kept you together is something you can't answer here. You're talking 2,000 years of history, so, you know, it can't be, it, I, I, I hate trying to distill something into one sentence, because it's not correct to do that. So I think we'll have to defer any kind of answer on that. Okay. But there was a certain amount of unity and co uh, you know, cohesion to this, to this region, even if the boundaries shifted a bit here and there. And that shift in boundaries is usually because of dynastic changes. And also, as I said, was how the geographers I mean, today a map is fairly accurate because of GIS and all of that, but you know, it wasn't always the case. So any other questions? Oh, I'm afraid to throw this down because you know. I wanted to raise a question about the fact that much of uh, earlier yeah, histories were not geography based. They were imperial powers and dynasties. So uh, territorial um, sort of culture and so forth is really very, very new. It comes with modern nation states. Before that, it was a particular dynasty, particular imperial.
power that you know uh, was going and taking lands and doing their thing as it were so what if you looked at this geography in terms of the numbers of imperial powers that emerged, declined, disappeared, and so forth, and how each of one, each of those, contributed to, the, to our times to define the cultural geography of this region on the basis of all the things these various dynasties did. I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, that will be an interesting exercise but whether at this time, looking back at an era where geography was not that critical, that we could, in fact, define a geography of some sort. From whose perspective? For what? Well, there are many factors also. Let's say uh, archeological studies, yeah, ethnographic so. studies in the region and also one of the major factor is top of the geographic study is contemporary. No, what, 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 what we are trying to sorry, do. Sorry, we get two questions and then we go for a okay, comment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fortunately a remark to uh, Professor Shivan's remark on that we cannot simplify what held that part of the world together for so long. We have been simplifying through this conference so far a lot of other things and why can we then not say that for the sake of plurality then, then existed and the diversity that was somehow culturally, lingually, and uh, religiously respected, isn't that not, is that not a short? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, yes, you can, you can say one of the things that held it together was you know, a, a language, for example, that was a common uh, uh, meaning like Fars uh, Persian was spoken, that it was a common language over uh, centuries. Uh, but what I mean is that I mean, we, we have a little time, and even when we do these presentations, we are trying to distill a lot of stuff. Like when I did my opening talk, you know, I'm putting in volumes of uh, Persian, Arabic, and English language histories and you know, secondary sources into what was basically seven or eight minutes talk. So everything we do in a conference, you wind up oversimplifying. And there are things like in terms of talking about the cohesion over 2,000 years, uh, you know, there are various factors, you know, there could have been pre-Islamic empire that was actually holding things together, which did happen until the advent of Islam, because uh, the pre-Islamic empires of Iran actually held a vast uh, ter uh, territory together for centuries. And then of course came the Arab conquest and then things tended to fragment with the Arabs. Because the Arabs couldn't hold on to the eastern part after a while and they themselves disappeared, they became uh, you know, they learned the language and they became Persian. They call themselves Iranians today, you know, or Khorasanians or whatever you want to call it. So, I mean, there are various factors, but I mean, how, how can you just in five or ten minutes try to summarize all of these things? Because you, uh, by nature, a conference tends to be, you know, oversimplifying things anyway. We, we try to dis not oversimplifying so much as trying to distill volumes of history. Like when I had a couple of sentences about the rebuilding of Herat, you know, this is a subject of a lot of literature, but you know, I put it down into two or three sentences because this way we can have something to talk about. And there was another question. Did somebody have another question? Oh, Professor Tapper. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. There you go. I need to hold on to this. Okay. I just wanted to back up what Nazif was saying that. Um, Surely looking, uh, the, the very idea of territorial boundaries that could be drawn on maps or indeed on the ground is a very modern idea. Um, Pre-modern uh, regimes or names for regions and so on could not have had fixed boundaries. So I think the sort of maps one is constructing, uh, that people were constructing when they started drawing maps between this, that, and the other regime are misleading. They're very fuzzy. And after all, um, I think as Nazif was also saying, rulers um, were not interested in territory as such. They were interested in the people that they could tax. And if that meant moving people across the territory, they did so. A very broad generalization, but I think sometimes forgotten. Uh, I would actually... Uh, comment is that actually geographies were important to 
a large number of medieval writers. And they did include what they considered maps at the time. Those maps are definitely not precise, the way a modern map would be. But for example, the geography of Abru, and there is a manuscript of the British Library on that, has one of the original maps from, he died in like 1420, so that was his map uh, based you know, on his knowledge at the time of geography and topography. It's a fairly good map. No, no boundaries, but you know, he did basically put down where, but the boundaries are new, yes. Yeah, oh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but, but this is very important, and uh, what I was trying to say, based on historical sources, it's not that, uh, you know, like one or two or three people have made it. There are like a lot of references. As I said, during Islamic period, I count 34 sources referring to this geography. And it's very important for reader, because when you say Khurasan, most of the time in the mindset of people, it's modern Khurasan of Iran. They have no idea that Afghanistan was called Khurasan. They have no idea that most of territory of modern Central Asia was called Khurasan. But also another important aspect of all these studies is language. Sogdian, Bakhtian, they're all Eastern Iranian languages. They have common roots. And on the, based on these roots, linguistic, linguists have made these assumptions. And Bakhtian, Sogdian, Aryan, and uh, Scythian, Saka, they all have similar languages. They spoke similar languages. They could understand at the time each other. Sorry. Well, it's okay. It's okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Um, Charlie, you want to chip in? No, and I, I think when we think of geography, we think of sort of lines and maps. And, but I think another way to think of it is, is identity of particular people who live in particular places. And they would have had an idea of where their territory or where their land stopped and where another land began. And that's how they distinguish themselves from other people who were coming from, I'm thinking of Herat, um, you know, from other places. And, and that uh, Hafez al-Bru, uh, a source from the 14th century, 15th century, which I remember going through, the, the, port the importance of geography, the importance of land, the importance of patrimony uh, within a particular geographical area was just as significant then as I think it is now, except we have the ability now, or my, my sense of it, not, not my sense of it, was that it was just as significant, but maybe they defined it in different terms. Um, because boundaries are the demarcation between where my stuff begins and your stuff begins. And where, whilst they didn't have boundaries then, they certainly had other ways of, of, of saying where their stuff began and where other stuff began. Okay, I think we have to break now. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. <laughs>
آریزالا سایب آریزالا سایب از پنجه راست؟ بله بله خواهش میکنم سلام علیکم سلام علیکم Good afternoon all. I hope you were able to freshen up a little bit. Uh, this is the last panel of this afternoon. Uh, after this panel we'll depart and hopefully we'll get tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock then we'll start the second day. Um, so the last panel, I should make a quick introduction. The panel is chaired by Professor Shahrani. I don't know whether he is here or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. And um, the panelists, we have Dr. Ayuba Yubi online, joining us via Zoom. Uh, we have Professor Saidaskar Musavi, whom I mentioned in my opening remarks this morning. And we have uh, Munaz Ebtikar, who is also um, a scholar from Oxford, who is also online. And um, we will, I will hand it over to Professor Sharani now. Thank you. Banami Khodawandi Jono Kharad. Salam Bahamayi Dusta. And uh, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure, to be here at uh, Cambridge University, where I have not been before. I've been to the competitor, Oxford, several times before, but not here. And I want to thank Dr. Nishat and also Siobhan and others who have organized this um, conference. I was asked to organize the panel for today. And I want to express also my gratitude to colleagues who accepted and who are here to make their presentations. Dr. Musavi, whom I have known for a very long time, and also um, one young recent PhD who will be with us on the screen, I hope, Dr. Ayub Ayubi. He earned his PhD at one of the universities in India, and he's working in Urumqi in China. And um, I was involved to some degree in the defense of his PhD degree, so I know his work. And also a very, very talented young lady, uh, Monazza Ibtikar, who also accepted uh, and will be here. Uh, one of my very dear friends, um, unfortunately initially accepted but couldn't be here. Um, anyway, we, uh, we hope uh, those who are with us will be um, people that we all will learn and enjoy hearing them. Let me just make a few remarks about the theme of this particular session. 
Um, initially, it was ethno-nationalism, and I think Pashtun was added to it, Pashtun ethno-nationalism. Um, I hope some of our colleagues who have objected to this would take that back. We are not here to bash anybody. We're here to critically examine some very important issues in the study of Afghanistan. And it's in that spirit that we're going to be talking about this particular phenom phenomenon. One of the questions that Dr. Nishat raised earlier on, which is often has become even titles of books, what went wrong? Um, but the question really is not only what went wrong, why it went wrong. And for that, we unfortunately are engaging in a lot of descriptive discourse, if you like, that people are talking about forms of government, monarchy, federalism, this, that, the other. I don't think any of those forms of government, which is being discussed so hotly, really matters. We have monarchies where this country has been monarchy for the longest time, but they also had their greatest revolution in 1668, which changed a lot of things. It's monarchy with democratic government. We have all sorts of, and we have had also federal governments that are shambles. So what's important is not the forms of government people choose, but the kind of systems that's based on decent values. The reason why the United States is a democratic country today, with the entire world being in the United States in terms of diversity, is not because America is a Republican or presidential system, it's because and I've been told, actually, a few years back by a historian of America at Colonial Williamsburg, the capital of the colonial America, that America was the first country in the history of humanity to have been built on the defense of a set of values, not about anything else. When he said they asked George Washington to become the king of, the, um, uh, king of America. What was the response of George Washington? We run away from monarchy. Why should we rebuild it? And I, I should be the king. He said, we are here to defend a set of values. That's what we are here for. And those values are really four pairs, four critical pairs of values that has built America. Unity and diversity. We're diverse people. We should be united, but we should respect our diversity. What would happen if Afghanistan adopted that value? The second one, private wealth, commonwealth. Everybody should strive to become rich, as rich as they want. But social justice, common, common people's welfare must be also considered and respected. The balance is just that. How is America maintained with billionaires in small numbers, but the largest middle class on earth in any country comes with uh, commonwealth. Not in the, in the colonial sense, but in the sense of social justice. The third one, law and ethics. We should be relying on law, rule of law, but the laws that are being made has to be ethical. You cannot have a law that is unethical because people who make laws can, in fact, insist on making laws that are unethical. That should not be acceptable. And Americans within America do not accept unethical 
legal uh, issues at all. And what is that? The, the last one is, anyway, one, one of the other uh, important things uh, also is a pair that um, at the moment it escaped me. I should have uh, jotted down. But th what the point I'm, I'm getting at is that our system has produced in the last 140 years in Afghanistan a political culture. And it is also a product of political culture that is seriously problematic. There are four key elements, again, we can pair it in Afghanistan, of the political culture which is prevalent in Afghanistan and it should be actually switched, transformed to something else. The first one of those is our politics is person-centered, not institution-centered, not value-centered, nothing else. A person in our persons are very selfish, self-centered. And Bahaudin Majru, long time ago, had a very fascinating book that very few people read. It's called Ajdahai Khudi. Egotism, essentially. It's a dragon of ego, or ego dragon. That's what we're filled with. Our parties are after people, after persons. You say, Hizb Islami, which one? A Gulbuddin Hikmatyars. This, that, the other. We have hundred and something uh, registered parties. Every one of them are parties of individuals, not ideas, not institutional structure. And that's, that's part of the problem. The second leg of our four legged political culture in Afghanistan is essentially insistence on sovereignty, sovereignty of the ruler. By sovereignty, I mean in the Michel Foucaultian sense of whoever is in power claims life over uh, life and death of individual. Everything, whatever power there is, must be theirs. And they are going to um, rule over. So the other side of it is those who are being ruled with this notion of sovereignty are then rayat and tabaa. They're subjects. The fascinating thing was that I had a conversation with um, Karzai when this constitution was drafted, actually, one of my cousins were responsible for the drafting of it. His name was abused, unfortunately, badly. And we talked about this because there is a chapter in Afghanistan's constitution, in the Persian version, if you look it up. It's called the Rights of Ra'ya. Hukuki Ra'ya. I say this is oxymoron. If you're subject, you don't have rights. Why, do, why don't you change that word? And of course, they wrongly translate that into rights of citizens, which doesn't translate, and they do it. So this is the problem, that we have had rulers and subjects in Afghanistan. That's the political culture that we've lived in. The third very important thing that hasn't come up is the abuse of religion is instrumentally. Religion has been just a tool abused by those who are in power repeatedly. We have never used Islam as a set of values, as guidance for living. That's lost. I can't recall a single, a single ruler in Afghanistan who abided in practice by any Islamic value. So what do you get out of that? In a society that claims to be Muslim, but it's abused. The worst part of it is right now by Taliban. This is Islam that we refer to, or Ali Shariati did, Islami istihmari, 
making people donkeys. It's a religion that turns people into donkeys, not Muslims. This is what we need to get away from. And we haven't been able to. And the tragedy that has been brought upon us today is because of that kind of Islam. That these guys invite young people to blow themselves up and expect that there is 72 virgin waiting for them. There's nothing in the Quran. Our society is the most readers of the, they read Quran the most, probably in any Muslim society, and they know it the least. There's no understanding, no, no real understanding of anything about the Quran. And that's the tragedy of our political culture. The last but not least is dependence on foreign powers. From the very beginning, when Afghanistan was created as a buffer state, they gave weapons and they gave money to the rulers. The rulers who have had weapons and money have no need for people. They impose themselves. They do as they wish. That's what Abdurrahman did. And it began from that, his son did. The only uh, a person, two people who didn't get that kind of help were Amanullah after he declared independence. He lasted only nine years and was kicked out. And then Habibullah Kalakani came. Nobody recognized him, nobody gave him a penny. He lasted nine months. Then Nadir comes back with money and weapons and the system starts again. Fortunately, Taliban are more or less in the situation of Habibullah Kalakani for the moment. No recognition, but lots of money is being unfortunately given to them. So there has to be some way of dealing, dealing with this. The worst part of that is ethno-nationalism became part and parcel of this package from the very beginning. They told Abdurrahman, in fact, C Colonel Yate, in 1984, 1884, I'm sorry, when they were demarking the border between Iran and Afghanistan told Abdurrahman that that border cannot be protected with local people. You cannot trust them. Bring your Pashtuns from the south. And that was the beginning of Naqilin project, which is continuing still. And we all hear what's happening in Bahad, Khoja Bahadin these days. Pashtuns from the um, uh, Waziristan are being brought and demanding local people to leave their houses so that they can claim their, their land. That's the beginning of ethno-nationalism, which got worse in the 1930s, 40s. And of course, Amanullah, our, our beloved reformist king, was the worst because he actually cre made this legal. He printed a Nizam Nama of Naqilin. 16, 17 pages, it's available online. And then the rest of them continued with Wazir Muhammad Gul and so on and so forth. So we have only had rented regimes in Afghanistan. Not rentier, rented. Every one of the governments of Afghanistan have been um, rented by somebody from outside, sometimes several governments. They always work for outsiders, never for people. That's why we don't have citizens in Afghanistan. We only have subjects. The last thing that I want to say is, what has that brought to Afghanistan? Political violence. 16 people, persons, have ruled Afghanistan since 1880. How did they die? Six of them were killed while in office. Seven of them were violently removed from power. From 16, only two were non-Pashtuns. And only two of them died in bed peacefully. The first one was Abdurrahman. And people hated him for what he had done. Only one who was four months interim president, Sibratullah Mujaddidi, died peacefully. 
That is often taken as the violent nature of Afghan society and culture. I'm sorry, it isn't Afghan society and culture, it's Afghans, Afghanistan's political process. It's Afghanistan's politics that is violent. That's what it is evidence of, not the people of Afghanistan. It breeds, of course, political violence, but it's not the cause of it. What has been the, resu the other result of that? We have had nine constitutions in 100 years. Nine constitutions, starting with two, uh, 1923 with Amanullah's constitution. Until now, we have had nine of them. What does that say? We have no rule of law. We have ruler's law. Most of them made constitutions for themselves. And that's why there is no stability constitutionally, legally. That's the nature of our political culture. And of course, the misery that the country is suffering today is the product of that political culture that has been essentially brought this mess on us, this misery on us. We need to focus not so much on describing our political system, but on analyzing it. We need analysis. I invite you to be more analytical, less descriptive. Description is important, no doubt. Sometimes there is a, say, you know, a little bit of uh, analysis, but often we miss it. Let's focus on our political culture, Afghanistan's political culture, which is really written very little about. I've written a few things so far, but on the whole, this part is ignored. We need to focus on the nature of our political culture and identify the problems that it has brought and then find solutions to them. I'm hoping pretty soon that I have been working for, with a group of about eight, nine people for the last 10 months to produce some kind of a map out, 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 getting us out of this uh, crisis of trust. The worst part of our political culture is crisis of trust. And let me stop here and invite uh, Dr. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be uh, Dr. Ayubi who will join us on the screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sharoni, uh, whom I also call a stud. Really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, you have basically uh, given, uh, in, your, in your opening remarks, you have provided what I was trying to present uh, during my intervention here. But thank you so much. And now I don't have to really go into details. I'll try to be abstract. But the audience might see that there is correlation between or among our terminologies that we will be, we will be using. Since I'm being your student, and I'm heavily influenced by your writings, and I would say that what you have done for Afghanistan probably is what we, have, uh, we, have, we need and we need it the most. So really appreciate it, Dr. Uh, Professor Sharani. Uh, it's a privilege for me and honor to be here. So I will be trying to, uh, uh, I, will I will share my presentation. And fortunately, I've been waiting or traveling a lot lately and I'm jet lagged and I have, uh, I've been waiting and listening to all the discussions since three in the morning. Now it's 10.50, I'm in DC. So if I am, saying something out of context, I hope we can blame it on jet lag. So I start with my presentation. I share, I have been given the privilege of sharing my presentation. I believe it is in uh, full screen mode and everyone can see, uh, physical and virtual participants can see that this is, uh, uh, this is what was given the title for me in the agenda. And I'll just go directly to the, to the point. So if you try to find out centuries-long legacy of Afghan foreign patronage and ethnopolitics, 
I just want to clarify before I just in, enter into this debate or the subject by Afghani quote, we actually, uh, you know, we, we cannot blame uh, those innocent Pashtun um, citizens who are in Afghanistan, but we refer to the people who are actually not in Afghanistan, outside of Afghanistan, using foreign patronage and engage in ethno politics who harm the Pashtuns more than any other ethnic groups. I'll be describing this in details later on. I think we are, we are the same victims like ordinary uh, Pashtuns of these individuals or these uh, rented uh, leaders or um, advocates. So this is the legacy, an uncivilizing Afghan rented state. What I'm trying to indicate here, uh, given the philosoph uh, historical philosophies, uh, uh, it's assumed that the state is supposed to be a civilizing, so uh, guardian of civilizing society. So you have to get the civility of society. You have to guard the civility of society, which has been the opposite for Afghanistan. Actually, the state has been the uncivilizing instrument of uh, uncivilizing force against the society. And uh, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, prevention of Afghanistan from evolving into a modern state, why uh, the legacy has been this, uh, they have really prevented Afghanistan from evolving into a modern state. So we don't, we don't go to details what's modern state. I do believe that uh, you, you do understand. And also preventing the people of Afghanistan from embracing modernity. And here is something I heard, I do believe I heard this from Professor Shahrani, who quoted some other scholars I could not really find out who, who the scholar was, that they assumed that Afghanistan governments, right? Not the people of Afghanistan, but Afghanistan governments, in quote, have not contributed to civilizations, but attempted to destroy them. So this is, this is pretty much what it has been, and this has been uh, the Afghan, in quote, those rented rulers legacy. So recent developments as a living example, we can see what's happening right now in Afghanistan uh, in the 21st century. This is fascinating to see and observe. The whole process is trying to prevent Afghanistan from evolving into a modern state and the people of Afghanistan from embracing modernity. And I do understand modern state and modernity is being uh, being introduced uh, in different ways as infidel co concepts or as whatnot. So like Professor uh, Shahrani stated in his opening remarks, uh, the problem of uh, foreign patronage started systematically in 1880 when the British, uh, the former British Empire shifted from direct in colonialism to indirect colonialism through intermediaries, uh, what we also call clan kings. So they brought in a clan king to do what they wanted to do and could not do directly through colonialism. So this basically uh, established this whole uh, for a uh, patron client system or arrangements for Afghanistan, paving the way for a certain type of Afghan leaders uh, that Professor Shahrani provided interesting statistics on them and how they have come to power and how they have died. They are chosen by the reigning empire to the agony of the people of Afghanistan. I do believe Professor Shahrani has stated this very clearly and better than me. So some of those people who have been brought to Afghanistan as leaders are some of the most hated people, I would say, in the history of Afghanistan. I assume that a lot of people would disagree with that. But I think uh, this is the case. This has been the case. And the concept of political animals, uh, these individuals, they have not been political animals of Afghanistan. They have not had any commitment to Afghanistan. And this has been written uh, continuously by Professor Shahrani. And these individuals have never had any commitment to Afghanistan. And they have had different interests. They have not been political animals of the country. Uh, the, I'm using some ancient terminologies here. We understand these uh, pattern client uh, uh, rent seeking or uh, rented uh, rulers. So they are, they are also considered to be inadequate client king. In some societies, despite being uh, colonized, uh, there were some client kings who were actually installed by other uh, uh, 
foreign powers, but still they offered something to the society. But unfortunately, the Afghan uh, clan kings, they have been inadequate. That's the term, that's ancient term used for clan kings who were inadequate, and then they had imperial instructors. If I give an example, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, we could say that uh, uh, Karzai and Ghani uh, were two of inadequate clan kings and they had instructors uh, in the form of US ambassadors. They often instructed them uh, to achieve the, uh, the imperial project that was taking place in Afghanistan. So these individuals brought to implement the reigning empire's imperial projects, like Professor Shahrani stated. Uh, this is the misunder uh, misunderstanding here. Sometimes we still brag about these individuals and complain they didn't do that or they didn't do this. The, that's not the aim for them to help the people of Afghanistan or serve the people of Afghanistan. Their aim is to implement the imperial projects because that's how they are brought to power. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what they are supposed to do. Uh, like Professor Sharoni indicated, personalized politics has been the case in Afghanistan historically, uh, more so since 1880, and building a rented estate in the image of a clan king. And again, even if you want to do, uh, uh, if, even if you're a clan king, or even if you're engaging in, personal, in personalized politics, in, there are some examples that there has been some positive outcomes, but not for Afghanistan, sadly. We do have strong personalities. Uh, I don't know, uh, this could be a controversial example, uh, but we could just bring maybe Singapore as an example. So Afghan rented rulers and clan kings, I want to continue with that. So I would consider these individuals being agents of imperialism. They actually invite, they already before coming to power, then engage with reigning empires. I also hear some voice, I don't know if somebody's uh, mic is on. I hope I'm being heard clearly. So these individuals invite the reigning empires and collaborate with them and try to implement their uh, strategy in Afghanistan. And, and I do recall a very interesting article that was uh, some journalist wrote, actually. It says, you can uh, rent Afghanistan, but you cannot buy it. So this is more of a, a rented uh, uh, rulers and rented clan kings who are uh, rent seekers. Uh, and then that goes from top down. So we will uh, go into details later on, and maybe hopefully we can also engage on some of those, um, uh, uh, in some of those topics uh, when we are in Q&A. So for instance, uh, Abdurrahman Khan was brought as an example. He was a de facto and brought from outside. Uh, we all know where he came from and who brought them. And serving the empire as the main constituency, not the people. But his entire aim was to contain the people of Afghanistan. Actually, those times were very good for, uh, for Afghanistan to evolve as a modern state to really go ahead with consolidation of power uh, sincerely in the sense that you would like to lay down the foundations for a modern state. But unfortunately, he went on to divide the society. He went on even and made the villages as unit of control. And Professor Shahrani has written extensively on that. And, and, and I would invite colleagues to really look into those sources. So this is contrary to the modern logic of governmentality. So this is also another, another, another logic that uh, in modern sense, that how uh, Professor Shahrani uh, took on that a bit, we are not really citizens, we are more of a subject. If you're citizens, this concept has to, apply, uh, has to be applied. So growing Afghan American expert, uh, expert, uh, experts of Afghanistan, this is interesting. This, is, uh, this has been a new phenomenon uh, since the Cold War. And I, and I recall some of these individuals being promoters or advocates of uh, grand strategy, the American grand strategy. And I put them here, agents of industrial complex. Uh, so I assume that a lot of colleagues understand and a lot of scholars and researchers know uh, what, what am I referring here. And also they are Afghan ethno-nationalists. Uh, it's not really their, Af uh, their ethno-nationalism is not in the sense to help or, or support a particular ethnic group and help them to evolve. It's basically taking hostage a particular ethnic group and dehumanizing. And that's the sad thing. And, and, and also 
agitate them and mobilize them as tribal warriors uh, historically throughout the history. So there are philosophers of Afghan pattern plan um, state formation, narrating policies. I, I did recall one of the scholars uh, earlier, I forgot uh, who did that, uh, uh, provided some quotes from one of these controversial, uh, I would say, quote, philosophers of Afghan pattern uh, uh, pattern client or patronage, uh, that's Robin. So Robin is providing a lot of policies. Uh, uh, it's not really uh, more of a revisionist, but it's more of uh, in, inserting policies into the Afghan, um, uh, the Afghan the context, not really Afghanistan, uh, this, this overall uh, narrative. So core argument of those individuals is Afghanistan emerged into a state as a result of bargain among external powers. That could be true, sadly. And this is, but why they are making this argument con constantly, so justifying that bargain among foreign powers out of Afghanistan foreign capitals, meaning that since it's a country, Professor Sharoni called it a buffer state in 1880, uh, so then uh, there's no point for the people of Afghanistan to engage. So they're subjects, but this sh there should be some sort of a bargain among foreign powers. And that bargain constantly takes place, not inside Afghanistan, but sadly outside. No right or space for local intelligentsia. Uh, I would say that since uh, I, maybe I should have taken local out because most of the intelligentsia, there's no space in Afghanistan actually to evolve as intelligentsia. Uh, despite all the challenges, the past two, uh, two decades uh, provided some space for such evolution, and now they're crashed again, sadly. So preventing the diverse people of Afghanistan from a much-needed organic process of building a state nation. I recall uh, in Professor Sharoni's opening remark, talked about unity and diversity. A state nation is a new concept, reversing the nation state and this is really, this applies to uh, societies with diverse um, ethnic and uh, identity. So there is the unity in diversity, not unity in bonds. Uh, uh, like one of these presenters earlier presented uh, about uh, Khorasan and the diversity of society in the region. So there are various striving models that, that Afghanistan could follow. Uh, uh, Switzerland has been a model that has been brought several um, constantly, but I would also say in India, Canada, and many more thriving models are there that Afghanistan could follow. Sadly, these uh, Afghan rented uh, rulers and clan kings have established an absolute centralized pattern clan system. Uh, and, and why they have done so, uh, as it was said earlier, to control state, economy, and society. So there's no space for any other influence other than this individual who is, who is uh, in charge of all aspects of life in Afghanistan. And why is so? Because it's expedient for the reigning empire or for the patron in carrying out imperial commands. So it can command one individual to carry out the errands or the task. I recall reading one of the papers. I, I heard some, some colleagues talking about the, uh, the constitution in Afghanistan, the recent constitution. Uh, the recent constitution actually was, uh, I, uh, based on the research I've conducted, uh, the draft, the English draft that was adopted is the single draft that came from Robin. And he has actually written himself a, a, a paper calling it crafting a constitution for Afghanistan that's accessible uh, in open, do uh, uh, anyone can search in Google and find that paper. There, Robin is explaining why they, uh, they opted for for a strong centralized uh, political system because that was convenient for the US to work with one individual other than more, um, a more divided system or decentralized system. And he also gave all these interesting and also uh, interesting in the sense that he makes you laugh, uh, justifications why uh, this particular person should have been a, uh, a part, uh, should have been uh, from a particular, a particular ethnic group. And that paper is very interesting. I would recommend uh, reading that. So uncivilizing Afghan instruments, uh, uh, Professor Shahrani uh, 
touched on these uh, during his opening remarks. Uh, Afghanistan sadly has never been a state, uh, a modern state. It has been some sort of a polity for a long time, but there has been a struggle on a monopoly on violence. And this monopoly on violence uh, is often or uh, frequently is achieved with foreign pattern support. And, and then again, the under the guise of state which doesn't exist. So the, the, the uncivilizing African instruments are two. Uh, here I have listed the main ones. Uh, there are probably more, but the main ones that I'm interested in are tribalism. Uh, I, I, I indicated a bit earlier, uh, dehumanization and mobilization of tribal warriors by, via ethnopolitics in exchange for illegitimate rewards and incentives, such as um, uh, looting, um, resettlement, and over of uh, the, uh, so very various incentive and rewards that has taken place in the past. Um, and, and again, this has not been a help for these uh, uh, poor individuals or poor communities. Uh, this has been really uh, a process of dehumanization. And basically, uh, there have been a collateral damage of these et uh, Afghan ethnopolitations or Afghan client rulers. And also theocracy of politics, uh, I quote here, I put in quote, uh, I remember reading this in one of Professor Sharoni's, uh, Sharoni's papers, I, I do recall that, that's called uh, Why Politics of Rage in the Muslim World. So his understanding is that uh, the problem is when you use religion in the service of politics, that is the problem. You could do reverse, you could actually uh, use politics in the service of religion, that's different but not the other way around. And this has been very, uh, very uh, problematic for Afghanistan. And uh, this has been an instrument of radicalization of tribal Southern societies to, re to resist modernity. Uh, and uh, we are from that uh, country, so we have had actually interactions and, and, and experience of watching this in real life. Maintaining the pattern-client arrangements uh, is rent-seeking or gaving conducts and behaviors that demo demolishes uh, existing social capitals or already demolished. Uh, uh, so this has taken place um, uh, even if you have uh, really uh, grassroots leaders, once they engage in this uh, Afghan, um, Afghan state and ethnopolitics politics, we have seen examples, and right now all these individuals who claim to be leaders, maybe at some point they were leaders, but now they're demoralized and, and, and they were basically bought off. They were given lucrative contracts. They were given so much money uh, that, that, that they are demoralized in the sense that they have no space in the society. And even if they return, um, sadly, that they're not taken seriously. And we are, uh, uh, so we, we, we see these examples happening as we speak. Clan rulers uh, sadly has these cronies and web of demoralized local leaders, and they are absolutely um, degraded in the society, not trusted. I remember uh, Professor Sharoni also mentioned about trust in, this, uh, in his opening remarks. That's, that's, uh, that's unfortunately lost in Afghanistan. And recently, it's in, it's, uh, we are going towards a wrong direction um, on that uh, uh, so, uh, so on the other, so what happens at the end is, is this constant struggle of society for independence, and often through violent means, sadly, and that is allegedly allegedly uh, turning us into combatant society. So we are considered to be combatant society, but be, so now we do we understand why are we combatant? So this, a lot of uh, foreign scholars cannot understand why African society is considered to be combatant. They're actually uh, struggling for freedom, for independence from these uh, client rulers and their foreign, pat uh, foreign patrons. So whatever they built, uh, these foreign patrons and their client rulers, uh, it's inevitable, uh, uh, it's, uh, they, they eventually, uh, they are, uh, they are um, uh, destroyed and they are ended. A recent example was Although this is continuing, there's a different phase of the same um, state building in Kot, um, the with the Taliban now. Uh, sadly, as a result, there's exodus of intellectual out of Afghanistan since there's no 
basis for intellectual life or associational realm. So uh, the brains and, and the people who could actually help Afghanistan had to leave because there's no space. So my conclusions, this uh, vicious cycle, uh, that event, uh, uh, again, uh, Professor Sharani mentioned that continues sadly for centuries. And then uh, it, uh, in turn, it really agitates society. It doesn't really safeguard the civility of the society and turns the society into combatant. The society has to really, uh, really defend itself. Uh, if we give an example, we can we can uh, give um, example of Panjshir, uh, the tragedies taking place there, and the brave society and the people who are standing um, against uh, these um, violent and aggressive, and I would say terrorist group. So violence against violence for centuries, sadly, and beneficiaries, agents of corporatism, we said examples. We can just, um, I do recall um, uh, a lot of um, accusations. Uh, I, I do not understand why certain individuals are not being investigated and who have literally American uh, foreign policy towards Afghanistan for, for decades. And they have also benefited uh, they have their sons and relatives and cronies, um, uh, head of certain corporations and, and certain projects that that's unfortunately we are paying uh, the price for. Uh, so my suggestion would be uh, a liberation of southern communities via dissent and nonviolence. So this is what southern societies need, especially the Pashtun communities. I see some movements taking place uh, through this tahfiz, I forgot the, the complete name of this movement, uh, this Pashtun, uh, in, uh, the guy Pashtun, with the last name Pashtun, is leading in, in the other side of the Iran line, line. So we really need to liberate our southern communities who are being dehumanized, radicalized, and abused and used against other, other uh, communities of Afghanistan. And, and, and sadly, uh, this has been the case for centuries. And there has been little uh, development uh, uh, in that part of the uh, the country. So uh, another suggestion I would uh, I would suggest here is partnership with emerging regional organizations. Uh, I do see that uh, Shanghai a cooperation organization is emerging as an as an alternative, as a strong organization, the biggest and the largest, maybe strongest. Uh, so any any adjectives you gave, and hopefully. Things evolve for good there, uh, given the recent developments, what's happening in Ukraine and a lot of other issues. So I, I really hope that, uh, you know, individuals are often uh, uh, gone, but I hope policy change there for good. A shift of approach, a state should be really the civilizing force, not uncivilizing force. And uh, Afghanistan really needs organic emergency. We need of to, um, Dr. Seva, you, we need to. Um, That's the last. That's the last. So the, one more point, I, I finish. So I, uh, I would just go here, uh, Professor Sharoni, this goes towards your argument of a real constitutionalism and social construct, not what, what, what took place in 2004. That was dictated and that was uh, uh, basically imposed on the people of Afghanistan. So this is what, also, what we also need is legitimate internal and external bargain. So there's a two two layer of bargain has to take place if you are to having if you are to have um, a stable independent Afghanistan. With that said, thank you so much. I stop here. My apologies. We're running about 15 minutes late, and I take the blame for some of that. But Dr. Sif Musavi, please. good news is that I'm trying to make it very uh, short and simple and not going to read this 
paper because usually this time of the conference and presentation, people are tired and bored and uh, not very much um, listened to. And especially nowadays, they play with their telephones, you know, <laughs> just escape. Um, um, it's very good to be in um, this uh, environment after many years. And I learned lots of things. And one of the new things I learned was that people would like to come to uh, any conference nowadays. They should be able to play volleyball because they have to play with that. <laughs> yeah. If you're not <laughs> trained enough, that you have to have. Um, the other thing I just remember is that <clears throat> the last um, speak, the last speech I had, uh, Richard Tapper was there <clears throat> at St. Anthony's. We had a conference on 250 years of the formation of Afghanistan. Well, I was very kind to give uh, my um, somebody to speak before me, if you remember, and he went on for 45 minutes. So I had to finish it in, in, in about 10 minutes, and that was because of Richard was insisting, asking me to go and finish it. So, <clears throat> um, I'm going to tackle four points. Number one is, the, is our understanding of the, his, the contemporary history or the history of Afghanistan. Uh, there are lots of chaos on this issue. And one of the problem is if you, if you don't understand um, the historical background of the country, whatever we build up will come to disaster. Or we repeat the disaster. If you don't need, if you don't read, if you don't understand the history, you will repeat the mistake as we did again and again before. Uh, <clears throat> anything, as I promised, I'm making very short. Anything, historically speaking, anything up to 1747 is nothing to do with Afghanistan. It is a regional history, as our friends in the discussion of Khorasan mentioned and tackled. It's nothing to do with us. So one of the issues which we wrongly were taught at the schools in Afghanistan that the Ghalzai's uprising against Safavid is not part of our history. It's part of Safavid history. So up to 14, 1747, uh, whatever we have is shared is um, with the other um, so-called <coughs> modern nation at the moment. But this regional history is not national history. <coughs> um, this will help us to um, rethink about the history, either by Obar or many other respected historians. Uh, or newly uh, published uh, history on Afghanistan. So the history of so-called Afghanistan must be started somehow from 1747 up towards our days. <coughs> from 47, uh, 1747 to um, <coughs> 1880, there is nothing to do with Afghanistan again. We have no single record of anybody suggesting, saying, writing, claiming that um, there is a country uh, uh, so-called called Afghanistan. This part of the history, which is a very troubled part of, 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 of our history, is um, I use the word of formation, even for the conference, I use the word of formation. is is an introduction, is pretext for a country which came, to, came to into being in 18, uh, 1880. So, um, what we have from 14, uh, 1747 up to 1880 is the collapse of 
two impulse around of the Safavid impulse and the Gurkani or Mughal impulse on the east. And Bukharat Emir or Emir, um, Emir of Bukharat, which is gradually they are disappearing and collapsing. In this uh, situation, two new powers enter the, um, the competition. One is the British, another one is the, 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 the Russian Tsar. Um, so we don't have a, a country so far called Afghanistan. If you write the history for, this, for Afghanistan at this period, it is not realistic. It is, um, it is, imag is uh, imagination of a country or a, a community which we imagine, or it is in our imagination. The history of the Afghanistan is exactly as we um, two anthropologists discuss here. It starts where the boundaries come into being. The boundaries come into being on, from 1880. Um, before the empire, they don't have boundaries. They have names, they have some sort of agreement with the, with the different powers. The word Shah and Shah means that we have lots of shahs, you know. We have maybe 20 shahs, but one of these shahs, one of the king, is, is more powerful. The other 19 shahs pay, pays tribute to this king, and this is why in Persian we call Shah and Shah. But there's no boundary that we say exactly as we have nowadays. This is quite new. In Afghanistan, it appear, appeared around, it's not even exactly uh, uh, from 1887, it's around 1890s, the boundaries were made. But anyway, we started from um, 1880. So what we talk, anything we talk about Afghanistan historically, it should start from 1880 to our time. Um, <clears throat> from 1880 to our time, we experiment several system, political systems. We started with the Emirate, Amir Abdurrahman, Amir Ayyubullah for about 40 years, not as an independent, fully independent nation, but the system was Emirate. That's to say internally these people were um, free to do whatever to, uh, they were to do, and they did a lot of things, killing and destruction and so on and so on. But uh, externally we know that um, they have to go, to, uh, they have to look to, uh, Delhi or to, uh, um, uh, uh, or to British India. Uh, so the first system is Amirship or Emirate. From 1990 to 1978, we had a monarch system. Um, in monarch system, we were full independent and we had represented from overseas, send represented to overseas, and so on and so forth. Well, this is why we have um, the Independence Day and so on and so forth. I'm not going to talk about it, whether we were independent because we, without a strong economy and so on and so many other items, then you cannot claim independent or empty independent. But anyway, we have this situation. Um, from 1887, Sorry, yes, from 1972. I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. 1972, we had, um, up to 1972, we had Munoz system. From 1972 um, onward, for the first time, we had a change in our system. We introduced the first Republican, and it was, we have an ex experience of four type of Republicanism. Old republicanism is more um, uh, 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 um, ethno-nationalist system. Then we had uh, socialist um, republicanism. Then we had an Islamic kind of republicanism where in the um, formal documents to Mr. Rabboni referred to as president. Then we had American liberal um, republicanism for the last of 20 years. During this time, we had, 
we also have in exper experiments of four type of democracy. 1946 to 1971, we had the first um, democracy, so-called. From 1963 to 72, we had um, another, the second democracy, which is called Democracy Nguyen, New Democracy. Then People's Democratic Party, they called themselves Democrats. That we had, of course, in the last 20 years, democracy. Um, we also experiments um, nationalism. I just use nationalism as nationalism. Islam and socialism. Neither of these work for Afghanistan. <coughs> um, what we started in 1880 with ethno-nationalism, ethno-nationalism as, as itself is not a bad thing, but it is the first stage, it is the gate to get into nationalism. We never managed to get out of ethno-nationalism. We stuck with ethno-nationalism. How to get into this uh, ethno-nationalism will come and discuss a little bit further. The second thing is that um, <coughs> um, um, what uh, we um, experiment during this, the whole year, is that uh, a state and after state, regime after regime, failed. It was not for the first time. It is as people were waiting, as we were waiting. Everybody were waiting. I think you were waiting. Some of you escaped pre and, you know, successfully before because you knew that it was going to hap happen. I think two, three, two years to the collapse, everyone knew that the, the state is, is falling down very gradually. Um, the question is, why the state in Afghanistan? We have a long history of state failure. Um, one after another one. Monarch system didn't work. Um, um, Islamic system didn't work. Socialism came to Afghanistan, were defeated and went back. And American, of, of course, the liberal democracy came to Afghanistan. I, with respect to many of the discussion, I, I, I support uh, what um, um, William Mealy said. Is there's nothing to do with the uh, constitutional law. The constitutional law, the best constitutional law, whatever we mean by institution, constitutional law, if we implement it wrongly in a wrong society, it doesn't work. It's nothing to do with the, with the, with the, uh, the constitution. It's to do with something else within the society. Um, so, as a, as a response to this, this is the third point. As a response to the failure and after failure and. The, only not as a structural failure, but also failure in many ways. There were responses internally in Afghanistan. Uh, we started the first, um, the first reaction, the first reaction to this state system, which, which was not working. Uh, it started um, 1903 by the first uh, constitutional movement. We have four constitutional movements. First constitutional movement from 1903 to 1900, which the first group were murdered and put into prison and so on and so forth. The second constitutional movement, which is the time where Amun Law came to power, 1919 to 1929, exactly 19, uh, January 1929. The third uh, constitutional moment from um, 1947 to 1971, this is the best part of the constitution. We produce lots of literature for the first time. We have political so-called parties. You are not allowed to use the word party, but we use jamiyat. The word jamiyat means that you are legally playing with your activities. We have Obal and Abdurrahman Mahmoudi and 
all of this. The fourth constitutional, the, the, uh, the fourth constitutional moment is the Dahi democracy where I mean, everybody knows about it and we refer to it as successful, relatively the most successful period of constitutionalism where we had a lot of political development. <clears throat> From 1903 uh, up to um, fourth uh, constitutional moment, we had a um, culture of reformism, um, the um, opposition, that is to say the people or group or intellectuals, they believed that they could uh, manage to reform the system. Now, the fourth point is that um, why we, by all of these um, experiments and by, all, by many supports, British supported us, Americans supported us, Russians supported us, God supported us, but it didn't work. What's wrong with Afghanistan? My finding is that, or well, my suggestion is that there is something wrong with the framework and the content. The framework is the state we built, either at the time of Abdurrahman by the British, or Karzai and Ghani by American, or People's Democratic Party by the Soviet Union. These are framework. Frame-wise, we, we have a society, we, are, we have a nation, we have states, everything as normal as anywhere else. We have two houses, we have constitution, we have universities, we have president, and sometimes we have election. Of course, there are lots of sort of corruption. That's, I, th I think, part of democracy is to have corruption, but anyway. But it doesn't work. Um, many research during 20 years, Ali Wardak made a good uh, fieldwork research in 2010, I suppose. It proved that 80% of population, they don't like to go to the judges. They are going internally, locally, and solve their problem. They don't believe in this system, you know. Though the new judges, they had designed for them their beautiful gowns, you know, looking. And sometimes they ha didn't have as long hair, beard as, as mine, look wonderful, beautiful. But people don't trust it to these people. The most corrupt part of Afghanistan was this, these people. And people were not in any way like to get involved with these people. The other symbolized state doesn't work. The framework doesn't work. Framework was, and even somehow whatever is remain, it looks, it looks as normal, you know, you have a, you have a state. Um, but it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Because there is a contradiction between the content and frame. What is the content? Number one is the state artificiality. Whatever, whatever kind of state we experiment in Afghanistan were artificially imposed on Afghanistan. Either by British, created emirs, you know, or by um, Russian, Comars, Russian, communist, or by American again, you know, lots of beautiful faces in the politics. Of course, outside was even better. It's just exa an example, Dr. Abdullah was, if we created another Minister of Fashion, perhaps he was the best person <laughs> to put him as a Minister of Fashion, you know. I'm quite sure he will defeat the the Italian, you know, the whole industry. So outside was very beautiful. <clears throat> Inside, internally, I think he couldn't go to Panjshir with that clothes. He must have changed his clothes to go to Panjshir. Um, <clears throat> so one is artificiality of the state, of the framework imposed on us. We did not have anything to do from the name to the system, to the administration, to laws, to whatever. Um, 
So this was one of the things. The second thing is that traditionally, um, whatever we introduced in Kabul was very city center, nothing to do with the peripheries, with the provinces. People never heard of it. Uh, um, there was a, um, a documentary by Tulu, and somebody went in 2012, I suppose, went to Pamir and asked the head of one of, the, one of these old, old Pamiris, who is, um, do you know who is in Kabul at the moment, the ruler? He said, Amunullah. <coughs> Then his son, I mean, of course, he claimed that he is over 100 years, this man. His son, which was younger than him, about 80 years, he said, you know, he's, he's so old. I know who is um, the king of Kabul, is Muhammad Zahir This is in 1912. Here's an example that we were so centered, so um, seated, uh, concentrated on the, on the cities. By the way, cities in the terminology of sociology, there is still a question, are we going to have a city uh, even now or not? One of which is in many cities, you open cinemas of the cinemas and theater of the theater. In Kabul, we close it down one by one. I mean, th those of us who are familiar with the culture of um, uh, sociology, of uh, urban sociology, we know that uh, there are elements we call somewhere city and one uh, another urban and rural. Um, bus services, there's no bus services in Kobe. Everything we, we, we see in Kobe, we are going, we're going backwards. So even so, there's a lot of questions ever we, if we ever had a city, but it was city-based. Um, one of the reform by King Amunullah was to change our clothes, the second part of his administration. Change our clothes to have European hat and to have European clothes. But in Kabul, we don't have uh, somebody, anybody to, to make us these clothes. So what they did, for the first time, the second-hand clothes imported in Afghanistan. This is something we should thank Amon Allah that we, he introduced us to wear the Western clothes. Um, but we, did, we didn't know how to use it, how to wear it. There is a handwritten document I read from the time of Amon Allah saying that the, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you have to change your clothes when you enter the ministry, um, Qasri store. Before Qasri store, it says there, is a, there was a room, newly room built. Everybody, they have to have, you know, their tradition to, some, we didn't have um, ragsack those days, we have bukcha in Kabul. So people working at the ministry of um, foreign affairs, okay. They have to go to this uh, room and change their clothes you know, and wear the European clothes and get into the system. And there is a note saying that some some dola, I mean just I don't want, don't use the name. Um, he didn't know how to wear the trousers, so he paid the money. He said, "Why don't have? Why shouldn't I have a big trouser?" He put the trousers. He didn't know to have something over it. He used normal, you know, Afghan, he used, you know, bandit tombon, he used over it, and then he sat there in the office. So that's an example of our modern approach to the state. The, the other, sorry, very quickly, traditionalism. What is traditionalism in Afghanistan is the content is and was deeply ethnocentric. That is to say, nationalism is something um, um, consistent of many different ideals and diversity and so on. But internally, it was only uh, one ethnic groups. 
that one ethnic group has to be enforced upon other, and that ethnic group is not very much happy with the with anything new, with anything going further in future, or doing anything with democracy and so on. So discussing about democracy, human rights, and all of this was rubbish. Why? Because content didn't allow it. And the last word is those people now in Kabul, they are the content. And what, whatever we build in 20 years, where they form. Thank you very much. We're uh, coming to the final paper of this session. Um, Ms. Iptekar, is she presenting online? Okay. This voice is not coming through. Yeah, I'm telling you. still not available. Can you hear me now? Okay, we can hear you. Please go ahead. going to share my screen. Uh, I'm going to speak as fast as I can given the time situation. But um, first and foremost, thank you to the organizers of this conference. To reintroduce myself, I'm a doctoral student at Oxford, and my research is in between history and anthropology with a focus on Afghanistan. Um, before I begin, I would like to first express my gratitude in presenting alongside um, my distinguished co-panelists, Ustad Said Askar Musavi and Dr. Ayub Ayubi, and I want to give a very special thanks to Ustad Shahrani for inviting me to speak on this panel, for his inspiration, as well as his mentorship over the months. I also want to take this occasion to pay tribute to the martyrs of Afghanistan and a special tribute to Abdul Wudud Zara. Without his patience, care, and deep insight, my field's work would have not been possible. As you may all know, Abdul Wudud Zara was martyred this time last year by the Taliban. I will start and base my talk with an ethnographic vignette from the time I was staying in Khai Khana during my preliminary fieldwork when I had just begun my doctoral studies. Khai Khana is a neighborhood located in the northwest of the capital Kabul with a predominantly for Sizaban or Tajik population. The ethnographic vignette goes, it was the second week of September 2018 and I'm walking alongside Rahima. I tell her that I had only seen three national flags among the sea of white, green and black flags 
flags that are locally termed as Bayraq Mujahideen or Mujahideen flags. Raima's response to me was that she barely remembers what the national flags looked like anymore. Later that evening, after noting this observation, Raima's husband, Abdul Wudud Zara, elaborates. These flags remain from Hafteya Shaheed, meaning Martyrs Week. They symbolize our history and identity. Our martyrs fought for freedom, Azadi, identity, Kuwait, for their country, Batan, and their ability to participate in politics. What our martyrs have done for freedom and liberation, Azadi, by Istiqlal, the generations afterwards have to understand this and know who we were, who we are, and what we should be. If this is lost, we will be without identity. In the name of language and politics, Qam Walasan, these governments have undervalued those who fought for freedom. So for some, in and from Afghanistan, Rahima and Abdul Wadud Zara's elaboration, conception, and understanding of the past and ways of meaning making in the present, where themes such as Huyat identity, Shahadat martyrdom, Recalling past wars and resurrecting objects and symbols such as the Bayraq Mujahideen, the Mujahideen flags, would mean that Raima and Abdul Wudud Zara were being divisive in an already divided and fragmented country amidst ongoing wars and conflict with local, regional, and imperial dimensions. Yet Raima and her husband were explaining their conception of history past events, wars, and it's their conception of the past that, I argue, connects them to a collective experience, a collective memory, and a collective identity within a particular time and place. For a student of anthropology such as myself, it was these essential perplexities that I wanted to investigate further to contribute to fundamental intellectual predicaments about the nature of social institutions and social life. As the theme of this panel is on ethno-nationalism, I've left it to my co-panelists as historians, political scientists, and anthropologists to explain the relationship between ethno-nationalism, state formation, state building, as well as foreign patronage and Afghanistan with important prescriptive lessons. But for my talk, I don't look at ethno-nationalism through a long historical trajectory or through grand overarching theories of ethnicity and nationalism. Instead, I take the position of my interlocutors and bring my ethnographic encounters into the fore. In my presentation today, I introduce you to some of my interlocutors through the interviews that I speak about and that I conducted in which they speak about their attachments to symbols, signs, land, and memories associated with their imagined communities, to borrow from Benedict Anderson's seminal work on nationalism. Here, in the space between memory and trauma, are stories of resistance and of belonging and unbelonging. Through an ethnographic approach, I hope to understand and contextualize insights of local values and practices within wider local significations and to render them probable to show how theirs is a meaningful alternative as a way of life. As um, my distinguished co-panelists have elaborated, there is little doubt that nationalizing efforts in Afghanistan's history were articulated through Pashtun nationalism by some elites and royalists as subject matter that everyone in the conference has um, elaborated on. Nationalizing efforts require taking selective pasts articulated in official Afghan historiography. Official institutionalized history of the country was produced in spaces of power, such as colonial accounts, reinscribed through royal courts, tribal courts, or state-sponsored cultural institutions within, with a strong royalist bias. This official historiography was used to encourage nationalism and to legitimize the nation-building activities of the ruling establishment. Afghanistan is an important case study to understand undoing and displacing nationalism because of the country's fractured national body, exacerbated by wars and conflict. So after 2001, after the 2001 nation building 
um, efforts and the establishment of the Republic, the state encouraged forgetting past wars and atrocities, recent historical ruptures, such as wars, civil wars, state violence were not made sense of. School textbooks published by the Ministry of Education glossed over the previous four decades because of this perceived divisive understanding of the past. As such, the framers of the Republic state structure attempted to establish a national historiography for the sake of national unity. In refusing to recognize the wars and atrocities of the past in meaningful ways, the Republic caused a gap to develop between the sanitized narrative that was emphasized officially and public awareness of violence, genocide, mass atrocities, and wars of the past. We know that grand narratives of nationalist historiography disregard the complex multivocality that exists within the individual and society by giving authoritative expressions to complex collective experiences. By doing this, to borrow the words of Sune Hagboli, they almost always expose national history, national regimes, and eventually the nation state itself to popular subversion or resistance that finds an outlet in collective memory and or memory cultures. It was these subversions or resistances that interested me. Being physically present in Kabul, I heard and saw the ways in which different narratives of the past were created and sustained, and how these conceptions, memories, and narratives acted in subversion and at times in parallel to the dominant nationalistic, ethnocentric, and top-down understandings of the past in Afghanistan. These narratives worked also in relation to other narratives. To an observer like me, memory is in social patterns, expressions, and narratives. They emanate from individual experiences that are socially constructed, imagined, and represented. The aim of it is not to clarify what actually happened, but identify why certain frameworks, for, why certain frameworks exist for understanding the past and why they have been accentuated. In line with historian Maurice um, Halbwachs, the way in which people remember actually tells us more about the present than the past. As I spent more time in Afghanistan, I noticed that the Mujahideen flags that I saw and that Rahima was referring to during our walk in Khair Khana did not disappear from the landscape. Long after Martyrs Day and Martyrs Week, they remained. Martyrs Day, which is Rose Shaheed, is a reference to the official national holiday to honor the martyrdom of Ahmad Shah Massoud on September 9th. The day coincides with Martyrs Week, Haftiya Shaheed, which commemorated the martyrdom of those who fought and died the previous wars. Martyrs Week is, was established after the martyrdom of um, Burhan al-Din Rabani in 2011, the head of the Jamiat Islami political party. For the primary forces Zabonon, or Tajik inhabitants of the region, as well as prominent wartime figures, the memory of past wars was recuperated and strengthened during such important com commemorative events. In line with Paul Conacher's work, commemorative ceremonies and events act as a venue for the production of collective memories. Built landscapes and sites of all kinds can easily be interpreted as gathering places for commemorative ceremonies, while monuments and ancient texts are clear repositories of inscribed memory. So these flags were not just present in Khair Khana. On a drive from Panjshir to Kabul, these flags dot were dotted in the landscape. They figured in the posters of presidential and parliamentary candidates of martyrs of the past wars, and today, we see it resurrected by the first political military resistance to the Taliban by the name of Jabhi Muqamat Milli or the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan. The presence of these flags, instead of the flags of the Republic, from Khair Khana to Kabul at that time, when I was in Kabul, not only illustrated the persistence of memory, but a politically contentious legacy of the past and the present. These flags are the flags of pre-2001 Afghanistan, when a government by the name of Dawlat Islamiyah Afghanistan, Islamic State of Afghanistan, was created by Mujahideen factions headed by Jamiat Islami after the fall of the central government in 1992. Jamiat claimed the northern regions or majority of the northern regions of the country under its jurisdiction, including the regions from the north of Kabul to Panjshir, which is where the sites 
which were the sites of my ethnographic fieldwork. Flags are carriers of memories. They are signifiers of collective groups and identities. These flags in particular created a group identity. It evoked deep and conflicting feelings among inhabitants and by and large acted as a carrier of collective memories. For those like Rahima and her husband, Abdul Wudud, these flags reflected their aspiration for self-identification within the limits of common political identity of the nation. Raima and Abdul Wudud's conception in the ethnographic vignette were not, were not exclusive to them or an individual level. Commemorative events serve as reminders of a collective memory and bolster it. The annual Martyrs Day and Martyrs Week events, where people gather to remember martyrs of the past, allows for those who did not experience the wars and events of the past to be provided continued memory reinforcement. Commemorative events and memorialization practices were not just limited to Martyrs Day or Martyrs Week. In the same landscape, there was a visual culture of martyrdom. The death of those in the previous wars, especially those from the regions between Khaikhana to Panjshir, were valorized and memorialized in the landscape. And this created a visual culture which wove the martyrdom of the wars of the past together. These martyrs were important not just as martyrs of the past and integral to the history of the region, but have become meaningful in new ways in the present. Symbolically, when the Taliban took over the main road and the main checkpoint in Panjshir at the end of 2021, they defaced these portraits of martyrs in the region. The defacement of this visual culture demonstrates the centrality of symbols to power. In emphasizing the importance of the presentist approach to collective memory in that social constructions of memory are influenced by the needs of the present as individuals reconstruct the past using rationalization to choose which events are remembered, those that are forgotten and rearrange events to conform to the social narrative. For example, a few months prior on March 22, 2022, Ahmad Masood, the leader of the Jabhe Muqamat Milli sits in front of a table in his political office in Tajikistan next to the green, white, and black Mujahideen flag alongside the red, black, and green flag of the Republic. He starts his message by saying, I begin my message by praying for the souls of all the martyrs of Afghanistan, especially the martyrs of this past year, those martyrs who were part of the National Resistance Front Forces, the National Army, the National Police, the National Directorate Security Forces, and any of all our noble compatriots who lost their lives for the dignity and freedom of Afghanistan. Masood references Shahadat, martyrdom, to evoke a specific wartime past during the era of jihad, when a culture of martyrdom was created. The era of jihad is the local term to reference the Soviet-Afghan war between 1979 and 1989, and the resistance against the Soviets' invasion and its client government, the PDPA. Martyrdom in this 20-year period is often and commonly understood as a sacrifice for a multifaceted cause, religion, deen, the people, martyrdom, and the nation, Zlatan. By referencing martyrdom and the period of jihad in this message, Masood places himself as a continuation of wartime past by invoking a people's resistance during imperial and regional wars. He tries to resonate with the deeply held religious views among the population, especially against the misconstructed Islam of the Taliban. And this allows him to create a legitimate base for himself in the present socio-political order. Masood and the National Resistance Front consider themselves as inheritors of their predecessors. As such, the term Muqalmat, which means resistance, is a local term to refer to the wars in the 1990s against the Taliban. When interviewing Ahmad Masood on the importance of symbolic elements to the current resistance against the Taliban, Masood said that these Mujahideen flags evoke anti-Taliban sentiments in the present, which is why they are important. And similar to Rahima and Abdul Wadud in 2018, he stressed that these flags are reminders of people's resistance, history, and wars. They were never resurrected, but existed and were important signifiers during the time of the Republic. Collective memory from the standpoint of interactions allows for multiple viewpoints to be recognized. 
diverse actors invested in memory production provides a means to delineate how the past becomes a site of contested values that social groups are constantly reworking to define membership, justify social hierarchy, and validate resistance. For anyone who navigates around Kabul, it is impossible not to see posters, billboards, iconography, memorabilia, and a visual culture of diverse narratives and understandings of the past in Afghanistan. For example, Ahmad Shah Massoud's portraits is ubiquitous in Khair Khana, but they're absent in regions where his adversaries were in command during the wars or where he did not wield influence. In official spaces, his picture would be accompanied by the serving president, but a different picture, for instance, of the Pashtun reformer King Amun Mohan would, be, would accompany images of the president in predominantly Pashtun regions of the country. For example, in the dasht neighborhood of Kabul, Abdul Ali Madori and other predominant Hazar figures were seen. For the followers of such figures, the images signaled a particular meaning that emerged from a dialogic process. They were informed by the way they identified with a collective memory or a collective story generated around the leader to differentiate themselves from conceivable alternatives. So um, you can see in this picture, this was during the 2019 Afghanistan Independence Day where pictures, banners, and flags of Afghanistan with Amal Nahan's portraits were made by the government and they were ubiquitous in the capital. This was in addition to inaugurating Don Lamon Palace, which was originally built by Amal Nahan in 1920, and after four years of renovation by President Ashraf Ghani in 2019. Ashraf Ghani understood his presidency to be a continuation of what was never finished by Amal Nahan, a Pashtun reformist king who was deposed by Habibullah Kalakani. Habibullah Kalakani reigned over Afghanistan for nine months after overthrowing Amun Khan. And although he reigned for a short period, he has been considered as the first, as the first non Pashtun to rule Afghanistan since the state's formation. Kalakani has been nicknamed as the son of the water seller, Bache Sakhau, in official Afghan historiography. In unofficial Afghan historiography, however, Kalakani has received a different gloss by some of his co-ethnics. He is described as a representative of the underclass in Afghanistan struggling against the oppression of Pashtun domination. Pictures of Kalakani, as you could see in this image, displayed from the north of Kabul to Panjshir and all the way along the road to Shamali, valorized him as a righteous leader who fought valiantly against the British and who fought against the increasingly oppressive and Western-leaning Amun Nahal government. In the visual culture of this region, he is, usually, he is usually portrayed with a musket and a Quran to illustrate his religiosity in contrast to the seculars Amun Nahal. In some spaces in Kabul during the Independence Day, commemorative posters and pictures not only excluded Amun Khan, but bolstered Farsi Zabon figures, identified as Tajik during the Anglo-Afghan Wars between 1839 and 1919, as well as martyrs of the Soviet-Afghan War deemed to be ignored by official Afghan history. On the road in Shamoli, some state-endorsed banners were taken down or covered with banners with, which portrayed the real or original founders of Afghanistan's independence, including fighters who hailed from those specific regions. Today, after the takeover of the Taliban and the end of Afghanistan's political sovereignty, reflecting on my own field's work in Afghanistan two years ago, I see how the representation of memory has continued to evolve. As the Taliban took over for the second time, we see many from Afghanistan engage in conversations that question the very foundation and establishment of the state, a theme that is also very salient in this conference. More so than ever, we see several pasts in these narratives and pasts that continue to haunt the people of Afghanistan. Memory is not just formed in the moments that are remembered. Instead, memory is created and transformed through continuous ongoing conversations and social interactions that work discursively to influence how particular moments, people, objects, and events are remembered. Memory functions both in interactions 
with public narratives of the past, as well as individual memories. Communities in Afghanistan draw on their history to unify them, and that allows them, that allows them to thrive. It is thus through these studies that we can also perceive, evaluate, and investigate how the choice of the past weighs on the members of the group and vice versa. As internal, regional, and imperial wars continue in Afghanistan and past atrocities remain unaddressed and unacknowledged, a more complete picture of the place of cultural production, commemoration, and other aspects of social memory in Afghanistan would require deeper analyses of the people and institutions involved in remembering and commemorating the past, especially of the wars, their means of expression, and the social conditions that structure remembering. I hope that in this short talk, I was able to provide a semblance of an understanding on diverse collective memories and attachments. State-sponsored and top-down nationalism homogenizes a social landscape as it renders inhabitants or citizens of Afghanistan as the same type. This vision undermines, erases, and threatens these different communities and their identities into equal and anonymous members of the community. More research needs to investigate the ways in which remembering and forgetting takes place, especially in circumstances that requires nations or communities to move forward. I finished this talk with a picture I took inside Bibi Omana K-12 School for Girls in Parande Panshir, which currently serves as the Taliban's military headquarters in the province today. Walls in this school were decorated with posters and artwork by students of personalities and histories that are not mentioned in their official textbooks provided by the Ministry of Education, such as the history of the Soviet-Afghan War. Teachers, administrators, and students learn and produce their own local histories and decorate their walls as such. For me, what came into full view was a display of talent, but for them, this was their resistance, their past, their histories, and their understanding of themselves in the present. Thank you very much, uh, Munazza Hanum, for a very uh, creative contribution to the significance of memory making and also symbolic rendition of thought and historical critic, critique of the history of Afghanistan. We appreciate this is a generation that promises for the foreseeable future of Afghanistan to make a huge difference. They are the ones that we are counting on and we appreciate your contribution. Also, allow me to thank Dr. Ayubi and my wonderful friend, Dr. Musavi, for um, keeping you awake <laughs> this late in the day. I'm afraid we have exhausted the time, and in fact overrun even no time for questions and answers, unless you wish to stay a few more minutes. Oh, mashallah. Um, so maybe we will we'll take uh, how, how, how many minutes? OK, OK. Okay, it looks like there are many uh, questions and it would be um, interested in hearing. So go ahead, uh, Morita. This is valuable time. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for your uh, very insightful <laughs> presentation and also Dr. Musawi, along with our two ju uh, junior scholars, which were impressive. I would like to thank them, too, for their very insightful presentations. And let me also acknowledge that you both are uh, a treasure and an asset to our Afghan academic society. Uh, and you both uh, actually uh, touched uh, on some very critical, uh, important issues on, on Afghan society, politics, uh, specifically you, Janab Sassi, you mentioned political culture, uh, which we have not unfortunately bo uh, built uh, in, the, in the history of Afghanistan. 
So my questions to you, given the you know, democratic culture that you mm -hmm. mentioned in the, case of, uh, uh, in the case of America, that you mentioned uh, that America is such a, as a unique country, which it, uh, which it is, mm -hmm. that the notion no one is above the law. And we clearly saw that with the recent uh, FBI uh, legal search of uh, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, house. So, in your, uh, from your perspective, Janob, uh, what are some of the hindrances towards b building a political culture in Afghanistan that works for her, that works for, uh, for uh, the all ethnicities, yeah. all the population of, of uh, the country, and obviously b build a, a sense of uh, nationhood for the country? Uh, do I have another question for Musa? You said very, uh, very briefly. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, John, uh, uh, Dr. Musa, very briefly, you also uh, touched on uh, state failure, which I will be talking tomorrow on my presentation. Uh, mine is kind of related to the legitimacy of the states. But you mentioned a very critical point that state failure, that we consistently have state failure in the case of Afghanistan. What do you think is such the case in, in, in Afghanistan despite having relatively a long history of statehood? Thank you. Want to take Thanks. Do, please get some, collect, I mean, collect me a few questions and then, yeah, answer them. Sorry, I will take. Ladies first. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Farhanaz Roman and currently working in a London-based law firm. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the very informative panel. Um, I understand uh, the importance of past and the sense of belonging and connection one can get and that's what we're trying to dig into since the last session or panel. Uh, but can we also at some point disconnect from the past because most of the um, discrimination, the sense of prejudices and the feeling of superiority comes from a sense of belonging to a specific region or ethnicity. So if any of the panelists is um, in the belief or holds the belief that um, we can disconnect from the past uh, or make peace with the past for the sake of present and future. Anyone one else? More, ah. One more. One more and then we'll... Maybe two more, okay? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Here and there. Is it? Um, Rahman Mohammadi, um, PhD candidate at the University of Oxford. Um, first of all, uh, this, this question is directed mostly at uh, Dr. Ayobi and in part to Dr. Musavi. Uh, thank you everyone for your interesting talk. I found it very fascinating. Um, I fear, however, that uh, directed at Dr. Ayobi, that you perhaps overemphasize the extent of foreign domination in the late 19th and early 20th century. While Afghan rulers were legitimized and financially supported by foreign powers, and much of the control following this manifested in the, in the control of Afghanistan's foreign policy. Many of the significant developments in Afghanistan were products of Afghan rulers themselves. Uh, Abdurrahman Khan, for example, was, was a very reluctant choice of the British. He often went against British advice, for example, when the Viceroy advised him to be less violent in quelling the uprisings during his centralization. My question, therefore, is do you think that such a construction of Afghan history diminishes the agency of Afghan rulers and turns Afghanistan as it often the case is in academia, as a canvas of foreign projection and manipulation. And related to Dr. Musabi's point about political systems, how do we draw the fine line between the imposition of political systems by foreign powers and the reaction and reflection of Afghan rulers to regional and international currents? And the final question. Mm -hmm. Ali. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Ali Iskandari. I'm likewise at Oxford, where I mainly research uh, revenue mobilization. My question is mainly aimed at Professor Shahrani, where um, you touch on the century-old problem of the failure to build a productive uh, political culture in Afghanistan. And you go on to say that it is a rentier state where the... Oh, a rentier state, perhaps that's the economist's me, but um, where the legitimacy is largely extranational. So you, say, you, you, you touch on the fact that they are subjects, not citizens. So the question to me that I ask you really is, is when you have a state where revenue mobilization is not done domestically from citizens, but rather done 
through foreign patrons. How can you expect to have a state where there is, there you have citizens and not subjects? Thank you. Um, can you please take one more question and then we'll, we'll close it, yeah? Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I'm Zubay Yusufi. Uh, I, I ask both respected uh, panelists that uh, given the uh, 21st century that the world citizens are connected uh, in different ways, why is that so necessary to keep different nationals within Afghanistan who do not want to live together and shape a common future within a country while given the fact that size of Afghanistan is five times of the UK, why they shouldn't have their own countries? Thank you. I'd like uh, Dr. Ayubi if he's with us. Are you there? Is he with us? Yes, I'm here if I, if I can be heard. We can hear you. If you heard the question, please go ahead and respond to it. Yes, I, I heard the question and I do understand um, our colleague's question and I, I, I mo probably share a similar sentiment to some extent but as new generations, we have to really deconstruct some of the policies. I would say we often blame certain uh, countries around us and also certain powers, but we forget that we do have uh, local collaborators in the form of uh, Afghan client rulers. So we are not really, uh, by exposing some of the perpetrators of some of these challenges we are facing right now, by exposing them and uh, distancing ourselves from them, I think we are serving our history and serving our people for good. I personally, myself, I find uh, a no distinction between myself and a fellow Pashtun brother who's suffering from the same crisis, from the same atrocities that we are being um, subjected, we are being abused, we are not given the rights to um, to have a fair and prosperous life like any other uh, countries and to have uh, some sort of um, contribution to the civilizations, to the overall global development. So I hope my colleague can understand that we are, we are uh, the new generations, we have to really deconstruct some of the policies built around us and that does not represent us. Thank you. I think the third uh, question, uh, the second question, I think, which, was directed which one, to you. Which was what? Can you repeat? And you want to remember, Sadhguru? Sorry? Okay. This is what happens when you multiply specialty questions at the end of the day. Sorry? State failure. State failure. State failure, yes. That's right. It was your question, yes? Well, if the question easy, then I answer. If it's still complicated, then Dr. Shannon. <laughs> you can do okay? it. Go ahead. So what was the question then about the state <laughs> Why did <laughs> the, cause of, the causes of state failure, supposedly? Yeah. The, the reason that Afghan, throughout history, Afghanistan is experiencing state failure yeah. time and again. Ah, OK. Well, I, uh, I was. Um, um, well, I was, this is the, my paper is in the progress to, to work on it and continues. But I, I found out that um, the problem is that the state we are imposing or making in Afghanistan, the, fo the form, the frame, the structure, it, it is um, weak and it is not rooted in the history, in the society, in locality and culture and so on. So, and the content is against it and contradict. And one of the most important thing is the content is very ethnocentric, while the state supposed to be nationalistic and modern and so on. So, the outside is very new. Um, well, we use the word reactionary in the previous uh, political literature. Inside is very reactionary. The framework uh, is. Um, 
directed towards future, somebody asked. The content is going backward. This is why you are going to go, you know, whatever. Have you heard that uh, the women in uh, Barf, there was a demonstration by women? I mean, we are talking about women, 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 but there are two kinds of women. A group, I mean, there was a demonstration in Barf, and the women were shouting, a date, marked by democracy, date to democracy. We want Taliban husband. <laughs> yes, this, this was, the clip is still there. I think this is, this is very important to know that the content is this. Okay, if I give you a very um, brief um, example, the content is um, Karzi. The framework is Abdullah. Also, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Munazza Khanum, do you wish to say anything about any of the questions? Munazza? Are you there? Start, yes, can you hear me? Please. I thought they weren't addressed to me. I think that my co-panelists would do a better job with answering these questions. Thank you. Okay, that leaves me, I suppose. I, the, several of the questions were directed to me anyway. The first one uh, had to do with um, hindrances to absence of a democratic governance process in Afghanistan. Um, in that connection, let me just um, do my elderly moment that I missed a very important point. I said there were four pairs of uh, important values. Um, we talked about unity and diversity, private wealth and commonwealth, law and ethics. The fourth one that I should have remembered is freedom and equality. You can have freedom for everybody, but everybody cannot overdo it to infringe on other people's rights. So it has to be equal. So those are the, the important things. The hindrances were really, what I pointed out was also paired one. Our hindrance is person-centered politics. That starts with the biggest one. And then that also, the second one is uh, absolute claim of absolute authority, which also ties to the second question the young lady asked, which is the claim of superiority by the group in Afghanistan who was given the power by outsiders. My thesis is that nobody in Afghanistan has ever been able to get the power by virtue of their own efforts. It has been essentially given because of money and weapons that they become a client of an outside power. They give it, they use that outside money and outside weapons to impose themselves on the people. So that's another hindrance because that denied us the possibility of becoming citizen. We, they turned us into subjects and they have kept us as subjects. And because of that process, of absolute claim of absolute power and justifying it by superiority of their family, their ethnic group, their uh, everything. And that's part of the problem. The society in Afghanistan is caste-like, whether we like it or not. Abdurrahman, in fact, structured that. His family first, and his cousins, and then his people, and then Tajiks who uh, worked for him, and then the Uzbeks, and then finally the Hazaras at the bottom of the pile. That's being shifted now. Hazaras have moved themselves, they rank up, and the Uzbeks are kicked down into the bottom. But that's the nature of Afghan society, unfortunately. The, the, the third thing that's so important, and that was the question of uh, from subjecthood. How do we get out of subjecthood, particularly foreigners who are picking them and giving them the money and the weapons and keep 
supporting them and imposing them on us. How do we get out of that? That's a vicious cycle, unfortunately. We have to find a way to reclaim our citizenship. And that can be only done, in my judgment, by accepting the principle of community self-governance. By community self-governance, I don't mean each ethnic group, each tribe, each thing, no. Local community means pe those people who live in an area. Whether it's a village, whether it's a um, district, whether it's a province, whoever lives there, it doesn't matter. They should govern themselves. And if they start doing that, then if we, if we can elect all of our political officers, and the, the worst thing in the Afghan political culture is the culture of appointment. Those who have the absolute power, they exercise it through appointment. So we need to get rid of this process. We need to hire the local communities, local establishments, local institutions need to hire their own professional staff. Elect their political uh, officers and they have to hire based on competence. It doesn't matter what ethnic group. I, I'm not in favor of um, ethnic politics. I think that's horrible. Competence. If Hazaras hire a Pashtun from Paktia to become their judge, he's going to be serving them. Because he didn't come with a letter from Kabul to be judge. So the government could back him up and he could do his whatever he wants. Now the Hazaras are hiring him. A Wahis are hiring a Baluch, a Hazara in the Wakhan is their director of agriculture or director of health. He will serve them. Whenever they don't serve them, they can kick them out. They can bring another one. It doesn't have to be local person serving them. It can be anybody from any part of the country as long as they hire. He's not sent from Kabul. So that's the process. I think we need to do that. And that's why one of the, my proposals is that we have to go back to Pushki, draft, universal draft. I think this idea of paid soldier that Americans introduced, something that they themselves did after the Vietnam War in the United States. Before that, it was draft. That will take us a little bit out. So we don't need $4 billion a year for a force. We can reduce that to maybe a billion by not having to pay People have to serve and they have to, you know, have their rights and privileges based on what country can afford. The other, the last question I think was on uh, globalization and the need for nationalism in the 21st century. What a wonderful question. You know, the idea of nationalism in my, in my account really is a poison. It was a poison that colonialism introduced and in injected in the rest of the world. This poison is so strong, so powerful, so destructive that they drew those damn lines on the, on, on the sand or on paper. And they themselves, 60, 70 years ago, started throwing those lines, creating European Union. Now you can go around, your passport is no, not important within this club, but the rest of us are fighting over Durand. What for? What the hell is that for? That we should fight for it and, and make such a big deal out of it. We are ignorant. We, we outsiders, the third worlders, whatever they have labeled us, we just don't have the sense to see they fed us a poison, we are poisoned. And we're still affected by that. Nationalism, I'm an off one. What the hell? Come on. You know, we really need to come to our senses. We're, we are not human-centered. We are these national-centered. We need to become humans first. And human-centered. And appreciate each other as human beings. That's left on the side. And we're all worried about 
you know, the identities they constructed for us. It's not even ours. Believe me, when I grew up in eastern Badakhshan, I didn't know I was Uzbek. I didn't. I thought, oh, my language is Turkey, and I'm a Turk. See what happened. The Soviets created the damned Uzbekistan. And all of a sudden, everybody told me, you're an Uzbek. So I've become an Uzbek. And, and the Turkestan, the large area in Central Asia, in China, Eastern, China, Eastern Turkestan, Western Turkestan, Southern Turkestan, and Afghanistan, no longer exists. They destroyed this large identity and divided us up into Uyghuristan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and so on and so forth. And see what the, what the heck has happened to us. It was their work, not ours. But today, and I've heard Uzbeks talking about Kyrgyz in a manner that boiled my blood. I'm Uzbek, sitting with Uzbeks. They're talking about Kyrgyz in such a manner that it's unbelievable. I said, where the hell did it come from? So I told them, you see, I grew up in Afghanistan, despite whatever it is. I choose to go and work amongst the Kyrgyz, not amongst the Uzbek. I could have uh, written about some Uzbek community in Afghanistan, but I choose to go and stay in the Kyrgyz. And they treated me like not only a human being, uh, their brother. And you guys are sitting here and, you know, uh, bad-mouthing them in this manner, and I asked them, where did it come from? They didn't even think about it. They said, the Soviets created, it, they created this for you. In Afghanistan, nobody told us that Kyrgyz are, you know, your enemies. They were not our enemies. They are brothers, especially in the context of where we are all collectively uh, damned by others. So, uh, you know, they certainly re realized, but they still didn't believe because there were these fights between Kyrgyz and the Uzbeks in Ush. You know, they recently, in 2015, they burned down the whole section of the city of Ush where Uzbeks live. Over what? That's the problem with, with where we are standing today. That um, globalization is really, again, a construction of the West for us. It has meaning for them, but it has only problems for us. Thank you very much. We are coming to the end of the first day. Thank you so much for everyone for their participation, especially for the, our panelists, keynote speaker, uh, everyone uh, who had contributed. We are looking forward to have you again tomorrow in the morning, 9 o'clock uh, here. But a very small announcement and housekeeping for the guest speakers. We, have, um, we are kindly inviting them 7 o'clock uh, for a small dinner, which includes um, uh, Doug, as well as John, um, and our speakers, basically. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, as you all have a long journey, there are still some nibbles through the double doors. If you'd like to have any sandwiches, they're not the halal ones, but the left-hand side are halal. So please do take something.